Section 15 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Embassy, Part 5. For when this piece was concluded, the piece of Philocrates, which Eskines supported, and when Philip's envoys had set sail, after receiving the oaths from us, and up to this time nothing that had been done was irreparable, for though the peace was disgraceful and unworthy of Athens, still we were to get those marvellous good things in return. Then, I say, I asked and told the ambassadors to sail as quickly as possible to the Hellespont, and not to sacrifice any of our positions there, nor allow Philip to occupy them in the interval. For I knew very well that everything that is sacrificed when peace is in process of being concluded after war is lost to those who are so neglectful, since no one who had been induced to make peace with regard to the situation as a whole ever yet made up his mind to fight afresh for the sake of possessions which had been left unsecured such possessions those who first take them keep and apart from this i thought that if we sailed the city could not fail to secure one of two useful results either when we were there and had received philip's oath according to the decree he would restore the possessions of athens which he had taken and keep his hands off the rest or, if he did not do so, we should immediately report the fact to you here, and so, when you saw his grasping and perfidious disposition in regard to those your remoter and less important interests, you would not, in dealing with greater matters close at hand, in other words, with the Phocians and Thermopylae, let anything be lost." If he failed to forestall you in regard to these, and you were not deceived, your interests would be completely secured, and he would give you your rights without hesitation. And I had good reason for such expectations. For if the Phocians were still safe and sound, as they then were, and were in occupation of Thermopylae, Philip would have had no terror to brandish before you, which could make you overlook any of your rights. For he was not likely either to make his way through by land, or to win a victory by sea and so reach Attica, while if he refused to act as was right, you would instantly close his ports, reduce him to straits for money and other supplies, and place him in a state of siege. And in that case, it would be he and not you, to whom the advantages of peace would be the overmastering consideration. And that I am not inventing this or claiming wisdom after the event, that I knew it at once, and, with your interest in view, foresaw what must happen and told my colleagues, you will realize from the following facts. When there was no longer any meeting of the assembly available, since you had used up all the appointed days, and still the ambassadors did not depart, but wasted time here, I proposed a decree as a member of the council, to which the people had given full powers, that the ambassadors should depart directly, and that the admiral Proxenus should convey them to any district in which he should ascertain Philip to be. My proposal was just what I now tell you, couched expressly in those terms. To the clerk. Take this decree and read it. The decree is read. I brought them away then from Athens, sorely against their will, as you will clearly understand from their subsequent conduct. When we reached Orius and joined Proxenus, instead of sailing and following their instructions, they made a circuitous journey by land, and before we reached Macedonia, we had spent three and twenty days. All the rest of the time, until Philip's arrival, we were sitting idle at Pella, and this, with a journey, 
brought the time up to fifty days in all. During this interval, in a time of peace and truce, Philip was taking Doriscus, Thrace, the district towards the walls, the sacred mountain, everything in fact, and making his own arrangements there. While I spoke out repeatedly and insistently, first in the tone of a man giving his opinion to his colleagues, then as though I were informing the ignorant, till at last I addressed them without any concealment as men who had sold themselves and were the most impious of mankind. And the man who contradicted me openly and opposed everything which I urged and which your decree enjoined was Eschines. Whether his conduct pleased all the other ambassadors as well, you will know presently, for as yet I allege nothing about any of them and make no accusation. No one of them need appear an honest man to-day because I oblige him to do so, but only of his own free will and because he was no partner in Eschines's crimes. That the conduct in question was disgraceful, atrocious, venal, you have all seen. Who were the partners in it, the facts will show. But, of course, during this interval they received the oaths from Philip's allies or carried out their other duties. Far from it, for though they had been absent from home three whole months and received a thousand drachmae from you for their expenses, they did not receive the oaths from a single city, either on their journey to Macedonia or on the way back. It was in the inn before the temple of the Dioscuri. Any one who has been to Phere will understand me when Philip was already on the march towards Athens at the head of an army that the oaths were taken in a fashion which was disgraceful, men of Athens, and insulting to you. To Philip, however, it was worth anything that the transaction should have been carried out in this form. These men had failed in their attempt to insert among the terms of the peace the clause which excluded the people of Halus and Pharsalus. Philocrates had been forced by you to expunge the words and to write down expressly the Athenians and the allies of the Athenians, and Philip did not wish any of his own allies to have taken such an oath for then they would not join him in his campaign against those possessions of yours which he now holds, but would plead their oaths in excuse. Nor did he wish them to be witnesses of the promises on the strength of which he was obtaining that peace. He did not wish it to be revealed to the world that the city of Athens had not, after all, been defeated in the war, and that it was Philip who was eager for peace and was promising to do great things for Athens if he obtained it. It was just to prevent the revelation of these facts that he thought it inadvisable that the ambassadors should go to any of the cities, while for their part they sought to gratify him in everything with ostentatious and extravagant obsequiousness. But when all this is proved against them, their waste of time, their sacrifice of your position in Thrace, their complete failure to act in accordance either with your decree or your interests, their lying reports to you, how is it possible that before a jury of sane men anxious to be true to their oath, Eschines can be acquitted? To prove, however, that what I say is true, to the clerk, first read the decree, under which it was our duty to exact the oaths, then Philip's letter, and then the decree of Philocrates and that of the people. The decrees and letter are read. And now, to prove that we should have caught Philip in the Hellespont, had anyone listened to me, and carried out your instructions as contained in the decrees, to the clerk, call the witnesses who were there on the spot. The witnesses are called to the clerk. Next, read also the other deposition, Philip's answer to Euclides, who is present here when he went to Philip afterwards. 
the deposition is read. Now listen to me, while I show that they cannot even deny that it was to serve Philip's interest that they acted as they did. For when we set out on the first embassy, that which was to discuss the peace, you dispatched a herald in advance to procure us a safe conduct. Well, on that occasion, as soon as ever they had reached Aureus, they did not wait for the herald or allow any time to be lost. But though Hallus was being besieged, they sailed there direct, and then, leaving the town again, came to Parmenio, who was besieging it, set out through the enemy's camp to Pagasse, and, continuing their journey, only met the herald at Larissa. With such eager haste did they proceed. But at a time when there was peace and they had complete security for their journey, and you had instructed them to make haste, it never occurred to them either to quicken their pace or to go by sea. And why? Because on the former occasion, Philip's interest demanded that the peace should be made as soon as possible, whereas now it required that as long an interval as possible should be wasted before the oaths were taken. To prove that this is so, to the clerk, take and read this further deposition. The deposition is read. How could men be more clearly convicted of acting to serve Philip's interest throughout? than by the fact that they sat idle, when in your interest they ought to have hurried on the very same journey over which they hastened onward without even waiting for the herald when they ought not to have moved at all. Now observe how each of us chose to conduct himself while we were there sitting idle at Pella. For myself, I chose to rescue and seek out the captives, spending my own money and asking Philip to procure their ransom with the sums which he was offering us in the form of presents. How Eskinis passed his whole time, you shall hear presently. What then was the meaning of Philip's offering money to us in common? He kept sounding us all, for this too I would have you know and how he sent round privately to each of us and offered us, men of Athens, a very large sum in gold. And when he failed in a particular case, for I need not mention my own name myself, since the proceedings and their results will of themselves show to whom I refer, he thought that we should all be innocent enough to accept what was given to us in common. And then, if we all alike had a share, however small, in the common present, those who had sold themselves privately would be secure. Hence this offers under the guise of presents to his guest friends. And when I prevented this, my colleagues further divided among themselves the sum thus offered. But when I asked Philip to spend this sum on the prisoners, he could neither, without discredit, denounce my colleagues and say, but so-and-so has the money, and so-and-so, nor yet evade the expense. So he gave the promise but deferred its fulfillment, saying that he would send the prisoners home in time for the Panathenae. To the clerk, read the evidence of Apollophanes and then that of the rest of those present. The evidence is read. Now let me tell you how many of the prisoners I myself ransomed. For while we were sitting waiting there at Pella before Philip's arrival, some of the captives, all in fact who were out on bail, not trusting, I suppose, my ability to persuade Philip to act as I wished, said that they wished to ransom themselves and to be under no obligation to Philip for their freedom. And they borrowed one three minae, another five, and another whatever the amount of the ransom was in each case. But when Philip had promised that he would ransom the rest, I called together those to whom I had advanced the money. I reminded them of the circumstances, and lest they should seem to have suffered by their impatience, and to have been ransomed at their own cost, poor men as they were, when all their comrades expected to be set free by Philip, I made them a present of their ransom. 
to prove that I am speaking the truth, to the clerk, read these depositions. The depositions are read. These, then, are the sums which I excused them and gave as a free gift to fellow citizens who had met with misfortune. And so, when Aeschines says presently in his speech to you, Demosthenes, if, as you say, you knew from the time when I supported Philocrates' proposal that we were acting together dishonestly, why did you go again as our colleague on the subsequent mission to take the oaths instead of entering a sworn excuse? Remember this, that I had promised those whose freedom I had procured that I would bring them their ransom and deliver them to the best of my power. It would have been a wicked thing to break my word and abandon my fellow citizens in their misfortune, while, on the other hand, if I had excused myself upon oath from service, it would not have been altogether honourable, nor yet safe, to make a tour there in a private capacity. For let destruction, utter and early, fall upon me, if I would have joined in a mission with these men for a very large sum of money, had it not been for my anxiety to rescue the prisoners. It is a proof of this, that though you twice elected me to serve on the third embassy, I twice swore an excuse. And all through the journey in question, my policy was entirely opposed to theirs. All then that it was within my own power to decide in the course of my mission resulted as I have described. But wherever in virtue of their majority they gained their way, all has been lost. And yet, had there been any who listened to me, all would have been accomplished in a manner congruous with my own actions. For I was not so pitiful a fool as to give away money when I saw others receiving it, in my ambition to serve you, and yet not to desire what could have been accomplished without expense, and would have brought far greater benefits to the whole city. I desired it intensely, men of Athens, but of course they had the advantage over me. Come now and contemplate the proceedings of Aeschines and those of Philocrates by the side of my own for the comparison will bring out their character more vividly. Well, they first pronounced the exclusion from the peace of the Phocians and the people of Halos and of Sir Sobleptes, contrary to your decree and to the statements made to you. Then they attempted to tamper with and alter the decree, which we had come there as ambassadors to execute. Then they entered the Cardians as allies of Philip, and voted against sending the dispatch which I had written to you, sending in its stead an utterly unsound dispatch of their own composition. And then the gallant gentleman asserted that I had promised Philip that I would overthrow your constitution, because I censured these proceedings, not only from a sense of their disgracefulness, but also from fear, lest through the fault of these men I might have to share their ruin." while all the time he was himself having incessant private interviews with Philip. And to pass over all besides, Dercelus, not I, watched him through the night at Ferre, along with my slave, who is here present. And as the slave came out of Philip's tent, he took him and bade him report what he had seen, and remember it himself. And finally, this disgusting and shameless fellow was left behind with Philip for a night and a day when we went away. And to prove that I am speaking the truth, I will myself give evidence which I have committed to writing, so as to put myself in the position of a responsible witness. And after that I call upon each of the other ambassadors, and I will compel them to choose their alternative, either to give evidence or to swear that they have no knowledge of the matter. If they take the latter course, I shall convict them of perjury beyond doubt. Evidence is read. You have seen now by what mischief and trouble I was hampered throughout our absence from home. For what must you imagine their conduct to have been there, with their paymaster close at hand, when they act as they do before your very eyes, though you have power either to confer honour or, on the other hand, 
to inflict punishment upon them. End of section 15. Section 16 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard, on the Embassy, Part 6. I wish now to reckon up from the beginning the charges which I have made, in order to show you that I have done all that I undertook to do at the beginning of my speech. I have proved that there was no truth in his report, that, on the contrary, he deceived you by the evidence not of words but of the actual course of events. I have proved that he was the cause of your unwillingness to hear the truth from my mouth, captivated as you were at the time by his promises and undertakings that he gave you advice which was the exact opposite of that which he ought to have given, opposing the peace which was suggested by the Allies, and advocating the peace of Philocrates, that he wasted time in order that you might not be able to march to the aid of the Phocians, even if you wished to do so, and that he has done many atrocious deeds during his absence from home, for he has betrayed and sold everything, he has taken bribes, and has left no form of rascality untried. These are the points which I promised at the outset to prove, and I have proved them. Observe, then, what follows, for what I have now to say to you has already become a simple matter. You have sworn that you will vote according to the laws and the decrees of the people and the council of five hundred. The defendant is proved, in all his conduct as ambassador, to have acted in contravention of the laws, of the decrees, and of justice. He ought, therefore, to be convicted in any court composed of rational men, even if there were no other crimes at his door. Two of his actions are sufficient to slay him, for he betrayed to Philip not only the Phocians, but also Thrace. Two places in the whole world of greater value to Athens than Thermopylae on land and the Hellespont over sea could not possibly be found. And both these places these men have shamefully sold and placed in Philip's hands to be used against you. The enormity of this crime alone, the sacrifice of Thrace and the walls, apart from all the rest, might be proved in countless ways and it is easy to point out how many men have been executed or fined vast sums of money by you for such offences. Ergophilus, Cephisodotus, Timomachus, Ergocles long ago, Dionysius and others, all of whom together, I may almost say, have done the city less harm than the defendant. But in those days, men of Athens, you still guarded against danger by calculation and forethought, whereas now you overlook any danger which does not annoy you from day to day, or cause you pain by its immediate presence, and then pass such resolutions here as that Philip shall take the oath in favour of Sir Sobleptes also, that we will not take part in the proceedings of the Amphictyons, that we must amend the peace. But none of these resolutions would have been required had Eskinis then been ready to sail and to do what was required. As it is, by urging us to go by land, he has lost all that we could have saved by sailing, and by lying, all that could have been saved by speaking the truth. He intends, I am told, to express immediately his indignation that he alone of all the speakers in the assembly should have to render an account of his words. I will not urge that all speakers would reasonably be called upon to render such an account if any of their words were spoken for money. I only say this. If Eskines, in his private capacity, has spoken widely on some occasion or committed some blunder, 
do not be over strict with him, but let it pass and grant him pardon. But if, as your ambassador, he has deliberately deceived you for money, then do not let him go or tolerate the plea that he ought not to be called to account for what he said. Why, for what, if not for his words, is an ambassador to be brought to justice? Ambassadors have no control over ships or places or soldiers or citadels. No one puts such things in their hands, but over words and times. As regards times, if he did not cause the times of the city's opportunities to be lost, he is not guilty. But if he did so, he has committed crime, and as to his words, if the words of his report were true or expedient, let him escape. But if they were at once false, venal, and disastrous, let him be convicted. No greater wrong can a man do you than is done by lying speeches. For where government is based upon speeches, how can it be carried on in security if the speeches are not true? And if, in particular, a speaker takes bribes and speaks to further the interests of the enemy, how can you escape real danger? For to rob you of your opportunities is not the same thing as to rob an oligarchy or a tyrant. Far from it. Under such governments, I imagine, everything is done promptly at a word of command. But with you, the council must first hear about everything and pass its preliminary resolution, and even that, not at any time, but only when notice has been given of the reception of heralds and embassies. Then you must convoke an assembly, and that only when the time comes for one, as ordained by law. Then those who speak for your true good have to muster and overcome those who, through ignorance or wickedness, oppose them. Besides all this, even when a measure is resolved upon, and its advantages are already plain, time must be granted to the impecuniosity of the majority in which they may procure whatever means they require in order to be able to carry out what has been resolved. And so, he who causes time so critical to be lost, in a state constituted as ours is, has not caused you to lose times, but has robbed you absolutely of the realization of your aims. Now all those who are anxious to deceive you are very ready with such expressions as disturbers of the city, men who prevent Philip from conferring benefits on the city. In reply to these, I will use no argument, but will read you Philip's letters, and will remind you of the occasion on which each piece of deception took place, that you may know that Philip has got beyond this exaggerated title of benefactor of which we are so sickened in his attempts to take you in by it. Philip's letters are read. Now, although his work as ambassador has been so shameful, so detrimental to you in many, nay, in all points, he goes about asking people what they think of Demosthenes, who prosecuted his own colleagues. I prosecute you indeed, whether I would or no, because throughout our entire absence from home, you plotted against me, as I have said, and because now I have the choice of only two alternatives. Either I must appear to share with you the responsibility for such work as yours, or I must prosecute you. Nay, I deny that I was ever your colleague in the embassy. I say that your work as ambassador was an atrocious work, while my own was for the true good of those present here. It is Philocrates that has been your colleague, as you have been his, and Frenon, for your policy was the same as theirs, and you all approved of the same objects. But where are the salt, the table, the libations that we shared? So he asks everywhere in his theatrical style, as though it were not the criminals, but the upright that were false to such pledges. 
I am certain that though all the Britons offer their common sacrifice on each occasion and join one with another in their meal and their libation, the good do not on this account copy the bad. But if they detect one of their own number in crime, they report the fact to the council and the people. In the very same way, the council offers its inaugural sacrifice and feasts together and joins in libations and sacred rites. So do the generals, and one may practically say, every body of magistrates. Does that mean that they grant an indemnity to any of their number who is guilty of crime? Very far from it. Leon accuses Timagoras after being his fellow ambassador for four years. Eubulus accuses Tharex and Smithithus after sharing the banquet with them. The great Conon the Elder prosecuted Adimantus, though they were generals together. Which sinned against the salt and the libation? Eschines, the traitors and the faithless ambassadors and the hirelings, or their accusers? Plainly those who violated, as you have done, the sanctity not of private libations, but of libations poured in the name of the whole country. That you may realize that these men have been the most worthless and wicked, not only for all who have ever gone to Philip in a public capacity, but even of those who have gone as private persons, and indeed of all mankind, I ask you to listen to me while I describe briefly an incident which falls outside the story of this embassy. When Philip took Olynthus, he celebrated Olympian games and gathered together all the artists to the sacrifice and the festal gathering. And while he was entertaining them at a banquet and crowning the victors, he asked Satyrus, the well-known comic actor, why he alone requested no favor of him. Did he see any meanness in him or any dislike towards himself? Satyrus answered, so the story goes, that he happened to stand in no need of the things for which the rest were asking, but that the boon which he would like to ask was a favor which it would be very easy indeed for Philip to bestow, only he was afraid that he might fail to obtain it. Philip bade him name his request, declaring with some spirit that there was nothing that he would not do for him, Satyrus is then said to have stated that Apollophanes of Pydna was formerly his friend and guest friend, and that when he had perished by a treacherous assassination, his kinsman had, in alarm, conveyed his daughters, then little children, to Olynthus secretly. These girls, said Satyrus, have been taken prisoners at the capture of the city. They are with you, and they are now of marriageable age. It is these girls that I beg and entreat you to give to me. But I should like you to hear and understand what sort of present you will be giving me, if you really give it. I shall gain nothing by receiving it. I shall give them in marriage, and a dowry with them, and shall not allow them to suffer anything unworthy of us or of their father." When those who were present at the feast heard this, there was such applause and cheering and approbation on all hands that Philip was moved and granted the request, although the Apollophanes who was spoken of was one of the murderers of Alexander, Philip's brother. Now let us examine side by side with this banquet of Satyrus that in which these men took part in Macedonia. Observe what likeness and resemblance there is between the two. For these men were invited to the house of Xenophron, the son of Pledimus, who was one of the thirty, and went. I did not go. But when it came to the time for wine, he brought in an Olynthian woman, good-looking but well-bred and modest, as the event proved. At first, I believe, according to the account which Iatrocles gave me the next day, they only forced her to drink a little wine, quietly, and to eat some dessert. But as the feast proceeded, and they waxed warm, they bade her recline, and even sing a song. And when the poor creature, who was in great distress, neither would nor could do as they bade her, 
Eskines and Frenon declared that it was an insult and quite intolerable that a captive woman, one of those godforsaken devils the Olynthians, should give herself airs. Call a slave, they cried, and let someone bring a strap. A servant came with a lash. They had been drinking, I imagine, and were easily annoyed. And as soon as she said something and burst into tears, the servant tore open her dress and gave her a number of cuts across the back. Beside herself with the pain and the sense of her position, the woman leaped up and fell before the knees of Iatrocles, overturning the table as she did so, and had he not rescued her, she would have perished as the victim of a drunken debauch, for the drunkenness of this abominable creature is something horrible. The case of this woman was also mentioned in Arcadia before the ten thousand, and Diophantus reported to you what I shall now force him to testify, for the matter was much talked of in Thessaly and everywhere. Yet, with all this on his conscience, this unclean creature will dare to look you in the face, and will very soon be speaking to you of the life he has lived, in that magnificent voice of his. It chokes me to hear him. Does not the jury know how at first you used to read over the books to your mother at her initiations, and wallow amid bands of drunken men at their orgies while still a boy? And how you were afterwards under Clark to the magistrates and played the rogue for two or three drachmae? And how at last, in recent days, you thought yourself lucky to get a parasitic living in the training rooms of others as a third-rate actor? What then is the life of which you propose to speak? Where have you lived it? For the life which you have really lived has been what I have described. And how much does he take upon himself? He brought another man to trial here for unnatural offences. But I leave this point for the moment. To the clerk. First read me these depositions. The depositions are read. So many, then, and so gross gentlemen of the jury, being the crimes against you of which he stands convicted, and what wickedness do they not include? He is corrupt, he is a minion, he is under the curse, a liar, a betrayer of his own people. All the most heinous offences are there. He will not defend himself against a single of these charges, and will have no defence to offer that is either just or straightforward. But the statement which I am told he intends to make borders on madness, though perhaps a man who has no other plea to offer must contrive anything that he can. For I hear that he is to say that I, forsooth, have been a partner in everything of which I accuse him, that at first I used to approve of his policy and to act with him, and that I have suddenly changed my mind and become his accuser. As a defence of his conduct, such assertions are, of course, neither legitimate nor to the point, though they do imply some kind of charge against myself. For, of course, if I have acted thus, I am a worthless person. But the conduct itself is no better for that. Far from it. At the same time, I think it is proper for me to prove to you both the point in question. First, that if he makes such an assertion, he will be lying. And secondly, what is the just line of defence? Now, a just and straightforward defence must show either that the acts charged against him were not committed, or that, having been committed, they are to the advantage of the city. But Eskines cannot do either of these things, for I presume that it is not possible for him to say that it is to the advantage of the city that the Phocians have been ruined, that Thermopylae is in Philip's hands, that Thebes is powerful, that there are soldiers in Euboea and plotting against Megara, and that the peace should not have been sworn to, when on the former occasion he announced the very contrary of all these things to you in the guise of advantages, and advantages about to be realized. 
nor will he be able to persuade you that these things have not been done when you yourselves have seen them and know the facts well it remains for me therefore to show you that i have had no share in any of their proceedings shall i then dismiss everything else from consideration all that i have said against them in your presence all my collisions with them during our absence all my antagonism to them from first to last and produce my opponents themselves as witnesses to the fact that my conduct and theirs have been absolutely contrary the one to the other that they have taken money to your detriment and that i refuse to receive it then mark what i say who would you say was of all men in athens the most offensive most overflowing with effrontery and contemptuousness i am sure that none of you even by mistake would name any other than philocrates and who would you say possessed the loudest voice and could enunciate whatever he pleased most clearly eskin is the defendant i am sure who is it then that these men describe as cowardly and timid before a crowd while i call him cautious it is myself for i have never annoyed you or forced myself upon you against your will now at every meeting of the assembly as often as a discussion has arisen upon these subjects you hear me accusing and convicting these men declaring explicitly that they have taken money and have sold all the interests of the city and not one of them has ever to this day contradicted the statement when he heard it or opened his mouth or shown himself what then is the reason why the most offensive men in the city the men with the loudest voices are so cowed before me the timidest of men whose voice is no louder than any other it is because truth is strong while to them on the other hand the consciousness of having sold public interests is a source of weakness it is this that steals away the boldness of these men this that binds down their tongues and stops their mouths chokes them and makes them silent you remember of course how at the recent meeting in the piraeus when you would not have him for your representative he was shouting that he would impeach me and indict me and crying oh oh but such steps are the beginning of long and numerous trials and speeches whereas the alternative was but to utter perhaps two or three words which even a slave purchased yesterday could have pronounced men of athens this is utterly atrocious demosthenes is accusing me here of crimes in which he himself was a partner he says that i have taken money when he has taken money or shared it himself but no such words no such sound did he utter nor did one of you hear him do so he only uttered threats to a different effect and why because he knew that he had done what he was charged with doing he was abjectly afraid to use any such expressions his resolution could not rise to them but shrank back for it was in the grip of his conscience whereas there was nothing to hinder him from uttering irrelevant abuse and slander but here is the strongest proof of all and it consists not in words but in fact for when i was anxious to do what it was right to do namely to make a second report to you after serving a second time as ambassador eschines came before the board of auditors with a number of witnesses and forbade them to call me before the court since i had rendered my account already and was no longer liable to give it the incident was extremely ridiculous and what was the meaning of it he had made his report with reference to the first embassy against which no one brought any charge and did not wish to go before the court again with regard to the second embassy with reference to which he now appears before you and within which all his crimes fell but if i came before you twice it became necessary for him also to appear again and so he tried to prevent them from summoning me 
But this action of his, men of Athens, plainly proves to you two things. First, that he had so condemned himself that none of you can now acquit him without impiety. And secondly, that he will not speak a word of truth about me. Had he anything true to assert, he would have been found asserting it and accusing me then. He would certainly not have tried to prevent my being summoned. To prove the truth of what I say, to the clerk, call me the witnesses to the facts. But further, if he makes slanderous statements against me, which have nothing to do with the embassy, there are many good reasons for your refusing to listen to him. For I am not on my trial today, and when I have finished my speech, I have no further time allotted to me. What can such statements mean, except that he is bankrupt of legitimate arguments? For who that was on his trial, and had any defence to make, would prefer to accuse another? And consider also this further point, gentlemen of the jury. If I were on my trial, with the defendant Eskines for accuser, and Philip for judge, and if, being unable to disprove my guilt, I abused Eskines and tried to sully his character, do you not think that Philip would be indignant at the very fact of a man abusing his benefactors in his own presence? Do not you then prove worse than Philip, but force Eskines to defend himself against the charges which are the subject of the trial? To the clerk, read the deposition. The deposition is read. So, for my part, because I had nothing on my conscience, I felt it my duty to render an account and submit all the information that the laws required, while the defendant took the opposite view. How then can his conduct and mine have been the same? Or how can he possibly assert against me now things of which he has never even accused me before? It is surely impossible. And yet he will assert these things, and heaven knows it is natural enough. For you doubtless know well that ever since the human race began and trials were instituted, no one was ever convicted admitting his crime. They brazen it out, they deny it, they lie, they make up excuses, they take every means to escape paying the penalty. You must not let any of these devices mislead you today. Your judgment must be given upon the facts, in the light of your own knowledge. You must not attend to words, whether mine or his, still less to the witnesses whom he will have ready to testify anything, since he has Philip to pay his expenses. You will see how glibly they will give evidence for him. Nor must you care whether his voice is fine and loud, or whether mine is poor. For it is no trial of orators or of speeches that you have to hold today, if you are wise men. You have rather, in the name of a cause shamefully and terribly ruined, to thrust off the present disgrace on to the shoulders of the guilty, after a scrutiny of those results which are known to you all. And these results, which you know and do not require us to tell you of, what are they? If the consequences of the peace have been all that they promised you, if you admit that you were so filled with an unmanly cowardice that, though the enemy was not in your land, though you were not blockaded by sea, though your city was menaced by no other danger whatever, though, on the contrary, the price of corn was low and you were in other respects as well off as you are today, though you knew beforehand on the information of these men that your allies were about to be ruined and Thebes to become powerful, that Philip was about to occupy the Thracian strongholds and to establish a basis of operations against you in Euboea, and that all that has now happened was about to come to pass, you nevertheless made peace cheerfully. If that is so, then acquit Eskines and do not add perjury to all your disgrace. For in that case he is guilty of no crime against you. It is I that I am mad and brain-sick to accuse him now. But if what they told you was altogether the reverse of this, 
if it was a tale of great generosity, of Philip's love for Athens, of his intentions to save the Phocians, to check the insolence of the Thebans, and beside all this, if he obtained the peace, to confer on you benefits that would more than compensate for Amphipolis, and to restore you Euboea and Oropus, if, I say, they stated and promised all this, and have now totally deceived and cheated you, and have all but robbed you of Attica itself, then condemn him, and do not, in addition to all the outrages, I know not what other word to use, that you have suffered, carry with you to your homes, through upholding their corruption, the curse and the guilt of perjury. End of section 16《Section 17 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Public Orations of Demosthenes》Translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard On the Embassy, Part 7 Again, gentlemen of the jury, Ask yourselves what reason I could have had for choosing to accuse these men if they had done no wrong. You will find none. Is it pleasant to have many enemies? Pleasant? It is not even safe. Was there any quarrel between me and Eschines? None. What then? You were afraid for yourself, and in your cowardice thought to save yourself this way. For that, I have heard, is what he says. What? I was afraid, when, according to your own statement, there was nothing to be afraid of, and no crime had been committed? If you repeat such an assertion, men of Athens, consider what these men themselves, the actual criminals, ought to suffer for their offences, if I, who am absolutely guiltless, was afraid of being ruined owing to them. But what is my motive for accusing you? I am an informer, of course, and want to get money out of you. And which was the easier course for me, to get money out of Philip, who offered a large sum, to get as much as any of these men, and to have not only Philip for my friend, but also my opponents? For they would assuredly have been friends had I been partner with them, since even now they have no inherited quarrel against me, but only the fact that I refused to join in their actions." or to beg them for a share of their gains and be regarded with hostility both by Philip and by them. Is it likely that when I was ransoming the prisoners at such cost to myself, I should ask to receive a paltry sum from these men in a disgraceful manner and with their enmity accompanying it? Impossible! My report was true. I abstained from taking money for the sake of justice and truth and my own future. For I thought, as others among you have thought, that my own uprightness would receive its reward, and that I must not barter my ambition to stand well with you for gain of any kind. And I abhor these men, because I saw that they were vile and impious in the conduct of their mission, and because I have been robbed of the objects of my own ambition, owing to their corruption, now that you have come to be vexed with the embassy as a whole. And it is because I foresee what must happen that I now accuse him and appear to challenge his report, for I would have it decided here, in a trial before a jury, that my conduct has been the opposite of his. And I am afraid, afraid, I say, for I will speak all my mind to you, that though when the time comes you may drag me in spite of my entire innocence to the same ruin with them, you are now utterly supine. For, men of Athens, you appear to me to be altogether unstrung, waiting to suffer the horrors which others are suffering before your eyes, and taking no precautions, no thought for the city, which for so long has been exposed to destruction in many a dreadful form. Is it not, think you, dreadful and preternatural? For even where I had resolved upon silence, I am driven to speak." 
You doubtless know Pythocles here, the son of Pythodorus. I had been on very kindly terms with him, and to this day there has been no unpleasantness between us. He avoids me now, when he meets me, ever since he visited Philip, and if he is obliged to encounter me anywhere, he starts away immediately, lest anyone should see him talking with me. But with Eskines he walks all round the marketplace, discussing their plans. Now is it not a terrible and shocking thing, men of Athens, that those who have made it their choice to foster Philip's interests should be able to rely upon so accurate a discrimination on Philip's part, and that all that any one of them does here can no more be hid from Philip, so they believe, than if he were standing by their side, and that his friends and foes alike are those that Philip chooses, while those whose life is lived for your good, who are greedy of honour at your hands, and have not betrayed you, should be met by such deafness, such blindness on your part, that to-day I have to wrestle with these devils incarnate on equal terms, and that before you, who know the whole truth. Would you know or hear the cause of these things? I will tell you, and I beg that none of you be angry with me for speaking the truth. It is, I imagine, that Philip has but one body and one soul, and it is with all his heart that he cherishes those who do him good and detests those who do him evil, whereas each of you, in the first place, has no feeling that the good or the evil which is being done to the city is being done to himself. Other feelings are of more consequence and often lead you astray. Pity, envy, anger, favour towards the suppliant, and an infinite number of other motives, while if a man has actually escaped all this, he will still not escape from those who do not want such a man to exist at all. And so the terror due to each of these single causes stills on little by little, till the state is exposed to the whole accumulated mischief. Do not fall victims to any such error today, men of Athens. Do not let the defendant go, when he has done you all the wrong. For honestly, if you let him go, what will be said of you? Certain men, it will be said, went as ambassadors to Philip yonder, Philocrates, Eschines, Phrynon, and Demosthenes, and what happened? One of them not only gained nothing by his mission, but ransomed the prisoners at his private expense. Another, with the money for which he sold the interests of his country, went about purchasing harlots and fish. One of them, the abominable Frenon, sent his son to Philip before he had registered him as an adult. The other did nothing unworthy of himself or his city. One, Though serving as Corrigus and Triarch, felt it his duty voluntarily to incur that further expense, to ransom the prisoners, rather than see any of his fellow citizens suffering misfortune for want of means. The other, so far from rescuing any of those who were already in captivity, joined in bringing a whole district and more than ten thousand infantry and a thousand cavalry with them, the forces of the actual allies of his country, into captivity to Philip. What followed? When the Athenians got them into their hands, for they had long known the truth, what did they do? They let go the men who had received bribes and had disgraced themselves and their city and their children. They thought that these were wise men and that all was well with the city, and as for their accuser, they thought him thunderstruck, a man who did not understand his country and did not know where to fling his money away. And who, men of Athens, with this example before his eyes, will be willing to offer you his honest service? Who will act as ambassador for nothing, if he is not only to gain nothing by it, but is not to be more trustworthy, in your eyes, than those who have taken money? You are not only trying these men today, but you are laying down a law for all future time, a law which will declare whether your ambassadors are to serve the enemy for a price, or to act disinterestedly for your true good and to take no bribe. 
On all the other points you require no evidence, but to prove that Frinon sent his son, to the clerk, call me the witnesses to the facts. Eskines then did not prosecute Frinon for sending his own son to Philip for a disgraceful purpose, but because a man, who in his youth was above the average in appearance, did not foresee the suspicion which his good looks might entail, and afterwards lived a somewhat fast life, he has prosecuted him for unnatural offences. Now let me speak of the banquet and the decree, for I had almost overlooked what I was especially bound to tell you. In drawing up the resolution of the council with reference to the first embassy, and again in addressing the people, at the assemblies in which you were to discuss the question of peace, not a single word or act of a criminal nature on the part of these men having so far come to light, I followed the ordinary custom and proposed to accord them a vote of thanks and to invite them to the town hall. And I did, of course, entertain Philip's ambassadors as well, and on a very splendid scale, men of Athens, for when I saw that in their own country they prided themselves even on things like these, as showing their prosperity and splendor, I thought that I must begin by outdoing them in this respect, and displaying even greater magnificence. These incidents Eskines will shortly bring forward to prove that, Demosthenes himself voted thanks to us and gave a banquet to the ambassadors, without telling you the precise time when the incidents occurred. For these things belong to a time before any injury had been done to the city and before it was evident that they had sold themselves. The ambassadors had only just arrived on their first visit. The people had still to hear what they proposed, and there was nothing as yet to show that Eschines would support Philocrates, or that Philocrates would make such proposals as he did. If then Eschines uses any such argument, remember that the dates of the incidents are earlier than those of his crimes. But since then there has been no friendliness between myself and them, and no common action. To the clerk. Read the deposition. The deposition is read. Now perhaps his brother Philocaris will support him, and Aphobitus. There is much that you may fairly urge in reply to both, and I am obliged, men of Athens, to speak to you quite freely and without any reserve. You, Philocaris, are a painter of vase cases and drums. Your brothers are underclerks and quite ordinary men. Not that there is any harm in these things, but at the same time they do not qualify a man to be a general. And yet, Aphabetus and Philocaris, we thought you worthy to be ambassadors and generals and to receive the highest honours. So that even if none of you were guilty of any crime, we should owe no gratitude to you. You would rather owe gratitude to us for your preferment for we passed by many others more deserving of such honours than you were, and exalted you instead. But if in the enjoyment of these very honours one of you has actually committed crimes, and crimes of such a nature, how much more deserving are you of execration than of acquittal? Much more, I am sure. Perhaps they will force their claims upon you, for they are loud-voiced and shameless, and they have taken to themselves the motto that it is pardonable for brother to help brother. But you must not give way. Remember that if it is right for them to think of Eskines, it is for you to think of the laws and the whole state, and above all, of the oath which you yourselves, who sit here, have taken. Yes, and if they have entreated some of you to save the defendant, then ask yourselves whether you are to save him if he is proved innocent of crime, or even if he is proved guilty. If they ask you to do so, should he be innocent, I too say that you must acquit him. But if you are asked to acquit him, whatever he has done, then they have asked you to commit perjury. For though your vote is secret, it will not be hidden from the gods, and the framer of our law, which enjoins secret voting, was absolutely right, 
when he saw that though none of these men will know which of you has granted his request, the gods will know, and the unseen powers, who has given the unjust vote. And it is better for a man to lay up, for his children and himself, those good hopes which they can bestow by giving the decision that is just and right, than to win credit from these men for a favour of whose reality they can have no certain knowledge, and to acquit the defendant when his own testimony condemns him. For what stronger testimony can I produce, Eskinis, to prove how terrible your work as ambassador has been, than your own testimony against yourself? For when you thought it necessary to involve in so great and dreadful a calamity one who wished to reveal some of your actions as ambassador, it is plain that you expected your own punishment to be a terrible one, if your countrymen learned what you had done. That step, if you are wise, he will prove to have taken to his own detriment, not only because it is an overwhelming proof of the nature of his conduct as ambassador, but also because of those expressions which he used in the course of the prosecution and which are now at our disposal against himself. For the principles of justice, as defined by you when you were prosecuting Temarchus, must, I presume, be no less valid when used by others against yourself. His words to the jury on that occasion were these. Demosthenes intends to defend Timarchus and to denounce my acts as ambassador. And then, when he has led you off the point by his speech, he will brag of it and go about saying, Well, what do you think? Why, I led the jury right away from the point and stole the case triumphantly out of their hands. Then you at least must not act thus but must make your defence with reference to the real points of your case, though, when you were prosecuting Timarchus on that occasion, you permitted yourself to make any charges and assertions that you chose. But there were verses too, which you recited before the jury, in your inability to produce any witnesses to the charges on which you were prosecuting Timarchus. Rumour, the voice of many folk, not all, doth die. For rumour, too, a goddess is. Well, Eskenes, all those who were present say that you have made money out of your mission, and so it holds true against you, I suppose, that rumour, the voice of many folk, not all doth die. For observe how easily you can ascertain how much larger a body of accusers appears in your case than in his. Timarchus was not known even to all his neighbours, while there is not a man, Hellene or foreigner, but says that you and your fellow ambassadors made money out of your mission. And so, if the rumour is true, then the rumour, which is the voice of many folk, is against you, and you have yourself laid down that such a rumour is to be believed, that rumour too a goddess is and that the poet who composed these lines was a wise man. Then, you remember, he collected some iambic verses and recited the whole passage. For instance, Whoso in evil company delights, of him I ne'er inquired, for well I trow, as is his company, such is the man. And when a man goes to the cockpit and walks about with Pitalicus, he added more to the same effect. Surely, said he, you know what to think of him. Well, Eskines, this same verses will now exactly serve my turn against you, and if I quote them to the jury, the quotation will be true and opposite. But whoso in the company delights, of Philocrates, and that, when he is an ambassador, of him I ne'er inquired, for well I trow, that he has taken money, as did Philocrates, who does not deny it? He attempts to insult others by labelling them hack writers and sophists. He shall himself be proved liable to these very imputations. The verses he quoted are derived from the Phoenix of Euripides, a play which has never to this day been acted either by Theodorus or Aristodemus, the actors under whom Eschines always played third-rate parts, though it was performed by Molon, and no doubt by other actors of former times. 
but the Antigone of Sophocles has often been acted by Theodorus and often by Aristodemus, and in this play there are some admirable and instructive verses which he must know quite well by heart, since he has often delivered them himself, but which he has omitted to quote. For you know, I am sure, that in every tragedy it is, as it were, the special privilege of third-rate actors to play in the role of tyrants and sceptred kings. Consider, then, these excellent lines placed by the poet in the mouth of our crayon, Eschines in this play, lines which he neither repeated to himself to guide him as an ambassador, nor yet quoted to the jury. To the clerk. Read the passage. Verses from the Antigone of Sophocles To learn aright the soul and heart and mind of any man, for that devises none, till he be proved in government and law, and so revealed, for he who guides the state, yet cleaves not in his counsels to the best, but from some fear in prison locks his tongue, is in mine eyes, as he hath ever been, vilest of men, and him who sets his friend before his land I count of no esteem, for I, be it known to God's all-viewing eye, would ne'er keep silence seeing the march of doom upon this city, doom in safety stead, nor ever take to me as mine own friend my country's foe. For this I know that she, our country, is the ship that bears us safe, and safe aboard her while she sails erect, we make good friends. None of these lines did Eschines ever repeat to himself during his mission. Instead of preferring his country, he thought that to be friend and guest friend of Philip was much more important and profitable for himself, and bade a long farewell to the wise Sophocles. He saw the march of doom draw near in the campaign against the Phocians, but he gave no warning, no announcement of what was to come. On the contrary, he helped to conceal it. He helped to carry out the doom. He prevented those who would have given warning, not remembering that our country is the sheep that bears us safe and safe aboard her, his mother, with the help of her initiations and purifications and the property of the clients on whom she lived, reared up these sons of hers to their destined greatness, while his father, who kept an elementary school, as I am told by my elders, near the temple of the hero-physician, made a living, such as he could indeed, but still on the same ship. The sons, who had received money as underclerks and servants in all the magistrates' offices, were finally elected clerks by you, and for two years continued to get their living in the round chamber, and Eschines was just now dispatched as your ambassador from this same ship. He regarded none of these things. He took no care that the ship should sail erect. Nay, he capsized her. He sunk the ship. He did all that he could to bring her into the power of the enemy. What then? Are you not a sophist? Aye, and a villainous one. Are you not a hack? Aye, and one detested of heaven. For you passed over the scene which you had so often performed and knew well by heart, while you sought out a scene which you had never acted in your life, and produced the passage in the hope of injuring one of your fellow citizens. And now examine his speech about Solon. He told us that the statue of Solon, with his hand concealed in the drapery of his robe, was erected as an illustration of the self-restraint of the orators of that day. This was in the course of a scurrilous attack upon the impetuosity of Timarchus. But the Salaminians tell us that this statue was erected less than fifty years ago, whereas some two hundred and forty years have passed between the time of Solon and the present day, so that not only was the artist who modelled him in this attitude not living in Solon's day, but even his grandfather was not. That then is what he told the jury, copying the attitude as he did so, but that which it would have done his country far more good to see, the soul and the mind of Solon, he did not copy. No, he did the very reverse. 
for when Salamis had revolted from Athens and the death penalty had been decreed against anyone who proposed to attempt its recovery, Solon, by singing at the risk of his own life, a lay which he had composed, won back the island for his country and wiped out her disgrace, while Aeschines, when the king and all the Hellenes had decided that Amphipolis was yours, surrendered and sold it, and supported Philocrates, who proposed the resolution for this purpose. It is indeed worth his while, is it not, to remember Solon? Nor was he content with acting thus in Athens, for when he had gone to Macedonia, he did not even mention the name of the place which it was the object of his mission to secure. This, in fact, he reported to you himself, in words which doubtless you remember, I, too, had something to say about Amphipolis, but in order that Demosthenes might have an opportunity of speaking upon the subject, I left it to him, upon which I came forward and denied that Aeschines had left to me anything which he was anxious to say to Philip. He would rather have given anyone a share in his life-blood than in his speech. The truth is, I imagine, that he had taken money, and as Philip had given him the money in order that he might not have to restore Amphipolis, he could not speak in opposition to Philip's case. Now, to the clerk, take this lay of Solon's and read it, and, to the jury, then you will know how Solon used to hate all such men as this. It is not when you are speaking, Aeschines, but when you are upon an embassy that you should keep your hand within your robe. But on the embassy you held out your hand and held it open. You brought shame to your countrymen. And do you here assume a solemn air and recite in those practiced tones the miserable phrases that you have learned by heart and expect to escape the penalty for all your heinous crimes, even if you do go round with a cap on your head uttering abuse against me? To the clerk, read the verses. Solon Slay The Father's voice hath spoken, whose word is destiny, and the blessed gods have willed it, the gods who shall not die, that ne'er shall the destroyer prevail against our land, the dread sire's valiant daughter guards us with eye and hand, yet her own sons in folly would lay their country low, for pelf and in her leaders a heart of sin doth grow, for them their pride's fell offspring, there awaiteth grievous pain, for sated still they know not, their proud lust to contain, not theirs, if mirth be with them, the decent peaceful feast, to sin they yield, and sinning rejoice in wealth increased, no hallowed treasure sparing, nor people's common store, this side and that his neighbour, each robs with havoc sore, the holy law of justice they guard not. Silence she who knows what is and hath been awaits the time to be. Then cometh she to judgment with certain step, though slow. Even now she smites the city, and none may escape the blow. To thraldom base she drives us, from slumber rousing strife, Fell war of kin destroying the young, the beauteous life, the foemen of their country, in wicked bands combine, fit company and stricken, the lovely land doth pine. These are the wrong, the mischief, that pace the earth at home, but many a beggared exile to other lands must roam sold chained in bonds unseemly for so to each man's hall comes home the people's sorrow and leaps the high fence wall no courtyard's door can stay it it follows to his side flee though he may and crouching in inmost chamber hide such warning unto Athens my spirit bids me sound that lawlessness in cities spreads evil all around, but lawfulness and order make all things good and right. 
chaining sin's hands in fetters, quenching the proud soul's light, smoothing the rough, the sated, staying and withering the flowers that fraught with ruin, from fatal seed upspring, the paths of crooked justice are turned into straight, the ways of pride grow gentle, the ways of strife and hate, then baleful faction ceases, then health prevails away, and wisdom still increases beneath law's wholesome sway. You hear, men of Athens, how Solon speaks of men like these, and of the gods who, he says, preserve the city. It is my belief, and my hope, that this saying of his, that the gods preserve our city, is true at all times. But I believe that all that has happened in connection with the present examination is, in a sense, a special proof of the goodwill of some unseen power towards the city. Consider what has happened. A man who, as ambassador, did a work of great wickedness and has surrendered countries in which the gods should have been worshipped by yourselves and your allies, has disfranchised one who accepted the challenge to prosecute him. To what end? To the end that he himself might meet with no pity or mercy for his own iniquities. Nay, more... While prosecuting his victim, he deliberately set himself to speak evil of me, and again, before the people, he threatened to enter an indictment against me, and said more to the same effect. And to what end? To the end that I, who had the most perfect knowledge of all his acts of villainy, and had followed them closely throughout, might have your full indulgence in prosecuting him. I, and through postponing his appearance before you continually up to the present moment, he has been insensibly brought to a time when, on account of what is coming upon us, if for no other reason, it is neither possible nor safe for you to allow him, after his corruption, to escape unscathed. For though, men of Athens, you ought always to execrate and to punish those who are traitors and corrupt, to do so at this time would be more than ever seasonable and would confer a benefit upon all mankind in common. End of section 17「an awful disease has fallen upon Hellas, a disease hard to cope with and requiring abundant good fortune and abundant carefulness on your own part. For the most notable men in their several cities, the men who claim to lead in public affairs, are betraying their own liberty, unhappy men, and bringing upon themselves a self-chosen servitude under the milder names of friendship and companionship with Philip, and other such phrases, while the other citizens and the sovereign bodies in each city, however composed, whose duty it was to punish these men and slay them out of hand, are so far from taking any such action that they admire and envy them, and every one would be glad to be in the same case. Yet it is from this very cause, it is through entertaining ambitions like these, that the Thessalians, who up to yesterday or the day before had lost thereby only their paramount position and their dignity as a state, are now already being stripped of their very liberty, for there are Macedonian garrisons in some of their citadels. 
This same disease it is which has invaded the Peloponnese and brought about the massacres in Elis, infecting the unhappy people of that country with such insanity and frenzy that in order to be lords over one another and to gratify Philip, they murder their kinsmen and fellow citizens. Not even here has a disease been stayed. It has penetrated Arcadia and turned it upside down. And now many of the Arcadians, who should be no less proud of liberty than yourselves, for you and they alone are indigenous peoples, are declaring their admiration for Philip, erecting his image in bronze and crowning him. And, to complete the tale, they have passed a resolution that, if he comes to the Peloponnese, they will receive him within their walls. The Argives have acted in exactly the same way. These events, I say it in all solemnity and earnestness, call for no small precautions. For this plague, men of Athens, that is spreading all around us, has now found its way to Athens itself. While then we are still safe, ward it off, and take away the citizenship of those who first introduced it. Beware, lest otherwise you realize the worth of the advice given you this day, only when there is no longer anything that you can do. Do you not perceive, men of Athens, how vivid and plain an example has been afforded you by the unhappy Olynthians? The destruction of those wretched men was due to nothing so much as to conduct like that of which I speak. You can test this clearly if you review their history. For at a time when they possessed only four hundred cavalry and numbered not more than five thousand men in all, since the Chalcidians were not yet all united under one government, the Spartans came against them with a large force, including both army and fleet. For you doubtless remember that at that period the Spartans were virtually masters both of land and sea, and yet Though this great force came against them, the Olynthians lost neither the city nor any single fortress, but won many battles, killed three of the enemy's commanders, and finally concluded the war on their own terms. But when some of them began to take bribes, and the people as a whole were foolish enough, or rather unfortunate enough, to repose greater confidence in these men than in those who spoke for their own good, when Lasthenes roofed his house with the timber which came from Macedonia, and Euthycrates was keeping a large herd of cattle for which he had paid no one anything, when a third returned with sheep and a fourth with horses, while the people to whose detriment all this was being done, so far from showing any anger or any disposition to chastise men who acted so, actually gazed on them with envy and paid them honor and regarded them as heroes, when, I say, such practices were gaining ground in this way and corruption had been victorious, then, though they possessed one thousand cavalry and numbered more than ten thousand men, though all the surrounding people were their allies, though you were to their assistance with ten thousand mercenaries and fifty ships and with four thousand citizen soldiers as well, none of these things could save them. Before a year of the war had expired, they had lost all the cities in Chalcidice, while Philip could no longer keep pace with the invitations of the traitors and did not know which place to occupy first. Five hundred horsemen were betrayed by their own commanders and captured by Philip with their arms, a larger number than were ever before captured by anyone, and the men who acted thus were not ashamed to face the sun or the earth, the soil of their native land on which they stood, or the temples or the sepulchres of the dead, or the disgrace which was bound to follow upon such deeds afterwards. Such is the madness and destruction which corruption engenders. So it is for you, for you, the people, to be wise, to refuse to suffer such things and to visit them with public chastisement. For it would be monstrous indeed 
if, after the terrible condemnation which you passed upon those who betrayed the Olynthians, it were seen that you allowed the criminals who are in your very midst to go unpunished. To the clerk. Read the decree passed with reference to the Olynthians. The decree is read. This decree, gentlemen of the jury, is one which, in the eyes of all, Hellenes and foreigners alike, it was right and honorable in you to have passed in condemnation of traitors and men detested of heaven. And so, since the taking of the bribe is the step which precedes such actions, and it is the bribe that prompts the traitor's deeds, Whenever, men of Athens, you find a man receiving a bribe, you must count him a traitor as well. That one man betrays opportunities, and another affairs of state, and another soldiers, means only, I imagine, that each works mischief in the particular department over which he has control. But there should be no distinction in your execration of all such men. You, men of Athens, are the only people in the world who can draw from your own history examples which bear upon this matter, and who have those ancestors whom you rightly praise to imitate in your actions. You may not be able at the present time to imitate them in the battles, the campaigns, the perils in which they distinguished themselves, since at the present moment you are at peace, but at least you can imitate their wisdom. For of wisdom there is need everywhere, and a right judgment is no more laborious or troublesome thing than a wrong one. Each of you need sit here no longer in order to judge and vote on the question before him or right, and so to make his country's position a better one and worthy of our ancestors than he must in order to judge and vote wrongly, and so make it worse and unworthy of our ancestors." What, then, were their sentiments on this matter? To the clerk. Take this clerk and read it. To the jury. For I would have you see that the acts towards which you are so indifferent are acts for which your forefathers voted death to the doers. To the clerk. Read. An inscription is read. You hear the inscription, men of Athens, declaring that Arthmias of Zeleia, son of Pithonax, is a foe and a public enemy to the people of Athens and their allies, both he and all his house. And why? Because he brought the gold from the foreigner to the Hellenes. Apparently, therefore, we may judge from this that your ancestors sought to ensure that no one not even a stranger would work mischief against Hellas for money, whereas you do not even seek to prevent any of your fellow citizens from injuring his own city. But, it may be said, the inscription occupies a quite unimportant position. On the contrary, although all yonder Acropolis is sacred and there is no lack of space upon it, this inscription stands on the right hand of the great bronze statue of Athena, the prize of valor in the war against the barbarians, set up by the state with funds which the Hellenes had presented to her. In those days, therefore, uprightness was so sacred, and such merit was attached to the punishment of actions like these, that the sentences passed upon such crimes were thought to deserve the same position as the prize statue of the goddess. And now, unless you, in your turn, set a check upon this excess of license, the result must be ridicule, impunity, and shame. You should do well, I think, men of Athens, to imitate your forefathers, not in this or that point alone, but continuously, and in all that they did. Now I am sure that you have all heard the story of Callias, the son of Hipponicus, to whose diplomacy was due the peace which is universally celebrated, and which provided that the king should not come down by land within a day's ride of the sea, nor sail with a ship of war between the Caledonian islands and the Cyanian rocks. He was thought to have taken bribes on his mission, and your forefathers almost put him to death, and actually find him at the examination of his report a sum of fifty talents. 
True it is that no more honorable peace can be mentioned than this, of all which the city ever made before or afterwards. But it was not to this that they looked. The nature of the peace they attributed to their own prowess and the glory of their city. But whether the transaction was disinterested or corrupt depended upon the character of the ambassador, and they expected the character displayed by one who took part in public affairs to be upright and incorruptible. Your ancestors then regarded corruption as so inimical, so unprofitable to the state, that they would not admit it in connection with any single transaction or any single man. While you, men of Athens, though you have seen that the peace which has laid low the walls of your own allies is building the houses of your ambassadors, that the peace which has robbed the city of her possessions has secured for them more than they had ever before hoped for even in their dreams you i say instead of putting them to death of your own accord need a prosecutor to assist you and when all can see their crimes in very deed you are making their trial a trial of words it is not, however, by the citation of ancient history, nor by these examples alone, that one may stimulate you to vengeance. For even within the lifetime of yourselves, who are here and still living, many have paid the penalty. All the rest of these I will pass over, but I will mention one or two of those who were punished with death on returning from a mission whose results have been far less disastrous to the city than those of the present embassy. To the clerk. Take then this decree and read it. The decree is read. In this decree, men of Athens, you passed sentence of death upon those ambassadors, one of whom was Epicrates, a good man, as I am told by my elders, and one who had in many ways been of service to his country, one of those who brought the people back from the Piraeus, and who was generally an upholder of the democracy. Yet none of these services helped him, and rightly, for one who claims to manage affairs of such magnitude has not merely to be half honest. He must not secure your confidence and then take advantage of it to increase his power to do mischief. He must do absolutely no wrong against you of his own will. Now, if there is one of the things for which those men were sentenced to death that these men have not done, you may put me to death without delay." observe what the charges were since they concluded their mission says the decree contrary to the terms of their resolution that is the first of the charges and have not these men contravened the terms of the resolution does not the decree speak of peace for the athenians and the allies of the athenians and did they not exclude the phocians from the treaty does not the decree bid them administer the oath to the magistrates in the several cities? And did they not administer it to men sent to them by Philip? Does not the resolution forbid them to meet Philip anywhere alone? And did they not incessantly do business with him privately? Again I read, and some of them have been convicted of making a false report before the council. But these men have been convicted of doing so before the people as well and convicted by whom for this is the splendid thing convicted by the actual facts for all that has happened as you know has been the exact reverse of what they announced and the decree goes on of not sending true dispatches nor did these men and of accusing our allies falsely and taking bribes instead of accusing falsely say of having utterly ruined surely a far more heinous thing than a false accusation and as for the charge of taking bribes if it had been denied it would still have required proof but since they admitted it a summary procedure was surely the proper one what then will you do men of athens you are the offspring of that generation, and some of you are actually survivors from it. And will you endure it that Epicrates, the benefactor of the people, one of the men from the Piraeus, should have been exiled and punished? 
that Thrasybulus, again, the son of the great Thrasybulus, the people's friend, who brought the people back from Philly, should recently have been fined ten talents, and that the descendant of Harmodius, and of those who achieved for you the greatest of blessings, and whom, for the benefits which they conferred upon you, you have caused to share the libations and the bowls outpoured, in every temple where sacrifices offered, singing of them and honouring them as you honour heroes and gods, that all these, I say, should have undergone the penalty ordained by the laws, and that no feeling of compassion or pity, nor the tears of their children, who bore the names of our benefactors, nor aught else, should have availed them anything. And yet, when you have to do with the son of Atromitus, the schoolmaster, and Glaucothia, who used to hold these meetings of the initiated, a practice for which another priestess was put to death. When you have in your hands the son of such parents, a man who never did a single service to his country, neither himself, nor his father, nor any of his house, will you let him go? Where is the horse, the trireme, the military service, the chorus, the burden undertaken for the state? the war contribution, the loyal action, the peril undergone, for which in all their lifetime the city has had to thank him or his. Ay, and even if all these stood to his credit, and those other qualifications of uprightness and integrity in his mission were not also to be found in him, it would surely have been right that he should perish. But when neither the one nor the other are to be found, will you not avenge yourselves upon him? Will you not call to mind his own words when he was prosecuting Timarchus, that there was no help for a city which had no sinews to use against the criminal, nor for a constitution in which compassion and solicitation were more powerful than the laws, that it was your duty not to pity the aged mother of Timarchus, nor his children, nor any one else, but to attend solely to one point, namely, that if you abandoned the cause of the laws and the constitution, you would look in vain for any to have pity on yourselves. Is that unhappy man to have lost his rights as a citizen, because he witnessed the guilt of Eschines, and will you then suffer Eschines to escape unscathed? On what ground can you do so? For if Eschines demanded so heavy a penalty from those whose sins were against their own persons, what must be the magnitude of the penalty which you should require, you, the sworn judges of the case, from those who have sinned so greatly against their country's interests, and of whom Eschines is convincingly proved to be one? But, we are told, that was a trial which will raise the moral standard of our young men. Yes, and this trial will raise that of our statesmen, upon whose character the supreme interests of the city are staked. For your care ought to extend to them also. But you must realize that his real motive for ruining Timarchus himself was not, heaven knows, to be found in any anxiety for the virtue of your sons. Indeed, men of Athens, they are virtues even now, for I trust that the city will never have fallen so low as to need Ephobetus and Eschines to reform the morals of the young. No, the reason was that Timarchus had proposed in the council that if anyone was convicted of conveying arms or fittings for ships of war to Philip, the penalty should be death. And here is a proof. How long had Timarchus been in the habit of addressing you? For a long time. Now, throughout all this time, Eschines was in Athens and never showed any vexation or indignation at the fact of such a man addressing you until he had been to Macedonia and made himself a hireling. To the clerk. Come, take the actual decree which Timarchus proposed and read it. The decree is read. So the man who proposed on your behalf the resolution which forbade, on pain of death, the supply of arms to Philip during the war, has been ruined and treated with contumely. While Eschines, who had surrendered the arms of your very allies to Philip, was his accuser and charged him, I call heaven and earth to witness, 
with unnatural offences, although two of his own kinsmen stood by his side, the very sight of whom would call forth a cry of protest from you, the disgusting Nicias, who went to Egypt and hired himself to Cabrias, and the accursed Kiberion, who joins in processions as a reveller without a mask. Nay, why mention these things? His own brother Aphabetes was there before his eyes. In very truth, all the words that were spoken on that day about unnatural offences were water flowing upstream. And now, to show you the dishonour into which the villainy and mendacity of the defendant have brought our country, passing by all besides, I will mention a fact known to you all. Formerly men of Athens, all the other Hellenes used to watch attentively to see what had been resolved in your assembly, but now we are already going about and inquiring what others have decided, trying to overhear what the Arcadians are doing, or the Amphictyons, or where Philip will be next, and whether he is alive or dead. We do this, do we not? But for me the terrible question is not whether Philip is alive, but whether in this city the habit of execrating and punishing criminals is dead. Philip has no terrors for me if your own spirit is sound, but the prospect that you may grant security to those who wish to receive their wages from him, that they may be supported by some of those whom you have trusted, and that those who have all along denied that they were acting in Philip's interests may now mount the platform in their defence. That is the prospect which terrifies me. Tell me, Eubulus, why it was that at the recent trial of your cousin Hegesilaus and of Thrasybulus, the uncle of Nicaratus, when the primary question was before the jury, you would not even respond when they called upon you, and that when you rose to speak on the assessment of the penalty, you uttered not a word in their defence, but only asked the jury to be indulgent to you. Do you refuse to ascend the platform in defence of kinsmen and relations, and will you then do so in defence of Aeschines, who, when Aristophon was prosecuting Philonicus, and in accusing him was denouncing your own acts, joined with him in accusing you, and was found in the ranks of your enemies? You frightened your countrymen here by saying that they must either march down to the Piraeus at once and pay the war tax and convert the festival fund into a war fund, or else pass the decree advocated by Aeschines and proposed by the shameless Philocrates, a decree of which the result was that the peace became a disgraceful instead of a fair one, and that these men have ruined everything by their crimes. And have you, after all this, become reconciled to him? You uttered imprecations upon Philip in the presence of the people and swore by the life of your children that you would be glad if perdition seized him. And will you now come to the aid of Aeschines? How can perdition seize Philip when you are trying to save those who take bribes from him? Why is it that you prosecuted Maracles for misappropriating twenty drachmae out of the sums paid by each of the lessees of the mines, and indicted Ctesiphon for the theft of sacred monies because he paid seven minae into the bank three days too late? And yet, when men have taken money and confess it, and are convicted by being caught in the very act of having done so in order to bring about the ruin of our allies, you do not prosecute them, but even command their acquittal. But the appalling character of these crimes, and the great watchfulness and caution that they call for, and the triviality of the offences for which you prosecuted those other men, may further be seen in this way. Were there any men in Ellis who stole public funds? It is very likely indeed. Well, had any of them anything to do with the overthrow of the democracy there? Not one of them. Again, while Olynthus was standing, were there others of the same character there? I am sure that there were. Was it then through them that Olynthus was destroyed? No. Again, do you not suppose that in Megara there was someone who was a thief and who embezzled public funds? 
There must have been. Well, has any such person been shown to be responsible for the recent crisis there? Not one. But of what sort are the men who commit crimes of such a character and magnitude? They are those who count themselves worthy to be styled friends and guest friends of Philip, who would fain be generals, who claim to be leaders, who must needs be exalted above the people. Was not Perilous put on his trial lately before the three hundred at Megara because he went to Philip's court? And did not Theodorus, the first man in Megara in wealth, family and distinction, come forward and beg him off and send him back again to Philip? And was not the consequence that the one came back at the head of the mercenaries while the other was churning the butter at home? For there is nothing, nothing, I say, in the world which you must be so careful not to do as not to allow anyone to become more powerful than the people. I would have no man acquitted or doomed to please any individual. Only let us be sure that the man whose actions acquit or condemn him will receive from you the verdict he deserves. That is the true democratic principle. And further, it is true that many men have come to possess great influence with you at particular times. Callistratus, and again Aristophon, Diophantus, and others before them. But where did each of these exercise his primacy? In the assembly of the people. But in the law courts no man has ever to this day carried more influence than the laws and the juror's oath. Do not then allow the defendant to have such influence today, to prove to you that there is good reason for you not to trust but to beware of such influence. I will read you an oracle of the gods who always protect the city far better than do its foremost citizens. To the clerk, read the oracles. The oracles are read. You hear, men of Athens, the warnings of the gods. If these responses were given by them when you were at war, they mean that you must beware of your generals, since in war it is the generals who are leaders. But if they were uttered after you had made peace, they must refer to those who are at the head of your government, for these are the leaders whom you obey, and it is by these that you are in danger of being led astray. And hold the state together, says the oracle, until all are of one mind and afford no joy to their foes. Which event then, men of Athens, do you think would afford joy to Philip? The acquittal of one who has brought about all this evil? Or his punishment? His acquittal, I'm sure. But the oracle, you see, says that we should so act as not to afford joy to our foes, and therefore, by the mouth of Zeus, of Dion, and of all the gods, is this exhortation given to us all, that with one mind we chastise those who have done any service to our enemies. Without are those who are plotting against us, within are their confederates. The part of the plotters is to offer the bribe, that of their confederates is to receive it and to save from condemnation those who have received it. End of section 18Section 19 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Embassy, Part 9. And further, it needs no more than human reason to arrive at the conclusion that nothing can be more hateful and dangerous than to allow your first citizen to be intimate with those whose objects are not those of the people. Consider by what means Philip has become master of the entire situation, and by what means he has accomplished the greatest of his successes. It has been by purchasing the opportunities for action from those who offered them for sale. 
by corrupting and exciting the aspirations of the leaders of their several cities. These have been the means. Now, both of these methods, it is in your power, if you wish it, to render futile today, if you will refuse to listen to prominent speakers who speak in defense of such practices, and will thus prove that they have no power over you, for now they assert that they have you under their control, while at the same time you punish the man who has sold himself and let all the world see what you have done. For you would have reason enough, men of Athens, for being angry with any man who had acted so, and had betrayed your allies and your friends and your opportunities, for with these are bound up the whole prosperity or adversity of every people, but with no one more than with Eschines or with greater justice. After taking up a position as one of those who mistrusted Philip, after being the first and the only man to perceive that Philip was the common enemy of all the Hellenes, he deserted, he betrayed you, he suddenly became Philip's supporter. Surely he deserves to die many times over. Nay, he himself will not be able to deny that these things are so. For who was it that brought Iskander forward before you originally, stating that he had come from the friends of Athens in Arcadia? Who was it that cried out that Philip was organizing Hellas and the Peloponnese against you while you were asleep? Who was it that delivered those long and noble orations to the people that read to you the decrees of Miltiades and Themistocles and the oath of the young soldiers in the temple of Aglarus? Was it not the defendant? Who was it that persuaded you to send embassies almost as far as the Red Sea on the ground that Philip was plotting against Hellas and that it was for you to foresee this and not to sacrifice the interests of the Hellenes? Was it not Eubulus who proposed the decree while the ambassador to the Peloponnese was the defendant Eschines? What expressions he used in his address to the people after he arrived there is best known to himself but i know you all remember what he reported to you many a time in the course of his speech he called philip barbarian and devil and he reported the delight of the arcadians at the thought that athens was now waking up and attending to public affairs one thing he told us which caused him he said more distress than anything else as he was leaving he met a trestidas who was travelling home from Philip's court, and with him were walking some thirty women and children. Wondering at this, he asked one of the travellers who the man was, and what this crowd was along with him. And on hearing that it was Atrestidas who was on his way home, and that these with him were captives from Olynthus, whom Philip has given him as a present, he was struck with the atrocity of the thing, and burst into tears, and lamented the unhappy condition of Hellas that she should allow such tragedies to pass unnoticed. At the same time, he counselled you to send representatives to Arcadia to denounce Philip's agents, saying that his friends told him that if Athens took notice of the matter and sent envoys, Philip's agents would be punished. Such, men of Athens, was the tenor of his speeches then, and very noble they were, and worthy of this city. But when he had been to Macedonia, and had seen the enemy of himself and of the Hellenes, were his speeches couched any more in the same or a similar tone? Far from it. He told you that you must neither remember your forefathers, nor mention your trophies, nor go to the aid of anyone. He was amazed, he said, at those who urged you to confer with the rest of the Hellenes in regard to the peace with Philip, as though there was any need to convince someone else about a matter which was purely your own affair. And as for Philip, why, good gracious, said he, Philip is the most thorough Hellene in the world, a most able speaker, and most friendly towards Athens. Only there are certain persons in Athens so unreasonable and so churlish that they are not ashamed to slander him and call him barbarian. Now, is it possible that the man who has formerly spoken as Eschines did 
should now have dared to speak in such a way if he had not been corrupted? What? Is there a man who, after conceiving such detestation for Atrestidas, owing to those children and women from Olynthus, could have endured to act in conjunction with Philocrates, who brought free-born Olynthian women here to gratify his lust, and is so notorious for his abominable living, that it is unnecessary for me now to use any offensive or unpleasant expression about him, for if I say that Philocrates brought women here, the rest will be understood by all of you and of the bystanders, and you will, I am sure, pity the poor unhappy creatures, though Eschines felt no pity for them, and shed no tears for Halas at the sight of them, or at the thought of the outrages they were suffering among their own allies at the hands of our ambassadors. No, he will shed tears on his own behalf, he whose proceedings as ambassador have had such results, and perhaps he will bring forward his children and mount them upon the platform. But, gentlemen of the jury, when you see the children of Eschines, remember that the children of many of your allies and friends are now vagabonds, wandering in beggary, owing to the cruel treatment they have suffered in consequence of his conduct, and that these deserve your compassion far more than those whose father is a criminal and a traitor. Remember that your own children have been robbed even of their hopes by these men, who inserted among the terms of the peace the clause which extended it to posterity. And when you see the tears of Eschines, remember that you have now before you a man who urged you to send representatives to Arcadia to denounce the agents of Philip. Now, today, you need send no embassy to the Peloponnese. You need take no long journey. You need incur no traveling expenses. Each of you need only come as far as this platform to deposit the vote which piety and justice demand of him on behalf of your country, and to condemn the man who, I call earth and heaven to witness, after originally delivering the speeches which I described, speaking of Marathon and of Salamis, and of your battles and your trophies, suddenly, so soon as he had set foot in Macedonia, changed his tone completely, and told you that you must not remember your forefathers, nor recount your trophies, nor go to the aid of any one, nor take common counsel with the Hellenes, who all but told you that you must pull down your walls. Never throughout all time up to this day have speeches more shameful than these been delivered before you. What Hellene, what foreigner is so dense, or so uninstructed, or so fierce in his hatred of our city, that if one were to put him this question and say, Tell me now, of all Hellas as it now is, all this inhabited country, is there any part which would have been called by this name or inhabited by the Hellenes, who now possess it, unless those who fought at Marathon and Salamis, our forefathers, had displayed that high prowess on their behalf? Why, I am certain that not one would answer yes. They would say that all these regions must have been conquered by the barbarians. If then no single man, not even one of our enemies, would have deprived them of these their panegyrics and praises, does Eschines forbid you to remember them? You, their descendants, in order that he himself may receive money? In all other blessings, moreover, the dead have no share. But the praises which follow their noble deeds are the peculiar possession of those who have died thus, for then even envy opposes them no longer. Of these praises Eschines would deprive them, and justly therefore would he now be deprived of his privileges as a citizen, and justly in the name of your forefathers would you exact from him this penalty. Such words you used, nevertheless, in the wickedness of your heart, to despoil and traduce the deeds of our forefathers, and by your word you ruined all our interests in very deed, and then, as the outcome of this, you are a landed gentleman, and have become a personage of consequence. 
For these two, you must notice, before he had wrought every kind of mischief against the city, he acknowledged that he had been a clerk. He was grateful to you for having elected him and behaved himself modestly. But since he was wrought countless evils, he has drawn up his eyebrows, and if anyone speaks of Eskinis, the late clerk, he is his enemy at once and declares that he has been insulted. He walks through the marketplace with his cloak trailing down to his ankles, keeping step with Pithocles and puffing out his cheeks, already one of Philip's friends and guest friends, if you please, one of those who would be rid of the democracy and who regard the established constitution as so much tempestuous madness, he who was once the humble servant of the round chamber. I wish now to recapitulate to you summarily the ways in which Philip got the better of you in policy when he had taken these heaven-detested men to aid him. It is well worth while to review and contemplate the course of his deception as a whole. It began with his anxiety for peace, for his country was being plundered and his ports were closed so that he could enjoy none of the advantages which they afforded and so he sent the messengers who uttered those generous sentiments on his behalf, Neoptolemus, Aristodemus, and Ctesiphon. But so soon as we went to him as your ambassadors, he immediately hired the defendant to second and cooperate with the abominable Philocrates, and so get the better of those who wished to act uprightly. And he composed such a letter to you as he thought would be most likely to help him to obtain peace. But even so, he had no better chance than before of effecting anything of importance against you unless he could destroy the Phocians, and this was no easy matter, for he had now been reduced, as if by chance, to a position in which he must either find it impossible to effect any of his designs, or else must perforce lie and forswear himself and make all men, whether Hellenes or foreigners, witnesses of his own baseness. For if, on the one hand, he received the Phocians as allies, and administered the oath to them together with yourselves, it at once became necessary for him to break his oath to the Thessalians and Thebans, for he had sworn to aid the latter in the reduction of Boeotia, and the former in the recovery of the place in the Aphictionic Council, but if, on the other hand, he refused to receive them, as in fact he did reject them, he thought that you would not let him cross the pass, but would rally to Thermopylae, and so you would have done, had you not been misled. And if this happened, he calculated that he would be unable to march across. Nor had he to learn this from others, he had already the testimony of his own experience, for on the occasion of his first defeat of the Phocians, when he destroyed their mercenaries and their leader and general, Onomarchus, although not a single human being, Hellene or foreigner, came to the aid of the Phocians, except yourselves, so far was he from crossing the pass and thereafter carrying out any of his designs that he could not even approach near it. He realized, I imagine, quite clearly that at a time when the feelings of the Thessalians were turning against him and the Pharians, to take the first instance, refused to accompany him, when the Thebans were being worsted and had lost a battle and a trophy had been erected to celebrate their defeat, it was impossible for him to cross the pass if you rallied to its defense and that if he made the attempt he would regret it unless some cunning could be called in to aid him. How then, he asked, can I avoid open falsehood and yet accomplish all that I wish without appearing perjured? How can it be done? It can be done, if I can get some of the Athenians to deceive the Athenians. In that case, the discredit no longer falls to my share. And so Philip's own envoys first informed you that Philip declined to receive the Phocians as allies, and then these men took up the tale and addressed you to the effect that it was inconvenient to Philip to receive the Phocians as your allies openly on account of the Thebans and the Thessalians, 
But if he gets command of the situation, they said, and is granted the peace, he will do just what we should now request him to promise to do. So they obtained the peace from you by holding out these seductive hopes without including the Phocians, but they had still to prevent the expedition to Thermopylae for the purpose of which, despite the peace, your fifty ships were still lying ready at anchor in order that if Philip marched, you might prevent him. How then could it be done? What cunning could be used in regard to this expedition in its turn? They must deprive you of the necessary time by bringing the crisis upon you suddenly, so that even if you wished to set out, you might be unable to do so. So this, it appears, was what these men undertook to do, while for my part, as you have often been told, I was unable to depart in advance of them, and was prevented from sailing even when I had hired a boat for the purpose." But it was further necessary that the Phocians should come to believe in Philip and give themselves up to him voluntarily, in order that there might be no delay in carrying out the plan, and that no hostile decree whatever might issue from you. And therefore, said he, the Athenian ambassadors shall announce that the Phocians are to be preserved from destruction, so that even if any one persists in distrusting me, he will believe them and put himself in my hands. We will summon the Athenians themselves, so that they may imagine that all that they want is secured, and may pass no hostile decree. But the ambassadors shall make such reports about us, and give such promises as will prevent them from moving under any circumstances. It was in this way, and by such trickery as this, that all was ruined, through the action of these doomed wretches. For immediately afterwards, as you know, instead of seeing Thespia and Plate repeopled, you heard that Archomenus and Coronia had been enslaved. Instead of Thebes being humbled and stripped of her insolence and pride, the walls of your own allies were being raised, and it was the Thebans who were raising them, the Thebans who, according to Aeschines' story, were as good as broken up into villages. Instead of Euboea being handed over to you in exchange for Amphipolis, Philip is making new bases of operation against you in Euboea itself, and is plotting incessantly against Gerastus and Megara. Instead of the restoration of Oropus to you, we are making an expedition under arms to defend Dremus and the country about Panactum, a step which we never took so long as the Phocians remained unharmed. Instead of the restoration of the ancestral worship in the temple and the exaction of the debt due to the god, the true Amphictyons are fugitives who have been banished and their land laid desolate, and Macedonians, foreigners, men who never were Amphictyons in the past, are now forcing their way to recognition, while anyone who mentions the sacred treasures is thrown from the rocks and our city has been deprived of her right to precedence in consulting the oracle. Indeed, the story of all that has happened to the city sounds like a riddle. Philip has spoken no falsehood, and has accomplished all that he wished. You hoped for the fulfillment of your fondest prayers, and have seen the very opposite come to pass. You suppose yourselves to be at peace, and have suffered more terribly than if you had been at war. While these men have received money for all this, and up to this very day have not paid the penalty. For that the situation has been made what it is solely by bribery, and that these men have received their price for it all, has, I feel sure, long been plain to you in many ways. And I am afraid that, quite against my will, I may long have been wearying you by attempting to prove with elaborate exactness what you already know for yourselves. Yet this one point I ask you still to listen. Is there, gentlemen of the jury, one of the ambassadors whom Philip sent, whose statue in bronze you would erect in the marketplace? Nay, one to whom you would give maintenance in the town hall, or any other of those complimentary grants, with which you honour your benefactors, 
I think not. And why? For you are of no ungrateful or unfair or mean disposition. You would reply that it is because all that they did was done in the interest of Philip and nothing in your own, and the reply would be true and just. Do you imagine then that when such are your sentiments, Philip's are not also such? Do you imagine that he gives all this magnificent presence because your ambassadors conducted their mission honorably and uprightly with a view to your interest? Impossible. Think of Hegesippus and the manner in which he and the ambassadors who accompanied him were received by Philip. To go no further, he banished Xenoclides, the well-known poet, by public proclamation because he received the ambassadors his own fellow citizens. For so it is that he behaves to men who honestly say what they think on your behalf, while to those who have sold themselves he behaves as he has to these men. Do we then need witnesses? Do we need stronger proofs than these to establish my conclusions? Will anyone be able to steal these conclusions from your minds? Now I was told a most extraordinary thing just now by someone who accosted me in front of the court, namely that the defendant is prepared to accuse Caris, and that by such methods and such arguments as that he hopes to deceive you. I will not lay undue stress on the fact that Caris, subjected to every form of trial, was found to have acted on your behalf, so far as was in his power, with faithfulness and loyalty, while his frequent shortcomings were due to those who, for money, were cruelly injuring your cause. But I will go much further. Let it be granted that all that the defendant will say of Caris is true. Even so, it is utterly absurd that Eschines should accuse him, for I do not lay the blame on Eschines for anything that was done in the course of the war. It is the generals who have to account for all such proceedings, nor do I hold him responsible for the city's having made peace. So far I acquit him of everything. What then do I allege, and at what point does my accusation begin? I accuse him of having supported Philocrates, at the time when the city was making peace, instead of supporting those who proposed what was for your real good. I accuse him of taking bribes and subsequently on the second embassy of wasting time and of not carrying out any of your instructions. I accuse him of cheating the city and ruining everything by the suggestion of hopes that Philip would do all that we desired, and then I accuse him of speaking afterwards in defense of one of whom all warned him to beware on account of the great crimes of which he had been guilty. These are my charges, and these are what you must bear in mind. For a peace that was honest and fair, and men that had sold nothing and had told no falsehoods afterwards, I would even have commended, and would have bidden you crown them. But the injuries which some general may have done you have nothing to do with the present examination. Where is the general who has caused the loss of Hallas, or of the Phocians, or of Doriscus, or of Sersobleptes, or of the Sacred Mountain, or of Thermopylae? Who has secured Philip a road to Attica that leads entirely through the country of allies and friends? Who has given Coronia and Orchomenus and Euboea to others? Who has all but given Megara to the enemy, only recently? Who has made the Thebans powerful? Not one of all these heavy losses was the work of the generals. Nor does Philip hold any of these places because you were persuaded to concede it to him, by the treaty of peace. Their losses are due to these men and to their corruption. If then he evades these points and tries to mislead you by speaking of every other possible subject, this is how you must receive his attempt. We are not sitting in judgment upon any general, you must say, nor are you on your trial for the things of which you speak. Do not tell us whether someone else may not also be responsible for the ruin of the Phocians. Prove to us that no responsibility attaches to yourself. Why do you tell us now of the alleged iniquities of Demosthenes instead of accusing him when his report was under examination? For such an omission alone you deserve to perish. 
Do not speak of the beauty of peace, nor of its advantages. No one holds you responsible for the city's having made peace, but show that it was not a shameful and discreditable peace, that we have not since been deceived in many ways, that all was not lost. It is for all these things that the responsibility has been proved to be yours. And why, even to this hour, do you praise the man who has done us all this evil? If you keep a watch upon him thus, he will have nothing to say, and then he will lift up his voice here, in spite of all his vocal exercises, to no purpose. And yet, perhaps it is necessary for me to speak about his voice also, for of these two, I am told, he is extremely proud, and expects to carry you away by his declamation. But seeing that you used to drive him away, and hiss him out of the theatre, and almost stone him when he was performing the tragic story of Theistus, or of the Trojan War, so that at last he gave up his third-rate playing, you would be acting in the most extraordinary way, if now that he has wrought countless ills, not on the stage, but in the most important affairs in the public life of the state, you listen to him for his final voice. By no means must you do this, or give way to any foolish sentiment. Rather reflect that if you were testing the qualifications of a herald, you would then indeed look for a fine voice. But when you are testing those of an ambassador, or a man who claims the administration of any public business, you must look for an upright man, a man who bears himself proudly indeed, as your representative, but seeks no more than equality with yourselves, as I myself refused to pay respect to Philip, but did pay respect to the captives whom I saved, and never for a moment drew back. Whereas Eskines rolled at Philip's feet and chanted his paeans while he looks down upon you, and further, whenever you notice that cleverness or a good voice or any other natural advantage has been given to an honest and public-spirited man, you ought all to congratulate him and help him to cultivate his gift, for the gift is an advantage in which you all share as well as he. But when the gift is found in a corrupt and villainous man, who can never resist the chance of gain, then you should exclude him from your presence, and give a harsh and hostile reception to his words. For villainy, which wins from you the reputation of ability, is the enemy of the state. You see what great troubles have fallen upon the city, through those qualities which have brought renown to Eskines. But whereas all other faculties are more or less independent, the gift of eloquence, when it meets with hostility from you who listen, is a broken thing. Listen then to the defendant as you would listen to a corrupt villain, who will not speak a single word of truth. Observe also that the conviction of the defendant is in every way expedient, not only on all other grounds, but even when you consider our relations with Philip himself. For if ever Philip finds himself compelled to give the city any of her rights, he will change his methods. As it is, he has chosen to deceive the people as a whole and to show his favours to a few persons, whereas, if he learns that these men have perished, he will prefer for the future to act in the interest of yourselves collectively, in whose hands all power rests. If, however, he intends to persist in his present domineering and outrageous insolence, you will, by getting rid of these men, have rid the city of those who would do anything in the world for him for when they have acted as they have done, with the expectation of having to pay the penalty in their minds, what do you think they will do if you relax your severity towards them? Where is the Ephicrates, or the Lasthenes, or the traitor of any description whom they will not outdo? And who among all the rest will not be a worse citizen when he sees that, for those who have sold themselves, the friendship of Philip serves, in consequence, for revenue, for reputation, and for capital, while to those who have conducted themselves uprightly and have spent their own money as well, the consequences are trouble, hatred, and ill will from a certain party. Let it not be so. It is not for your good whether you regard your reputation or your duty towards heaven, or your safety, or any other object, that you should acquit the defendant, but rather that you should avenge yourselves upon him, 
and make him an example in the eyes of all your fellow citizens and of the whole Hellenic world. End of On the Embassy End of section 19Section 20 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Chersonese, Part 1. Introduction. Late in the year 343, some time after the acquittal of Eschines, Philip invaded Epirus, made Alexander, brother of his wife Olympias, king of the Molossi, instead of Aribus, and so secured his own influence in that region. Aribus was honorably received at Athens. Philip next threatened Ambracia and Lucas, which were colonies of Corinth, and promised to restore Nopactus, which was in the hands of the Achaeans, to the Aetolians. But Athens sent Demosthenes, Hegesippus, Polyuctus, and others to rouse the Corinthians to resistance, and also dispatched a force of citizens to Acarnania to help in the defense against Philip. Philip thereupon returned, captured Echinus and Nicaea on the Malian Gulf, and established a tetrarch in each division of Thessaly. 343 BC, or early in 342. In 342, Philistides was established, by Philip's influence, as tyrant at Oreos in Euboea, as Clitarchus had been at Eretria in the preceding year and the democratic leader Euphrius committed suicide in prison. The town of Chalcis, however, under Callias and Torosthenes, remained friendly to Athens and made a treaty of alliance with her. About the same time, a controversy begun in the previous year in regard to Halonesus was renewed. This island had belonged to Athens, but had been occupied by pirates. At some time not recorded, but probably since the peace of 346, Philip had expelled the pirates and taken possession of the island. He now sent a letter offering to give Halonesus to Athens, but not to give it back since this would concede their right to it, or else to submit the dispute to arbitration. He also offered to discuss a treaty for the settlement of private disputes between Athenians and Macedonians, and to concert measures with Athens for clearing the Aegean of pirates. He was willing to extend the advantages of the peace to other Greek states, but not to agree that he and Athens should respectively possess what was their own, instead of what they held, though he was ready to submit to arbitration in regard to Cardia and other disputed places. He again denied having made the promises attributed to him and asked for the punishment of those who slandered him. Hegesippus replied in an extant speech on Halonesus, while Demosthenes insisted that no impartial arbitrator could possibly be found. Philip's terms in regard to Halonesus were refused, but the Athenian claim to the island was not withdrawn. Philip spent the greater part of 342 and 341 in Thrace, mainly in the valley of the Hebrus, where he endured very great hardships through the winter and founded colonies of Macedonian soldiers, the chief of these being Philippopolis and Kabylie. He also entered into relations with the Gete beyond the Hemus and garrisoned Apollonia on the Euxine. These operations were all preparatory to his projected attack upon Byzantium. Byzantium and Athens were at this time on unfriendly terms, owing to the part taken by the latter in the social war. 
But the immediate subject of the present speech was the state of affairs in the Kersonese in 342. The Kersonese, with the exception of Cardia, had been secured for Athens in 357, but had been threatened by Philip in 352 when he made alliance with Cardia and forced the neighboring Thracian prince Sersobleptes to submit. Soon after the peace of Philocrates, Athens sent settlers to the Chersonese under Diopithes. Cardia alone refused to receive them, and Diopithes, with a mercenary force, prepared to compel the Cardians to admit them. While Philip sent troops to hold the town and complained to Athens in threatening terms of the actions of Diopithes, and more particularly of an inroad which Diopithes had made upon Philip's territory in Thrace. Diopithes had been ill supported with money and men by Athens, and had had recourse to piratical actions in order to obtain supplies, thus arousing some indignation at Athens. But the prospect of the heavy expenditure which would be necessary if an expedition were sent to his aid was also unattractive. Demosthenes, however, proposed that Diopithes should be vigorously supported on the ground that Philip was really at war with Athens and that this was not the time to interfere with a general who alone was pushing the Athenian cause. The speech was delivered early in the spring of 341. It is a masterpiece of oratory, at once statesmanlike and impassioned, and shows a complete command of every variety of tone. The latter part of it contains a strong denunciation of the Macedonian party in Athens, a defense of the orator's own career, and an urgent demand for the punishment of disloyalty. At the same time, Demosthenes does not embody the policy which he advises in any formal motion. For this, we have to wait for the third Philippic. End of introduction. It was the duty, men of Athens, of every speaker, not to allow either malice or favor to influence any speech which he might make, but simply to declare the policy which he considers to be the best particularly when your deliberations were concerned with public affairs of great importance. But since there are some who are led on to address you, partly out of contentiousness, partly from causes which I need not discuss, it is for you, men of Athens, you, the people, to dismiss all other considerations, and both in the votes that you give and in the measures that you take, to attend solely to what you believe to be for the good of the city. Now our present anxiety arises out of affairs in the Chersonese and the campaign, now in its eleventh month, which Philip is conducting in Thrace. But most of the speeches which we have heard have been about the acts and intentions of Diopithes, for my part, I conceive that all charges made against anyone who is amenable to the laws and can be punished by you when you will, are matters which you are free to investigate, either immediately or after an interval as you think fit. And there is no occasion for me or anyone else to use strong language about them. But all those advantages which an actual enemy of the city with a large force in the Hellespont is trying to snatch from you, and which, if we once fall behind hand, we shall no longer be able to recover, these surely are matters upon which our interest demands that our plans be formed and our preparations made with the utmost dispatch and that no clamour, no accusations about other matters be allowed to drive us from this point. Often as I am surprised at the assertions which are habitually made in your presence, nothing, men of Athens, has surprised me more than the remark which I heard only lately in the council, that one who advises you ought forsooth to advise you plainly either to go to war or to keep the peace. Very good. If Philip is remaining inactive, if he is keeping nothing that is ours in violation of the peace, if he is not organizing all mankind against us, there is nothing more to be said. We have simply to observe the peace, and I see that, for your part, you are quite ready to do so. 
But what if the oath that we swore and the terms upon which we made the peace stand inscribed for our eyes to see? What if it is proved that from the outset, before Diopithes sailed from Athens with the settlers who are now accused of having brought about the war, Philip wrongfully seized many of our possessions, and here unrepealed are your resolutions charging him with this, and that all along he has been uninterruptedly seizing the possessions of the other Hellenic and foreign peoples and uniting their resources against us. What is then the meaning of the statement that we ought either to go to war or to keep the peace? For we have no choice in the matter. Nothing remains open to us but the most righteous and most necessary of all acts. The act that they deliberately refuse to consider. I mean the act of retaliation against the aggressor. Unless, indeed, they intend to argue that, so long as Philip keeps away from Attica and the Piraeus, he does the city no wrong and is not committing acts of war. But if this is their criterion of right and wrong, if this is their definition of peace, then, although what they say is iniquitous, intolerable, and inconsistent with your security, as all must see, at the same time, these very statements are actually contradictory of the charges which they are making against Diopithes. Why, I beg to ask, are we to give Philip full leave to act in whatever way he chooses, so long as he does not touch Attica, when Diopithes is not to be allowed even to assist the Thracians without being accused of initiating war? But even if this inconsistency is brought home to them, still, we are told, the conduct of the mercenaries in ravaging the Hellespontine country is outrageous, and Diopithes has no right to drive the vessels to shore and ought to be stopped. I grant it, let it be done. I have nothing to say against it. Yet, nevertheless, if their advice is genuinely based on considerations of right and right alone, I consider that they are bound to prove that, as surely as they are seeking to break up the force on which Athens at present relies by slandering its commander to you when he tries to provide funds to support it, so surely Philip's force will be disbanded if you accept their advice. If they fail to prove this, you must consider that they are simply setting the city once more upon the same course which has already resulted in the utter ruin of her fortunes. For surely you know that nothing in the world has contributed so much to Philip's successes as his being always first on the scene of action with a standing force always about him and knowing beforehand what he intends to do he suddenly falls upon whomsoever he pleases while we wait until we learn that something is happening and only then in a turmoil make our preparations it follows of course that every position which he has attacked he holds in undisturbed possession while we are all behind hand all our expenditure proves to have been so much useless waste. We have displayed our hostility and our desire to check him, but we are too late for action, and so we add disgrace to failure. You must, therefore, not fail to recognize, men of Athens, that now, as before, all else that you hear consists of mere words and pretexts and that the real aim of all that is being done is to secure that you may remain at home, that Athens may have no force outside the city, and that thus Philip may give effect to all his desires without let or hindrance. Consider in the first place what is actually occurring at the present moment. He is at present passing the time in Thrace with a great army under him, and as we are told by those who are on the spot, he is sending for a large addition to it from Macedonia and Thessaly. Now, if he waits for the Atitian winds, and then goes to Byzantium and besieges it, tell me first whether you think that the Byzantines will persist in their present infatuation, and will not call upon you and entreat you to go to their aid. 
I do not think so. Why, I believe that they would open their gates to men whom they distrust even more than they distrust you, if such exist, rather than surrender the city to Philip, supposing, that is, that he does not capture them first. And then, if we are unable to set sail from Athens, and if there are no forces there on the spot to help them, nothing can prevent their destruction. Of course, you say, for the men are possessed, and their infatuation passes all bounds. Very true, and yet they must be preserved, for the interests of Athens require it. And besides, we cannot by any means be certain that he will not invade the Chersonese. Indeed, if we are to judge by the letter which he has sent to you, he there says that he will punish the settlers in the Chersonese. If then the army that is now formed there is in existence, it will be able to help the Chersonese and to injure some part of Philip's country. But when once it is dissolved, what shall we do if he marches against the Chersonese? We shall, of course, put Diopithes on his trial. And how will that improve our position? Well, we should go to the rescue from Athens ourselves. What if the winds make it impossible? But, of course, he will not really get there. And who can guarantee that? Do you realize, men of Athens, or take into account what the coming season of the year is, the season against which some think you ought to evacuate the Hellespont and hand it over to Philip? What if when he leaves Thrace, he does not go near the Chersonese or Byzantium at all? For this, too, is a possibility which you must consider, but comes to Chalcis or Megara, just as he lately came to Orius. Is it better to resist him here and to allow the war to come into Attica, or provide something to keep him busy there? The latter course is surely the better. Realizing these things, therefore, as you all must, and taking due account of them, you must not, heaven knows, look askance at the force which Diopithes is trying to provide for Athens, or attempt to disband it. You must yourselves prepare another force to support it. You must help him freely with money, and give him, in all other respects, your loyal cooperation. If Philip were asked to say whether he would wish these soldiers, who are now with Diopithes, describe them as you will, for I in no way dispute your description, to be prosperous and in high favour with the Athenians, and to be augmented in numbers by the cooperation of the city, or whether he would rather see them broken up and destroyed in consequence of calumnious charges against them. He would prefer, I imagine, the latter alternative. Can it then be that there are men among us here who are trying to bring about the very thing that Philip would pray heaven for? And if so, do you need to seek any further for the cause of the total ruin of the city's fortunes? I wish, therefore, to examine without reserve the present crisis of our affairs, to inquire what we ourselves are now doing, and how we are dealing with it. We do not wish to contribute funds, nor to serve with the forces in person. We cannot keep our hands from the public revenues. We do not give the contributions of the Allies to Diopithes, nor do we approve of such supplies as he raises for himself. But we look malignantly at him, we ask whence he gets them, what he intends to do, and every possible question of that kind, and yet we are still not willing to confine ourselves to our own affairs in consequence of the attitude which we have adopted. We still praise with our lips those who uphold the dignity of the city, though in our acts we are fighting on the side of their opponents. Now, whenever anyone rises to speak, you always put to him the question, What are we to do? I wish to put to you the question, What are we to say? For if you will neither contribute, nor serve in person, nor leave the public funds alone, nor grant him the contributions, 
nor let him get what he can for himself, nor yet confine yourselves to your own affairs, I do not know what I can say. For when you give such license to those who desire to make charges and accusations, that you listen to them even when they denounce him by anticipation for his alleged intentions, well, what can one say? The possible effect of this is a matter which some of you require to understand, and I will speak without reserve, for indeed I could not speak otherwise. All the commanders who have ever yet sailed from Athens, if I am wrong, I consent to any penalty that you please, take money from the Chians, from the Erythraeans, from any people from whom they can severally get it. I mean any of the Asiatic settlers who are now in question. Those who have one or two ships, take less. Those who have a larger force, take more. And those who give to them do not give either little or much for nothing. They are not so insane. In fact, with these sums, they buy immunity from injury for the merchants who sail from their ports, freedom from piracy, the convoying of their vessels, and so on. They call the gifts benevolences, and that is the name given to the sums thus obtained. And in the present case, when Diopithes is there with his army, it is obvious that all these people will give him money. From what other source do you imagine that the general can maintain his troops when he has received nothing from you and has no resources from which he can pay his men? Will money drop from the sky? Of course not. He subsists upon what he can collect or beg or borrow. The real effect, therefore, of the accusations made against him here is simply to warn everyone that they should refuse to give him anything since he is to pay the penalty for his very intentions, not to speak of any action that he may have taken or any success that he may have achieved. That is the only meaning of the cry that he is preparing a blockade or he is surrendering the Hellenes. Do any of his critics care about the Hellenes who live in Asia? Were it so, they would be more thoughtful for the rest of mankind than for their own country, and the proposal to send another general to the Hellespont amounts to no more than this. For if Diopithes is acting outrageously and is driving the vessels to shore, then, gentlemen, one little wax tablet is enough to put an end to it all. And what the laws command is that for these offences we should impeach the wrongdoers, not that we should keep a watch upon our own forces at such expense and with so many ships. Such insanity really passes all bounds. No, against the enemy whom we cannot arrest and render amenable to the laws, it is both right and necessary to maintain a force, to send warships and to contribute war funds. But against one of ourselves, a decree, an impeachment, a dispatch boat will answer our purpose. These are the means which sensible men would use. The policy of the other side is the policy of men whose spitefulness is ruining your fortunes. And that there should be some such man, but though it is, is not the worst. No, for you who sit there are already in such a frame of mind that if anyone comes forward and says that Diopithes is the cause of all the mischief, or Caris, or Aristophon, or any Athenian citizen that he happens to name, you at once agree and clamorously declare that he is right. But if anyone comes forward and tells you the truth and says, Men of Athens, this is nonsense. It is Philip that is the cause of all this mischief and trouble. For if he were quiet, the city would have nothing to disturb her. You cannot indeed deny the truth of his words, but you seem, I think, to be annoyed as though you were losing something. And the cause of these things is this, and I beseech you in heaven's name to let me speak unreservedly when I am speaking for your true good, 
that some of your politicians have contrived that you should be terrifying and severe in your assemblies, but easy-going and contemptible in your preparations for war. And accordingly, if anyone names as the culprit someone whom you know you can arrest in your own midst, you agree and you wish to act. But if one is named whom you must first master by force of arms, if you are to punish him at all, you are at a loss, I fancy, what to do, and you are vexed when this is brought home to you. For your politicians, men of Athens, should have treated you in exactly the opposite way to this. They should train you to be kind and sympathetic in your assemblies, for there it is with the members of your own body and your own allies that your case is argued. But your terrors and your severity should be displayed in your preparations for war, where the struggle is with your enemies and your rivals. As it is, by their popular speeches and by courting your favour to excess, they have brought you into such a condition that, while in your assemblies you give yourselves airs and enjoy their flattery, listening to nothing but what is meant to please you, in the world of facts and events you are in the last extremity of peril. Imagine in God's name what would happen if the Hellenes were to call you to account for the opportunities which, in your indolence, you have now let pass, and were to put you the question, Is it true, men of Athens, that you send envoys to us on every possible occasion to tell us of Philip's designs against ourselves and all the Hellenes, and of the duty of keeping guard against the man, and to warn us in every way? We should have to confess that it was true. We do act thus. Then they would proceed. Is it true, you most contemptible of all men, that though the man has been away for ten months and has been cut off from every possibility of returning home by illness and by winter and by wars, you have neither liberated Eubia nor recovered any of your own possessions? Is it true that you have remained at home unoccupied and healthy? If such a word can be used of men who behave thus, and have seen him set up two tyrants in Euboea, one to serve as a fortress directly menacing Attica, the other to watch Syathus, and that you have not even rid yourselves of these dangers, granted that you did not want to do anything more, but have let them be. Obviously you have retired in his favour, and have made it evident that if he dies ten times over, you will not make any move the more. Why trouble us, then, with your embassies and your accusations? If they speak thus to us, what will be our answer? What shall we say, Athenians? I do not see what we can say. End of section 20「Section 21 of the This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Chersonese, Part 2. Now, there are some who imagine that they confute a speaker as soon as they have asked him the question, What then are we to do? I will first give them this answer, the most just and true of all. Do not do what you are doing now. But at the same time, I will give them a minute and detailed reply, and then let them show that their willingness to act upon it is not less than their eagerness to interrogate. First, men of Athens, you must thoroughly make up your minds to the fact that Philip is at war with Athens and has broken the peace. You must cease to lay the blame at one another's doors, and that he is evilly disposed and hostile to the whole city, down to the very ground on which it is built. Nay, I will go further. 
hostile to every single man in the city, even to those who are most sure that they are winning his favor. If you think otherwise, consider the case of Euthycrates and Lasthenes of Olynthus, who fancied that they were of the most friendly terms with him, but after they had betrayed their city, suffered the most utter ruin of all. But his hostilities and intrigues are aimed at nothing so much as at our constitution, whose overthrow is the very first object in the world to him. And, in a sense, it is natural that he should aim at this, for he knows very well that even if he becomes master of all the rest of the world, he can retain nothing securely so long as you are a democracy, and that if he chances to stumble anywhere, as may often happen to a man, all the elements which are now forced into union with him will come and take refuge with you. For though you are not yourselves naturally adapted for aggrandizement or the usurpation of empire, you have the art of preventing any other from seizing power and of taking it from him when he has it. And in every respect you are ready to give trouble to those who are ambitious of dominion and to lead all men forth into liberty and so he would not have freedom from her home in Athens, watching for every opportunity he may offer, far from it, and there is nothing unsound or careless in his reasoning. The first essential point, therefore, is this, that you conceive him to be the irreconcilable foe of your constitution and of democracy, for unless you are inwardly convinced of this, you will not be willing to take an active interest in the situation. Secondly, you must realize clearly that all the plans which he is now so busily contriving are in the nature of preparations against this country, and wherever anyone resists him, he there resists him on our behalf. For surely no one is so simple as to imagine that when Philip is covetous of the wretched hamlets of Thrace, one can give no other name to Drangulum, Kabylie, Mastera, and the places which he is now seizing, and when to get these places he is enduring heavy labors, hard winters, and the extremity of danger, no one can imagine, I say, that the harbors and the dockyards and the ships of the Athenians, the produce of your silver mines and your huge revenue, have no attraction for him, or that he will leave you in possession of these while he winters in the very pit of destruction for the sake of the millet and the spelt in the silos of Thrace. No, indeed, it is to get these into his power that he pursues both his operations in Thrace and all his other designs. What then, as sensible men, must you do? Knowing and realizing your position, as you do, you must lay aside this excessive, this irremediable indolence. You must contribute funds and require them from your allies. You must so provide and act that this force which is now assembled may be held together, in order that, as Philip has the force in readiness that is to injure and enslave all the Hellenes, you may have in readiness that which shall preserve and succor them. You cannot effect by isolated expeditions any of the things which must be effected. You must organize a force and provide maintenance for it, and pay masters and a staff of servants, and when you have taken such steps as will ensure the strictest possible watch being kept over the funds, you must hold these officials accountable for the money and the general for the actual operations. If you act thus and honestly make up your minds to take this course, you will either compel Philip to observe a righteous peace and remain in his own land, and no greater blessing could you obtain than that, or you will fight him on equal terms. It may be thought that this policy demands heavy expenditure and great exertions and trouble. That is true indeed. 
but let the objector take into account what the consequences to the city must be if he is unwilling to assent to this policy, and he will find that the ready performance of duty brings its reward. If indeed some God is offering us his guarantee, for no human guarantee would be sufficient in so great a matter, that if you remain at peace and let everything slide, Philip will not in the end come and attack yourselves, then, although before God and every heavenly power it would be unworthy of you and of the position that the city holds and of the deeds of our forefathers to abandon all the rest of the Hellenes to slavery for the sake of our own ease, although for my part I would rather have died than have suggested such a thing, yet if another proposes it and convinces you, let it be so. Do not defend yourselves, let everything go. But if no one entertains such a belief, if we all know that the very opposite is true, and that the wider the mastery we allow him to gain, the more difficult and powerful a foe we shall have to deal with, what further subterfuge is open to us? Why do we delay? When shall we ever be willing, men of Athens, to do our duty? When we are compelled, you say, but the hour of compulsion, as the word is applied to free men, is not only here already, but has long passed, and we must surely pray that the compulsion which is put upon slaves may not come upon us. And what is the difference? It is this, that for a free man the greatest compelling force is his shame at the course which events are taking. I do not know what greater we can imagine, but the slave is compelled by blows and bodily tortures, which I pray may never fall to our lot. It is not fit to speak of them. I would gladly tell you the whole story and show how certain persons are working for your ruin by their policy. I pass over, however, every point but this. Whenever any question of our relations with Philip arises, at once someone stands up and talks of the blessings of peace, of the difficulty of maintaining a large force, and of designs on the part of certain persons to plunder our funds, with other tales of the same kind, which enables them to delay your action and give Philip time to do what he wishes unopposed. What is the result? For you, the result is your leisure, and a respite from immediate action, advantages which I fear you will some day feel to have cost you dear, and for them it is the favour they win, and the wages for these services. But I am sure that there is no need to persuade you to keep the peace. You sit here fully persuaded. It is the man who is committing acts of war that we need to persuade. For if he is persuaded, you are ready enough. Nor is it the expenditure which is to ensure our preservation that ought to distress us, but the fate which is in prospect for us if we are not willing to take this action, while the threatened plunder of our fans is to be prevented by the proposal of some safeguard which will render them secure, not by the abandonment of our interests. And even so, men of Athens, I feel indignant at the very fact that some of you are so much pained at the prospect of the plunder of our funds, when you have it in your power both to protect them and to punish the culprits, and yet feel no pain when Philip is seizing all Hellas piecemeal for his plunder and seizing it to strengthen himself against you. What then is the reason, men of Athens, that though Philip's campaigns, his aggressions, his seizure of cities are so unconcealed, none of my opponents has ever said that he was bringing about war? Why is it those who advise you not to allow it, not to make these sacrifices, that they accuse and say that they will be the cause of the war? I will inform you. It is because they wish to divert the anger which you are likely to show if you suffer at all from the war onto the heads of those who are giving you the best advice in your own interests. They want you to sit and try such persons instead of resisting Philip 
and they themselves are to be the prosecutors instead of paying the penalty for their present actions. That is the meaning of their assertion that there are some here, forsooth, who want to bring about war. That is the real point of these allegations of responsibility. But this I know beyond all doubt, that without waiting for anyone in Athens to propose the declaration of war, Philip has not only taken many other possessions of ours, but has just now sent an expedition to Cardia. If, in spite of this, we wish to pretend that he is not making war on us, he would be the most senseless man living were he to attempt to convince us of our error. But what shall we say when his attack is made directly upon ourselves? He, of course, will say that he is not at war with us, just as he was not at war with Arius when his soldiers were in the land, nor with the Pharaons before that when he was assaulting their walls, nor with the Olynthians, first of all, until he and his army were actually within their territory. Or shall we still say that those who urge resistance are bringing about war? If so, all that is left to us is slavery. If we may neither offer resistance, nor yet be suffered to remain at peace, no other compromise is possible. And further, the issues at stake are not for you merely what they are for other states. What Philip desires is not your subjection, but your utter annihilation. For he knows full well that you will never consent to be his slaves, and that even if you were willing, you would not know the way, accustomed as you are to govern, and he knows that you will be able to give him more trouble if you get the opportunity than all the rest of the world. The struggle, then, is a struggle for existence, and as such you ought to think of it, and you should show your abhorrence of those who have sold themselves to Philip by beating them to death. For it is impossible, utterly impossible, to master your enemies outside the city before you punish your enemies in the city itself. Whence comes it, think you, that he is insulting us now? For his conduct seems to me to be nothing less than this, and that while he at least deceives all other peoples by doing them favors, he is using threats against you without more ado. For instance, he enticed the Thessalians by large gifts into their present servitude, and words cannot describe how greatly he deceived the Olynthians at first by the gift of Potidea and much beside. At this moment he is alluring the Thebans by delivering up Boeotia to them, and reading them of a long and arduous campaign. Each of these peoples have first reaped some advantage before falling into those calamities which some of them have already suffered, as all the world knows, and some are destined to suffer whenever their time comes. But as for yourselves, to pass over all that you have been robbed of at an earlier period, what deception, what robbery have been practiced upon you in the very act of making the peace? Have not the Phocians and Thermopylae and the Thracian seaboard, Doriscus, Serium, Sersobleptis himself, been taken from you? Does not Philip at this moment occupy the city of the Cardians and avow it openly? Why is it then that he behaves as he does to all others and so differently to you? Because yours is the one city in the world where men are permitted to speak on behalf of the enemy without fear. Because here a man may take bribes and still address you with impunity even when you have been robbed of your own. In Olynthus it was only safe to take Philip's side when the people of Olynthus as a whole had shared Philip's favors and was enjoying the possession of Potidea. In Thessaly it was only safe to take Philip's side when the Thessalian commons had shared Philip's favors, for he had expelled the tyrants for them and restored to them their amphictyonic position. In Thebes it was not safe until he had restored Boeotia to Thebes and annihilated the Phocians. 
But at Athens, though Philip has not only robbed you of Amphipolis and the territory of the Cardians, but has turned Euboea into a fortress overlooking your country and is now on his way to attack Byzantium, at Athens it is safe to speak in Philip's interest. Ay, and you know that of such speakers, some who were poor are rapidly growing rich, and some who were without name or fame are becoming famous and distinguished, while you, on the other hand, are becoming inglorious instead of famous, bankrupt instead of wealthy. For a city's wealth consists, I imagine, in allies, confidence, loyalty, and of all this you are bankrupt. And because you are indifferent to these advantages and let them drift away from you, he has become prosperous and powerful and formidable to all. Hellenes and foreigners alike, while you are deserted and humbled with a splendid profusion of commodities in your market and a contemptible lack of all those things with which you should have been provided. But I observe that certain speakers do not follow the same principles in the advice which they give you as they follow for themselves. You, they tell you, ought to remain quiet even when you are wronged. But they cannot remain quiet in your presence, even when no one is wronging them. But now someone or other comes forward and says, Ah, but you will not move emotion or take any risk. You are a poor-spirited coward. Bold, offensive, shameless, I am not, and I trust I may never be. And yet I think I have more courage than very many of your dashing statesmen. For one man of Athens who overlooks all that the city's interest demands, who prosecutes, confiscates, gives, accuses, does so not from any bravery, but because in the popular character of his speeches and public actions he has a guarantee of his personal safety, and therefore is bold without risk. But one who is acting for the best sets himself in many ways against your wishes, who never speaks to please but always to advise what is best, one who chooses a policy in which more issues must be decided by chance than by calculation and yet makes himself responsible to you for both. That is the courageous man and such is the citizen who is of value to his country, rather than those who, to gain an ephemeral popularity, have ruined the supreme interests of the city. So far am I from envying these men, or thinking them worthy citizens of their country, that if anyone were to ask me to say what good I had really done to the city, although, men of Athens, I could tell how often I had been triarch and corregus, how I had contributed funds, ransomed prisoners, and done other like acts of generosity, I would mention none of these things. I would say only that my policy is not one of measures like theirs, that although, like others, I could make accusations and shower favors and confiscate property and do all that my opponents do, I have never to this day set myself to do any of these things. I have been influenced neither by gain nor by ambition. But I continue to give the advice which sets me below many others in your estimation, but which must make you greater if you will listen to it. For so much, perhaps, I may say without offense. Nor, I think, should I be acting fairly as a citizen if I advised such political measures as would at once make me the first man in Athens and you the last of all peoples. As the measures of a loyal politician develop, the greatness of his country should develop with them. And it is the thing which is best, not the thing which is easiest, that every speaker should advocate." Nature will find the way to the easiest course unaided. To the best, the words and the guidance of the loyal citizen must show the way. I have heard it remarked before now that though what I say is always what is best, still I never contribute anything but words, whereas the city needs work of some practical kind. 
I will tell you without any concealment my own sentiments on this matter. There is no work that can be demanded of any of your public advisers except that he should advise what is best, and I think I can easily show you that this is so. No doubt you know how the great Timotheus delivered a speech to the effect that you ought to go to the rescue and save the Eubians when the Thebans were trying to reduce them to servitude, and how, in the course of his speech, he spoke somewhat in this strain. What, said he, when you actually have the Thebans in the island, do you debate what you are to do with them and how you are to act? Will you not cover the sea with warships, men of Athens? Will you not rise from your seats and go instantly to the Piraeus and launch your vessels? So Timotheus spoke, and you acted as he bade you, and through his speech and your action the work was done. But if he had given you the best possible advice, as in fact he did, and you had lapsed into indolence and paid no attention to it, would the city have achieved any of the results which followed on that occasion? Impossible. And so it is with all that I say today, and with all that this or that speaker may say. For the actions you must look to yourselves. From the speaker you must require that he give you the best counsel that he can. I desire now to sum up my advice and to leave the platform. I say that we must contribute funds and must keep together the force now in existence, correcting anything that may seem amiss in it, but not disbanding the whole force because of the possible criticisms against it. We must send envoys everywhere to instruct, to warn and to act. Above all, we must punish those who take bribes in connection with public affairs and must everywhere display our abhorrence of them, in order that reasonable men, who offer their honest services, may find their policy justified in their own eyes and in those of others. If you treat the situation thus, and cease to ignore it altogether, there is a chance, a chance I say even now, that it may improve. If, however, you sit idle, with an interest that stops short at applause and acclamation, and retires into the background when any action is required, I can imagine no oratory which, without action on your part, will be able to save your country. End of section 21「Section 22 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. The Third Philippic. Part 1. Introduction. The third Philippic seems to have been delivered in the late spring or early summer of 341 BC, about two months after the speech in the Chersonese, which apparently had little positive result, though it probably prevented the recall and prosecution of Diopidus. The immediate occasion of the third Philippic was a request from the forces in the Chersonese for supplies. The general situation is the same as that the date of the last speech, but the danger to Byzantium is more pressing. Demosthenes now takes the broad ground of Panhellenic policy, and formally proposes to send envoys throughout Greece, to unite all the Greek states against Philip, as well as to send immediate reinforcements and supplies to the Chersonese. Many critics, ancient and modern, have regarded this as the greatest of all Demosthenes' political orations. The lessons of history, from the speaker's point of view, are repeated and enforced by the citation of instance after instance. The tone of the speech, while less varied than that of the last, is grave and intense. The passage in which the orator contrasts the spirit of Athenian political life in the past with that of his own day is one of the most impressive in all his works, and the nobility of his appeal to the traditional ideals of Athenian policy has been universally recognized even by his most severe critics. This speech is found in the manuscripts in two forms, of which the shorter omits a number of passages which the longer includes, though there are signs of an imperfect blending of the two versions in certain places. It seems probable that both versions are due to Demosthenes, and the speech may have been more than once revised by him before publication or republication. In which form it was delivered, there is not sufficient evidence to show. 
Many speeches are made, men of Athens, at almost every meeting of the assembly, with reference to the aggressions which Philip has been committing ever since he concluded the peace, not only against yourselves, but against all other peoples. And I am sure that all would agree, however little they may act on their belief, that our aim, both in speech and in action, should be to cause him to cease from his insolence and to pay penalty for it. And yet I see that, in fact, the treacherous sacrifice of our interests has gone on, until what seems an ill omen saying may, I fear, be really true, that if all who came forward desired to propose, and you desired to carry, the measures which would make your position as pitiful as it could possibly be, it could not, so I believe, be made worse than it is now. It may be that there are many reasons for this, and that our affairs did not reach their present condition from any one or two causes. But if you examine the matter aright, you will find that the chief responsibility rests with those whose aim is to win your favor, not to propose what is best. Some of them, men of Athens, so long as they can maintain the conditions which bring them reputation and influence, take no thought for the future, and therefore think that you should also take none, while others, by accusing and slandering those who are actively at work, are simply trying to make the city spend its energies in punishing the members of its own body, and so leave Philip free to say and do what he likes. Such political methods as these, familiar to you as they are, are the real causes of evil, and I beg you, men of Athens, if I tell you certain truths outspokenly, to let no resentment on your part fall upon me on this account. Consider the matter in this light. In every other sphere of life, you believe that the right of free speech ought to be so universally shared by all who are in the city that you've extended it both to foreigners and to slaves, and one may see many a servant in Athens speaking his mind with greater liberty than is granted to citizens in some other states. But from the sphere of political counsel, you have utterly banished this liberty. The result is that in your meetings you give yourselves airs and enjoy their flattery, listening to nothing but what is meant to please you, while in the world of facts and events, you are in the last extremity of peril. If then you are still in this mood today, I do not know what I can say. But if you are willing to listen while I tell you, without flattery, what your interest requires, I am prepared to speak. For though our position is very bad indeed, and much has been sacrificed, it is still possible, even now, if you will do your duty, to set all right once more. It is a strange thing, perhaps, that I am about to say, but it is true. The worst feature in the past is that in which lies our best hope for the future. And what is this? It is that you are in your present plight because you do not do any part of your duty, small or great. For, of course, if you were doing all that you should do, and were still in this evil case, you could not even hope for any improvement. As it is, Philip has conquered your indolence and your indifference, but he has not conquered Athens. You have not been vanquished. You have never even stirred. Now if it was admitted by us all that Philip was at war with Athens, and was transgressing the peace, a speaker would have nothing to do but to advise you as to the safest and easiest method of resistance to him. But since there are some of you who are in so extraordinary a frame of mind that, though he is capturing cities, though many of your possessions are in his hands, and though he is committing aggressions against all men, they still tolerate certain speakers, who constantly assert at your meetings that it is some of us who are provoking the war, it is necessary to be on our guard and to come to a right understanding of the matter. For there is a danger lest any one who proposes or advises resistance should find himself accused of having brought about the war. Well, I say this first of all and lay it down as a principle, that if it is open to us to deliberate whether we should remain at peace or should go to war. Now, if it is possible for the city to remain at peace, if the decision rests with us that I may make this my starting point, then I say we ought to do so, and I call upon anyone who says that it is so to move his motion, and to act and to not defraud us. But if another with weapons in his hands and a large force about him holds out to you the name of peace, while his own acts are acts of war, what course remains open to us but that of resistance? Though if you wish to profess peace in the same manner as he, I have no quarrel with you. But if any man's conception of peace is that it is a state in which Philip can master all that intervenes till at last he comes to attack ourselves, such conception in the first place is madness, and in the second place, this peace that he speaks of is a peace which you are to observe towards Philip while he does not observe it towards you. And this it is, this power to carry on war against you, without being met by any hostilities on your part, that Philip is purchasing with all the money that he is spending. Indeed, if we tend to wait till the time comes when he admits that he is at war with us, we are surely the most innocent persons in the world. Why, even if he comes to Attica itself, to the very Piraeus, he will never make such an admission, if we are to judge by his dealings with others. For, to take one instance, he told the Olynthians, when he was five miles from the city, that there were only two alternatives. Either they must cease to live in Olynthus, or he to live in Macedonia. But during the whole time before that, whenever anyone accused him of such sentiments, he was indignant, and sent envoys to answer the charge. Again, he marched into the Faustine's country, as though visiting his allies. 
It was by Phocian allies that he was escorted on the march, and most people in Athens contended strongly that his crossing the pass would bring no good to Thebes. Worse still, he has lately seized Phere and still holds it, though he went to Thessaly as a friend and an ally. And, latest of all, he told those unhappy citizens of Aureus that he had sent his soldiers to visit them and to make kind inquiries. He had heard that they were sick and suffering from faction, and it was right for an ally and a true friend to be present at such a time. Now if, instead of giving them warning and using open force, he deliberately chose to deceive these men, who could have done him no harm, though they might have taken precautions against suffering any themselves, do you imagine that he will make a formal declaration of war upon you before he commences hostilities, and that, so long as you are content to be deceived? Impossible. For so long as you, though you are the injured party, make no complaint against him, but accuse him of your own body, he would be the most fatuous man on earth if he were to interrupt your strife and contentions with one another, to bid you turn upon himself, and so to cut away the ground from the arguments by which his hirelings have put you off, when they tell you that he is not at war with Athens. In God's name, is there a man in his senses who would judge by words, and not by facts, whether another was at peace or at war with him? Of course there is not. Why, from the very first, when the peace had only just been made, before those who are now in the Chersonese had been sent out, Philip was taking Sarium and Dorsicus, and expelling the soldiers who were in the castle at Sarium and the sacred mountain, where they had been placed by your general. But what was he doing in acting thus? For he had sworn to a peace, and let no one ask, what do these things amount to? Why do they matter to Athens? For whether these acts were trifles which could have no interest for you is another matter, but the principles of religion and justice, whether a man transgressed them in small things or great, have always the same force. What? When he is sending mercenaries into the Chersonese, which the king and all the Hellenes have acknowledged to be yours, when he openly avows that he is going to the rescue and states in his letter, what is it that he is doing? He tells you, indeed, that he is not making war upon you. But so far am I from admitting that one who acts in this manner is observing the peace which he made with you, that I hold in that grasping at Magara, and setting up tyrants in Euboa, and advancing against Thrace at the present moment, and pursuing his machinations in the Peloponnese, and in carrying out his policy with the help of his army, he is violating the peace and is making war against you. Unless you mean to say that even to bring up Entons to besiege you is no breach of the peace, until they are actually planted against your walls. But you will not say this, for the man who is taking the steps and contriving the means which will lead to my capture is at war with me, even though he has not yet thrown a missile or shot an arrow. Now what are the things which would imperil your safety, if anything should happen? The alienation of the Hellespawn, the placing of Magra and Yubo in the power of the enemy, and the attraction of the Peloponnesian sympathy to his cause. Can I then say that one who is erecting such engines of war as these against the city is at peace with you? Far from it. For from the very day when he annihilated the Phocians, from that very day, I say, I date the beginning of his hostilities against you. And for your part, I think that you will be wise if you resist him at once, but that if you let him be, you will find that, when you wish to resist, resistance itself is impossible. Indeed, so widely do I differ, men of Athens, from all your other advisers, that I do not think there is any room for discussion today in regard to the Chersonese or Byzantium. We must go to their defense, and take every care that they do not suffer, and we must send all that they need to the soldiers who are at present there. But we have to take counsel for the good of all the Hellenes, in the view of the great peril in which they stand. And I wish to tell you on what grounds I am so alarmed at the situation, in order that if my reasoning is correct, you may share my conclusions, and exercise some forethought for yourselves at least, if you are actually unwilling to do so for the Hellenes as a whole. But that if you think I am talking nonsense, and am out of my senses, you may both now and hereafter decline to attend to me as though I were a sane man. The rise of Philip the Greatness from such small and humble beginnings, the mistrustful and quarrelsome attitude of the Hellenes towards one another, the fact that his growth out of what he was into what he is was a far more extraordinary thing than would be his subjugation of all the remains when he's already secured so much. All this and similar themes, upon which I might speak at length, I will pass over. But I see that all men, beginning with yourselves, have conceded to him the very thing which has been at issue in every Hellenic war during the whole of the past. And what is this? It is the right to act as he pleases, to mutilate and to strip the Hellenic peoples one by one, to attack and to enslave their cities. For seventy-three years you were the leading people of Hellas, and the Spartans for thirty years save one. And in these last times, after the Battle of Leuctra, the Thebans too acquired some power. Yet neither to you nor to the Thebes nor to Sparta was such a right ever conceded by the Hellenes, as the right to do whatever you pleased, far from it. First of all, it was your own behavior, or rather that of the Athenians of that day, which some thought immoderate, and all, even those who had no grievance against Athens, felt bound to join the injured parties, and to make war upon you. 
Then, in their turn, the Spartans, when they had acquired an empire and succeeded to supremacy like your own, attempted to go beyond all bounds and to disturb the established order to an unjustified extent. And once more, all, even those who had no grievance against them, had recourse to war. Why mention the others? For we ourselves and the Spartans, though we could originally allege no injury done by the one people to the other, nevertheless felt bound to go to war on the account of the wrongs which we saw the rest suffering. And yet all the offenses of the Spartans in those thirty years of power, and of your ancestors in their seventy years, were less men of Athens than the wrongs inflicted upon the Greeks by Philip, in the thirteen years not yet completed, during which he has been to the fore. Less do I say. They are not a fraction of them. A few words will easily prove this. I say nothing of Olynthus and Methon, and Apollonia, and thirty-two cities in the Thracian region, all annihilated by him with such savagery that a visitor to the spot would find it difficult to tell that they had ever been inhabited. I remain silent in regard to the extirpation of the great Phocian race. But what is the condition of Thessaly? Has he not robbed their very cities of their governments and set up tetrarchies, that they may be enslaved, not merely by whole cities, but by whole tribes at a time? Are not the cities of Euboea even now ruled by tyrants, and that in an island that is neighbor to Thebes in Athens? Does he not write expressly in his letters, I am at peace with those who choose to obey me? And what he thus writes he does not fail to act upon, for he has gone to invade the Hellespont. He previously went to attack Ambrasia. The great city of Elise in the Peloponnese is his. He is recently intrigued against Megara, and neither Hellas nor the world beyond it is large enough to contain the man's ambition. But though all of us, the Hellenes, see and hear these things, we send no representatives to one another to discuss the matter. We show no indignation. We are in so evil a mood, so deep have the lines been dug which sever city from city, that up to this very day we are unable to act as either our interest or our duty require. We cannot unite. We can form no combination for mutual support or friendship, but we look on while the man grows greater, because everyone has made up his mind, as it seems to me, to profit by the time during which his neighbor is being ruined, and no one cares or acts for the safety of the Hellenes. For we all know that Philip is like the recurrence of the attack of a fever or other illness, in his descent upon those who fancy themselves for the present well out of his reach. And further, you must surely realize that all the wrongs the Hellenes suffer from the Spartans and ourselves they at least suffered at the hands of true-born sons of Hellas, and, one might conceive, it was as though a lawful son, born to a great estate, managed his affairs in some wrong or improper way. His conduct would in itself deserve blame and denunciation, but at least it could not be said he was not one of the family, or was not heir to the property. But had it been a slave or a suppositious son that was thus ruining and spoiling an inheritance to which he had no title, why, good heavens, how infinitely more scandalous and reprehensible all would have declared it to be, and yet they show no such feeling in regard to Philip, although not only is he no Hellene, not only has he no kinship with the Hellenes, but he is not even a barbarian from a country that one could acknowledge with credit. He is a pestilent Macedonian, from whose country it used to not be possible to even buy a slave of any value. And in spite of this, is there any degree of insolence to which he does not proceed? Not content with annihilating cities, does he not manage the Pythian games, the common meeting of the Hellenes, and send his slaves to preside over the competition in his absence? Is he not master of Thermopylae, and of the passes which lead into the Hellenic territory? Does he not hold that district with garrisons and mercenaries? Has he not taken the precedence in consulting the oracle, and thrust aside ourselves and the Thessalians and the Dorians and the rest of the Amphictyons, though the right is not one which is given even to all of the Hellenes? Does he not write to the Thessalians to prescribe the constitution under which they are to live? Does he not send one body of mercenaries to Porthmus to expel the popular party of Eritrea, and another to Aureus to set up Felicities as tyrant? And yet the Hellenes see these things and endure them, gazing, as it seems to me, as they would gaze at a hailstorm each people praying that it may not come their way, but no one trying to prevent it. Nor is it only his outrages upon Hellas that go unresisted. No one resists even the aggressions which are committed against himself. Ambrosia and Lucas belong to the Corinthians. He has attacked them. Now Pactus to the Achaeans. He has sworn to hand it over to the Aetolians. Achaeans to the Thebans. He has taken it from them, and is now marching against their allies, the Byzantines. Is it not so? And of our own possessions, to pass by all the rest, is not Cardia, the great city in the Chersonese, in his hands? Thus are we treated, and we are all hesitating and torpid, with our eyes upon our neighbors, distrusting one another, rather than the man whose victims we all are. But if he treats us collectively in this outrageous fashion, what do you think he will do when he has become master of each of us separately? End of section 22. Recording by Roger Serling.
Section 23 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. The Third Philippic. Part 2. What, then, is the cause of these things? For as it was not without reason and just cause that the Hellenes in old days were so prompt for freedom, so it is not without reason or cause that they are now so prompt to be slaves. There was a spirit, men of Athens, a spirit in the minds of the people in those days, which is absent today, the spirit which vanquished the wealth of Persia, which led Hellas in the path of freedom, and never gave way in the face of battle by sea or by land, a spirit whose extinction today has brought universal ruin and turned Hellas upside down. What was this spirit? It was nothing subtle nor clever. It meant that men who took money from those who aimed at dominion or at the ruin of Hellas were execrated by all, that it was then a very grave thing to be convicted of bribery, that the punishment for the guilty man was the heaviest that can be inflicted, that for him there could be no plea for mercy, nor hope of pardon. No orator, nor general, would then sell the critical opportunity whenever it arose, the opportunity so often offered to men by fortune, even when they are careless and their foes are on their guard. They did not barter away the harmony between people and people, nor their own mistrust of the tyrant and the foreigner, nor any of these high sentiments. Where are such sentiments now? They have been sold in the market and are gone, and those have been imported in their stead, through which the nation lies ruined and plague-stricken. The envy of the man who has received his hire, the amusement which accompanies his avowal, the pardon granted to those whose guilt is proved, the hatred of one who censures the crime, and all the appurtenances of corruption. For as to ships, numerical strength, unstinting abundance of funds, and all other material of war, and all the things by which the strength of cities is estimated, every people can command these in greater plenty and on a larger scale by far than in old days. But all resources are rendered unserviceable, ineffectual, unprofitable by those who traffic in them. That these things are so today, you doubtless see and need no testimony of mine, and that in times gone by the opposite was true. I will prove to you not by any words of my own but by a record inscribed by your ancestors on a pillar of bronze, and placed on the Acropolis, not to be a lesson to themselves, they needed no such record to put them in a right mind, but to be a reminder and an example to you of the zeal that you ought to display in such a cause. What, then, is the record? Arthmaeus, son of Pythonox, of Zelea, is an outlaw, and is the enemy of the Athenian people and their allies, he and his house. Then follows the reason for which the step was taken because he brought the gold from the Medes and the Peloponnese, such is the record. Consider, in heaven's name, what must have been in the mind of the Athenians of that day, when they did this, and their conception of their position. They set up a record that because a man of Zelea, Arthmeus by name, a slave of the king of Persia, for Zelea is in Asia, as part of his service to the king, had brought gold not to Athens, but to the Peloponnese. He should be an enemy of Athens and her allies, he and his house, and that they should be outlaws. And this outlawry is no such disfranchisement as we ordinarily mean the word, for what would it matter to a man of Zelea that he might have no share in the public life of Athens? But there was a clause in the law of murder, dealing with those in connection with whose death the law does not allow a prosecution for murder, but the slaying of them is to be a holy act, quote, and let him die an outlaw, end quote, it runs. The meaning, accordingly, is this, that the slayer of such a man is to be pure from all guilt. They thought, therefore, that the safety of all the Hellenes was a matter which concerned themselves. Apart from this belief, it could not have mattered to them whether any one bought or corrupted men in the Peloponnese, and whenever they detected such offenders, they carried their punishment and their vengeance so far as to pillory their names forever. As the natural consequence, the Hellenes were a terror to their foreigner, not the foreigner to the Hellenes. It is not so now. Such is not your attitude in these or other matters. But what is it? You know it yourselves, for why should I accuse you explicitly on every point? and that of the rest of the Hellenes is like your own, and no better. And so I say that the present situation demands your utmost earnestness and good counsel. And what counsel? Do you bid me tell you, and will you not be angry if I do so? He reads from the document. Now there is an ingenuous argument, which is used by those who would reassure the city to the effect that, after all, Philip is not yet in the position once held by the Spartans, who ruled everywhere over sea and land, with the king for their ally, and nothing to withstand them, and that, nonetheless, Athens defended herself even against them, and was not swept away. Since that time, the progress in every direction, one may say, has been great, and has made the world today very different from what it was then. But I believe that in no respect has there been greater progress or development than in the art of war. 
In the first place, I am told that in those days the Spartans and all our other enemies would invade us for four or five months, during, that is, the actual summer, and would damage Attica with infantry and citizen troops, and then return home again. And so old-fashioned were the men of that day, nay, rather, such true citizens, that no one ever purchased any object from another for money, but their warfare was of a legitimate and open kind. But now, as I am sure you see, most of our losses are the result of treachery, and no issue is decided by open conflict or battle, while you are told that it is not because he leads a column of heavy infantry that Philip can march wherever he chooses, because he is attached to himself to a force of light infantry, cavalry, archers, mercenaries, and similar troops. And whenever with such advantages he falls upon a state which is disordered within, and in their distrust of one another no one goes out in defense of its territory, he brings up his engines and besieges them. I pass over the fact that summer and winter are alike to him, that there is no close season during which he suspends operations. But if you all know these things, and take due account of them, you surely must not let the war pass into Attica, nor be dashed from your seat through looking back to the simplicity of those old hostilities with Sparta. You must guard against him, at the greatest possible distance, both by political measures and by preparations. You must prevent his stirring from home, instead of grappling with him at close quarters in a struggle to the death. For men of Athens, we have many natural advantages for a war, if we are willing to do our duty. There is the character of his country, much of which we can harry and damage, and a thousand other things. But for a pitched battle, he is in better training than we. Nor have you only to recognize these facts, and to resist him by actual operations of war. You must also by reasoned judgment and of set purpose come to execrate those who address you in his interest, remembering that it is impossible to master the enemies of the city until you punish those who are serving them in the city itself. And this, before God and every heavenly power, you will not be able to do, for you have reached such a pitch of folly or distraction, or, I know not what to call it, for often has the fear actually entered my mind, that some more than mortal power may be driving our fortunes to ruin, that to enjoy their abuse, or their malice, or their jests, or whatever your motive may chance to be, you call upon men to speak who are hirelings, and some of whom would not even deny it, and you laugh to hear the abuse of others. And, terrible as this is, there is yet worse to be told for you have actually made political life safer for these men than for those who uphold your own cause. And yet I observe what calamities the willingness to listen to such men lays up in store. I will mention the facts known to you all. In Olympus, among those who were engaged in public affairs, there was one party who were on the side of Philip and served his interests in everything, and another whose aim was their city's real good, and the preservation of their fellow citizens from bondage. Which were the destroyers of their country? Which betrayed the cavalry? through whose betrayal Olympus perished, those whose sympathies were with Philip's cause, those who, while the city still existed, brought such dishonest and slanderous charges against the speakers whose advice was for the best, that, in the case of Apollonides at least, the people of Olympus was even induced to banish the accused. Nor is this instance of the unmixed evil wrought by these practices in the case of the Olympians an exceptional one, or without parallel elsewhere. For in Eritrea, when Plutarchus and the mercenaries had been got rid of, and the people had controlled the city and of Porthmus, one party wished to entrust the state to you, the other to entrust it to Philip. And through listening mainly, or rather entirely, to the latter, these poor luckless Eritreans were at last persuaded to banish the advocates of their own interests. For, as you know, Philip their ally sent Eponicus with a thousand mercenaries, stripped Porthmus of its walls, and set up three tyrants, Hipparchus, Automedon, and Claytarchus and since then he has already twice expelled them from the country when they wished to recover their position, sending on the first occasion the mercenaries commanded by Eurylochus, on the second, those under Parmenio. And why go through the mass of the instances? Enough to mention how in Aureus Philip had, as his agents, Philistides, Menippus, Socrates, Thoas, and Agapaeus, the very men who were now in possession of the city, and everyone knew the fact, while a certain Euphraeus, who once lived here in Athens, acted in the interest of freedom to save his country from bondage. To describe the insult and the contumely with which he met would require a long story, but a year before the capture of the town he laid an information of treason against Philistides and his party, having perceived the nature of their plans. A number of men joined forces, with Philip for their paymaster and director, and hailed Euphraeus off to prison as a disturber of the peace. Seeing this, the democratic party in Aureus, instead of coming to the rescue of Euphraeus, and being the other party to death, displayed no anger at all against them, agreed with a malicious pleasure that Euphraeus deserved his fate. After this, the conspirators worked with all the freedom they desired for the capture of the city, and made arrangements for the execution of the scheme. While any of the Democratic Party, who perceived what was going on, maintained a panic-stricken silence, 
remembering the fate of Euphraeus. So wretched was their condition that though this dreadful calamity was confronting them, no one dared open his lips, until all was ready and the enemy was advancing up to the walls. Then the one party set about the defense, and the other about the betrayal of the city. And when the city had been captured in this base and shameful manner, the successful party governed despotically, and of those who had been their own protectors, and had been ready to treat Euphraeus with all possible harshness, they expelled some and murdered others, while the good Euphraeus killed himself, thus testifying to the righteousness and purity of his motives in opposing Philip on behalf of his countrymen. Now for what reason, you may be wondering, were the peoples of Olynthus and Eritrea and Aureus more agreeably disposed towards Philip's advocates than towards their own? The reason was the same as it is to you, that those who speak for your true good can never, even if they would, speak to win popularity with you. They are constrained to inquire how the state may be saved, while their opponents in the very act of seeking popularity are cooperating with Philip. The one party said, you must pay taxes. The other, there is no need to do so. The one said, go to war and do not trust him. The other said, remain at peace, until they were in toils, and, not to mention each separately, I believe that the same thing was true of all. The one side said what would enable them to win favor, the other what would secure the safety of their state, and at last the main body of the people accepted much that they proposed, not from any such desire for gratification, nor from ignorance, but as a concession to circumstances, thinking that their cause was now wholly lost. It is this fate, I solemnly assure you, that I dread for you, when the time comes that you make your reckoning and realize that there is no longer anything that can be done. May you never find yourselves, men of Athens, in such a position. Yet, in any case, it were better to die ten thousand deaths than to do anything out of servility towards Philip, or to sacrifice any of those who speak for your good. A noble recompense did the people in Aureus receive for entrusting themselves to Philip's friends and thrusting Euphraeus aside, and a noble recompense the democracy of Eritrea for driving away your envoys and surrendering to Claytarchus. They are slaves, scourged and butchered, a noble clemency did he show to the Olynthians, who elected Lastenes to command the cavalry, and banished Epilondides. It is folly, and it is cowardice, to cherish hopes like these, to give way to evil counsels, to refuse to do anything that you should do, to listen to the advocates of the enemy's cause, and to fancy that you dwell in so great a city that, whatever happens, you will not suffer any harm. Aye, and it is shameful to exclaim after the event, Why, who would have expected this? Of course, we ought to have done, or not to have done, such and such things. The Olynthians could tell you of many things, to have foreseen which in time would have saved them from destruction. So too could the people of Aureus, and the Phocians, and every other people that has been destroyed. But how does that help them now? So long as the vessel is safe, be it great or small, so long must the sailor and the pilot and every man in his place exert himself and take care that no one may capsize it by design or by accident. But when the seas have overwhelmed it, all the efforts are in vain. So it is, men of Athens, with us. While we are still safe, with our great city, our vast resources, our noble name, what are we to do? Perhaps someone sitting here has long been wishing to ask you this question. I, and I will answer it, and will move my motion, and you shall carry it, if you wish. We ourselves, in the first place, must conduct the resistance and make preparation for it, with ships, that is, and money, and soldiers. For though all but ourselves give way and become slaves, we at least must contend for freedom. And when we have made all these preparations ourselves and let them be seen, then let us call upon the other states for aid, and send envoys to carry our message, in all directions, to the Peloponnese, to Rhodes, to Chios, to the king, for it is not unimportant for his interest either that Philip should be prevented from subjugating the world. That so, if you persuade them, you may have partners to share the danger and the expense in case of need, and if you do not, you may at least delay the march of events. For since the war is with a single man, not against the strength of the United States, even delay is not without its value, any more than were those embassies of protest which last year went round the Peloponnese, when I and Polyuctus, that best of men, and Hegesippus and the other envoys went on our tour and forced him to halt, so that he neither went to attack Archanania, nor set out for the Peloponnese. But I do not mean that we should call upon the other states, if we are not willing to take any of the necessary steps ourselves. It is folly to sacrifice what is our own, and then pretend to be anxious for the interests of others, to neglect the present, and alarm others in regard to the future. I do not propose this. I say that we must send money to the forces in the Chersonese, and do all that they ask of us, that we must make preparations ourselves while we summon, convene, instruct, and warn the rest of the Hellenes. That is the policy for a city with a reputation such as yours. But if you fancy that the people of Chalcis or of Megara will save Hellas while you run away from the task, you are mistaken. 
They may well be content if they can each save themselves. The task is yours. It is the prerogative that your forefathers won and through many a great peril bequeathed to you. But if each of you is to sit and consult his inclinations, looking for some way by which he may escape any personal action, the first consequence will be that you will never find anyone who will act. And the second, I fear, the day will come when we shall be forced to do, at one and the same time, all the things we wish to avoid. This, then, is my proposal, and this I move. If the proposal is carried out, I think that even now the state of our affairs may be remedied. But if any one has a better proposal to make, let him make it, and give us his advice. And I pray to all the gods that whatever be the decision that you are about to make, it may be for your own good. End of the Third Philippic End of Section 23 Recording by Roger Serling Section 24 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling The Public Orations of Demosthenes Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard On the Crown Introduction The advice given by Demosthenes in the Third Philippic, spoken before the middle of 341 BC, was in the main followed. He himself was sent almost immediately to Byzantium, where he renewed the alliance between that city and Athens, and at the same time entered into relations with Abdos and the Thracian princes. Rhodes and probably Chios and Kos were also conciliated and an embassy was sent to the king of Persia to ask for aid against Philip. The king appears to have sent assistance to Diopithes, and it is also stated, not on the best authority, that he sent large sums of money to Demosthenes and Hyperides. Demosthenes further succeeded in conjunction with Callias of Chalcis in organizing a league against Philip, which included Corinth, Megara, Corsera, and the Arcananians, and which at least supplied a considerable number of men and some funds. The cities of Euboea, most of which had been in the hands of Philip's party, were also formed into a confederacy, an alliance with Athens under the leadership of Chalcis. Philistides was expelled from Araeus about July 341 by the allied forces under Sisyphon. Later in the summer, Phocion drove Claytarchus from Eritrea. On the motion of Aristonicus, the Athenians voted Demosthenes a golden crown, which was conferred on him in the theatre at the Great Dionysia in March 340. The arrest of Anaxenus of Aureus and his condemnation as a spy acting in Philip's interest must have occurred about the same time. Not long afterwards, Demosthenes succeeded in carrying out a complete reorganization of the triarchic system by which he made the burden of the expense very strictly according to property, and secured a regular and efficient supply of ships, money, and men. In the meantime, in 341 or 340, the island of Peperethus was attacked by Philip's ships in revenge for the seizure of the Macedonian garrison in Halonasus by the Peperethians, and the Athenian admirals were ordered to retaliate. Philip himself had been pursuing this course in Thrace, and on the rejection of his request to Byzantium for an alliance, he laid siege, late in 340, to Perinthus, which lay on his way to Byzantium, sending part of his forces through the Chersonese. Aided by Byzantine and Persian soldiers, Perinthus held out, till at last Philip took most of his forces and besieged Byzantium itself. He had shortly before this sent to Athens an express declaration of war, and received a similar declaration from her, the formal excuse for which was found in the recent seizure by his ships of some Athenian merchant vessels. But with help from Athens, Chios, Rhodes, and Kos, the Byzantines maintained their defense. Philip's position became serious, but he managed by a ruse to get his ships away into the open sea, and even to do some damage to the Athenian settlers in the Chersonese. In the winter he withdrew from Byzantium and in 339 made an incursion into Scythia, but, returning through the country of the Triboli, he sustained some loss and was severely wounded. Later in the year, a new sacred war which had arisen gave him a convenient opportunity for the invasion of Greece. At the meeting of the Amphictyonic Council in the autumn of 340, Aeschines was one of the representatives of Athens. The Athenians had recently offended Thebes by regilding and dedicating in the restored temple at Delphi fifty shields, with an inscription stating that they were spoiled, taken from the Maydays and the Thebans when they fought against the Hellenes, probably at Platea in 479. The Locrians of Pamphysa intended, according to Aeschines' account, to propose that the council should fine Athens fifty talents. 
Aeschines rose to state the case for Athens, but a delegate from Amphisa forbade all mention of the Athenians, and demanded their exclusion from the temple, on the ground of their alliance with the accursed Phocians. Aeschines retorted by charging the Amphisians with cultivating and building upon the sacred plain of Syra, acts forbidden for all time in 586 BC, and roused the council to such indignation that they gathered a body of men and destroyed the harbor and the unlawful buildings of Syra, but they were severely handled by the Amphisians, and the council now voted that the Amphictyonic state should send representatives to discuss the question of war against Amphisa to a meeting to be held at Thermopylae before the spring meeting of the council. To this preliminary meeting, the Athenians, though inclined to view Aeschines' performance with favor, on the advice of Demosthenes, sent no representative, nor did the Thebans, the allies of Amphisa. War was declared by the Amphictyons against Amphisa, but Catythus, the Thessalian, who had been appointed general, made little headway, and, at the spring or autumn meeting of the council, declared that the Amphictyonic states must either send men and money, or else make Philip their general. Philip was, of course, at once appointed, but instead of proceeding against Amphisa, marched to Alatria and fortified it. This caused the greatest alarm at Athens. Demosthenes was immediately dispatched to Thebes, where he succeeded by what appeared to have been liberal and judicious proposals, in making an alliance between Thebes and Athens, in spite of the attempts of Philip's envoys to counteract his influence. Euboa, Megara, Corinth, and other members of the League also sent help. Philip himself called upon his own friends in the Peloponnese for aid, and at last moved towards Amphisa. Demosthenes seems now to have succeeded in applying the festival money to purposes of war, and with the aid of Lycurgus, who became controller of the festival fund, to have amassed a large sum for the use of the state. At the Dionysia of 338 he was again crowned, on the proposal of Demomeles and Hyperides. The allies at first won some successes and refortified some of the Phocian towns, but afterwards unfortunately divided their forces, and so enabled Philip to defeat the two divisions separately, and to destroy Amphisa. Philip's proposals of peace found supporters both in Thebes and in Athens, but were counteracted by Demosthenes. Late in the summer of 338, the decisive battle was fought at Chaeronea, and resulted in a total rout of the allies. Demosthenes himself was one of the fugitives. Philip placed a Macedonian garrison in Thebes, restored his exiled friends to power there, established a council of three hundred, and, through them, put to death or banished his enemies. He also gave Orchomenus, Thespiae, and Platiae their independence. After a moment of panic, the Athenians, led by Demosthenes, Lycurgus, and Hyperides, proceeded to take all possible measures for the defense of the city, while private munificence supplied the treasury. Demosthenes himself superintended the repair of the fortifications, and went on a mission to secure a supply of corn. But Philip, instead of marching upon Athens, sent a message by Demades, whom he had taken prisoner at Chaeronea, and the assembly in reply instructed Demades, Aeschines, and Phocion to ask Philip to release his Athenian prisoners. Philip released them without ransom, and sent Antipater and Alexander with the ashes of the Athenian dead to offer terms of peace. By the peace of Demades, concluded while Demosthenes was still absent, the alliance between Athens and Philip was renewed. The independence of Athens was guaranteed, Oropus was taken from Thebes and restored to Athens, and she was permitted to retain Salamis, Samos, Delos, and probably Lemnos and Imbros. On the other hand, she lost all her possessions on the Hellespont and in the Chersonese and promised to join the league which Philip intended to form for the invasion of Persia. Demosthenes was selected by the assembly to deliver the funeral oration upon those who fell at Chaeronea, and although the Macedonian party attacked him repeatedly in the law courts, he was always acquitted. Philip paid a long visit to the Peloponnese, in the course of which he placed a Macedonian garrison in Corinth, ravaged Laconia, giving parts of it to his allies, the Argives and the Arcadians, and announced his plans for the invasion of Persia at the head of the Greeks. He then returned to Macedonia. In 337, Demosthenes was again commissioner of fortifications, as well as controller of the festival fund, the most important office in the state. He not only performed his work most efficiently, but gave considerable sums for public purposes out of his private fortune. And early in 336, Tessiphon proposed, and the council resolved, that he should once more be crowned at the Dionysia. But before the proposal could be brought to the assembly, Aeschines indicted Tessiphon for its alleged illegality. The trial did not take place until late in the summer of 330. We do not know the reason for so long a delay, but probably the events of the intervening time were such as to render the state of public feeling unfavorable to Aeschines. In 336, Philip was assassinated and was succeeded by Alexander. In 335, Alexander destroyed Thebes, which had revolted, and sold its inhabitants into slavery. 
He also demanded from Athens the surrender of Demosthenes and other anti-Macedonian politicians and generals, but was persuaded to be content with the banishment of Caridamus and Ephifaltus, and the promise of the prosecution of Demosthenes for using subsidies from Persia to help Thebes, the prosecution which was allowed to drop. From 334 onwards, Alexander was pursuing his conquests in the east, and we know practically nothing of the history of Athens until the trial of Tessaphon came on in 330. Aeschines alleged against Tessaphon, 1. That it was illegal to propose to crown anyone who had not passed his examination before the board of auditors at the end of his term of office, and that Demosthenes, who had been the commissioner of fortifications and controller of the festival fund, was still in this position. 2. That it was illegal to proclaim the grant of a crown at the Dionysia, except in the case of crowns conferred by foreign states. And 3. That it was illegal to insert untrue statements into the public records, and that the language in which Tessaphon's decree described the political career of Demosthenes was untrue. On the first point, Aeschines was almost certainly right. Demosthenes' defense is sophistical, and all that could really be said was that the rule had often been broken before. On the second point, certainty is impossible. The most probable view, though it also has its difficulties, is that there were two inconsistent laws, and that one of them permitted the proclamation in the theater, if expressly voted by the people, but the alleged illegality had certainly been often committed. The third point, which raised the question of the value to Athens of Demosthenes' whole political life, was that upon which the case really turned, and it is to this that Demosthenes devotes the greater part of his speech, breaking up his reply into convenient stages by discussions of a far less happy description of the other counts of the indictment, and of the character and career of Aeschines. As in the speech on the embassy, certain facts are misrepresented, and there are passages which are in bad taste, but Demosthenes proves beyond doubt his unswerving loyalty to the high ideal of policy which he had formed for his country, and it is with good reason that parts of the speech have always been felt to reach a height of eloquence which has never been surpassed. The jury acquitted Tessaphon, and Aeschines, failing to obtain a fifth part of the votes, and thus incurring a heavy fine and the loss of some rights of the rights of a citizen, left Athens and lived most of the remainder of his life at Rhodes. The following is an analysis of the speech in outline. Section 1. Introduction. Section 2. Defense against charges irrelevant to the indictment, including parts as follows. Part 1. Introduction. Part 2. Postponement of reply to charges against his private life. Part 3. Reply to charges against his public life, with subsections as follows. Part 3a. Criticism of Aeschines' method of attack. Part 3b. Reply in reference to the peace of Philocrates. Section 3. Defense against the indictment itself, including parts as follows. Part 1. Introduction. Part 2. Deference of his policy, B.C. 346-340. Part 3. The alleged illegality of crowning him before he had passed his audit. Part 4. The alleged illegality of the proclamation in the theater. Part 5. Conclusion, including criticism of Aeschines' method of attack. Section 4. Aeschines' life and character, including parts as follows. Part 1. Introduction. Part 2. Parentage and early life of Aeschines. Part 3. Aeschines' connection with Antiphon, Pythus, Anaxenus, and others. Part 4. Aeschines' part in stirring up the war against Amphisa in 339. Section 5. Demosthenes' own policy in 339 and 338, including parts as follows. Part 1. Narrative and defense of the alliance with Thebes. Part 2. Why did not Aeschines protest at the time? Part 3. Defense of his policy as true to the spirit of Athenian history. Part 4. Narrative and defense continue. Part 5. Further criticism of Aeschines' method of attack. Section 6. Replies to various arguments of Aeschines, including parts as follows. Part 1. Aeschines' comparison of the inquiry to the examination of a balance sheet. Part 2. A proper inquiry would show that Demosthenes had increased the resources of Athens. Part 3. To reply to the charge of saddling Athens with an undue share of the expense of the war. Part 4. Reply to the charge of responsibility for the defeat of Chaeronea. Part 5. Vindication of his policy after the Battle of Chaeronea. Part 6. Reply to Aeschines' remarks about the harm done to Athens by Demosthenes' bad fortune, with subsections as follows. Part 6a. General Remarks. Part 6b. The Fortune of Demosthenes. Part 6c. The Fortune of Aeschines. 
Part 6D, Comparison of the Two. Part 6E, Demosthenes' use of his fortune for purposes of public and private munificence. Part 6F, Demosthenes not responsible for the misfortunes of Athens. Part 7, Reply to Aeschines' warning against Demosthenes' cleverness with subsections as follows. Part 7A, Comparison of the use made of their talents by the two orators. Part 7B, the choice of Demosthenes, not Aeschines, to deliver the funeral oration. Part 8. Aeschines' feelings about the defeat of Chaeronea. Part 9. The part played by traitors in recent history. Section 7. Epilogue, including parts as follows. Part 1. Demosthenes' incorruptibility. Part 2. Demosthenes' measures for the protection of Athens. Part 3. Comparison of the services of the two orators to Athens. Part 4. Reply to the comparison of Demosthenes with the men of old by a final comparison of the two orators. Part 5. Peroration. End of section 24. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 25 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown, Part 1. I pray first, men of Athens, to every god and goddess, that the goodwill which I ever feel towards the city and towards all of you may in equal measure be vouchsafed to me by you at this present trial, and secondly, a prayer which especially touches yourselves, your consciences, and your reputation, the gods may put it into your minds not to take counsel of my adversary in regard to the spirit in which you ought to hear me, for that would surely be a cruel thing, but of the laws and of your oath, wherein besides all the precepts of justice, this also is written, that you shall listen to both sides with a like mind, and this means not only that you should have formed no prejudice and should accord equal goodwill to each, but also that you should give leave to every man who pleads before you to adopt that order and make that defense upon which he has resolved and fixed his choice. I am in many respects at a disadvantage in the present controversy as compared with Aeschines, and particularly men of Athens, in two points of importance. The first is that I am not contending for the same stake as he, it is not the same thing for me to lose your goodwill now, as it is for him to fail to win his case. Since for me, but I would say nothing unpleasant at the opening of my address, I say only that Aeschines can well afford to risk this attack upon me. The second disadvantage lies in the natural and universal tendency of mankind to hear invective and denunciation with pleasure, and to be offended with those who praise themselves. And of the two courses in question, that which contributes to men's pleasure has been given to Aeschines, and that which annoys everyone, I may say, is left for me. If, to avoid giving such annoyance, I say nothing of all that I myself have done, it will be thought that I am unable to clear myself of the charges against me, or to show the grounds upon which I claim to deserve the distinction. If, on the other hand, I proceed to speak of my past acts and my political life, I shall often be compelled to speak of myself. I will endeavor, then, to do this as modestly as possible and for all that the necessities of the case compel me to say, the blame must in fairness be borne by the prosecutor, who initiated a trial of such a kind as this. I think, men of Athens, that you would all admit that this present trial equally concerns myself and Tessaphon, and demands no less earnest attention from me than from him, for while it is a painful and a grievous thing for a man to be robbed of anything, particularly if it is at the hands of an enemy that this befalls him, it is especially so when he is robbed of your good will and kindness, just in proportion as to win these is the greatest possible gain. And because such is the issue at stake in the present trial, I request and entreat you all alike to give me, while I make my defense upon the charges that have been brought against me, a fair hearing, as you are commanded to do by the laws, those laws to which their original maker, your well-wisher and the people's friend, Solon, thought fit to give the sanction not of enactment only, but also of an oath on the part of those who act as judges not because he distrusted you, so at least it seems to me, but because he saw that a defendant could not escape from the imputations and the slanders which fall with special force from the prosecutor, because he is the first to speak, unless each of you who sit in judgment, keeping his conscience pure in the sight of God, will receive the pleadings of the later speaker with the same favor, and will thus, because his attention has been given equally and impartially to both sides, form his decision upon the case in its entirety. And now, when I am about, as it seems, to render an account of my whole private life and public career, 
I would once more invoke the aid of the gods. And in the presence of all of you, I pray, first, that the good will which I ever feel towards the city and towards all of you may in equal measure be vouchsafed to me by you at this trial. And secondly, that whatsoever the judgment upon this present suit will conduce to your public reputation and the purity of each man's conscience, that judgment they may put into all your minds to give. Now if Eskenes had confined his charges to the subject of the indictment, I too, in making my defense, would have dealt at once with the actual resolution of the council. But since he has devoted no less a portion of his speech to the relation of other matters, and for the most part has spoken against me falsely, I think it is necessary, and at the same time just, that I should deal briefly, men of Athens, with these, in order that none of you may be led by irrelevant arguments to listen less favorably to my pleas in answer to the indictment itself. As for his slanderous vituperation of my private life, mark how straightforward and just how is the reply that I make. If you know me as the man that he charged me with being, for my life has been spent nowhere but in your own midst, do not even suffer me to speak. No, not that my whole public career has been one of transcendent merit, but rise and condemn me without delay. But if, in your judgment and belief, I am a better man than Eskenes, and come of better men, if I and mine are no worse than any other respectable persons, to use no offensive expression, then do not trust him even in regard to other points, for it is plain that all he has said was equally fictitious. But once more accord me today the goodwill throughout the past that you have so often displayed towards me in previous trials. Knave as you are, Eskenes, you were assuredly more fool than knave when you thought that I should dismiss all that I had to say with regard to my past acts and political life, and should turn to meet the abuse that fell from you. I shall not do so. I am not so brain-sick, but I will review the falsehoods and the calumnies which you uttered against my political career, and then, if the court desires it, I will afterwards refer to the ribald language that has been so incontinently used. The offenses charged against me are many, and for some of them the laws assign heavy and even the most extreme penalties, but I will tell you what is the motive which animates the present suit, gives play to the malice of a personal enemy, to his insolence, his abuse, his contumelies, and his every expression of his hostility, and yet, assuming that the charges and the imputations which have been made are true, does not enable the state to exact a penalty that is adequate or nearly adequate to the offenses. For it is not right to seek to debar another from coming before the people and receiving a hearing, nor to do so in the spirit of malice and envy. Heaven knows it is neither straightforward nor citizen-like nor just men of Athens. If the crimes by which he saw me injuring the city were of such a magnitude as he now so theatrically set forth, he should have had recourse to the punishments enjoined by the laws at the times of the crimes themselves. If he saw me so acting as to deserve impeachment, he should have impeached me, and so brought me to trial before you. If he saw me proposing illegal measures, he should have indicted me for the illegality, for surely, if he can prosecute Tessifin on my account, he would not have failed to indict me in person, had he thought that he could convict me. And further, if he saw me committing any of these other crimes against you, which he just now slanderously enumerated, or any other crimes whatsoever, there are laws which deal with each, and punishments and lawsuits and judgments involving penalties that are harsh and severe. To all of these he could have had recourse, and from the moment when it was seen that he had acted so, and had conducted his hostilities against me on this plan, his present accusation of me would have been in line with his past conduct. But as it is, he has forsaken the straight path of justice. He has shrunk from all attempts to convict me at the time, and after all these years, with the imputations, the jests, the invectives that he has accumulated, he appears to play his part. So it is that those accusations are against me. It is Tessifin that he prosecutes, and though he sets his quarrel with me in the forefront of the whole suit, he has never faced me in person to settle the quarrel, and it is another whom we see him trying to deprive of his civil rights. Yet surely, besides everything else that may be pleaded on behalf of Tessifin, this, I think, may surely be most reasonably urged, that we ought in justice to have brought our own quarrel to the test by ourselves, instead of avoiding all conflict with one another, and looking for a third party to whom we could harm. Such iniquity really passes all bounds. From this one may see the nature of all his charges alike, uttered as they have been, without justice or regard for the truth. Yet I desire also to examine them severally, and more particularly the false statements which he made against me in regard to the peace and the embassy, when he ascribed to me the things that he had done himself in conjunction with Philocrates. And here it is necessary, men of Athens, and perhaps appropriate, that I should remind you of the state of affairs subsisting during that period, so that you may view each group of actions in the light of the circumstances of the time. When the Phocian War had broken out, not through any action of mine, for I had not yet entered public life, your own attitude in the first place was such that you wished for the preservation of the Phocians, 
although you saw that their actions were unjustifiable. While you would have been delighted at anything that might happen to the Thebans, against whom you felt an indignation that was neither unreasonable nor unfair, for they had not used their good fortune at Leuctra with moderation, and in the second place the Peloponnese was all disunited. Those who detested the Spartans were not strong enough to annihilate them, and those who had previously governed with the support of Sparta were no longer able to maintain their control over their cities. But both these and all the other states were in a condition of indeterminate strife and confusion. When Philip saw this, for it was not hard to see, he tried by dispensing money to the traders whom each state contained to throw them all into collision and stir up one against the other. And thus, amid the blunders and the perversity of others, he was making his own preparations and growing great to the danger of all. When it became clear to all that the then overbearing but now unhappy Thebans, distressed by the length of the war, would be forced to fly to you for aid, Philip, to prevent this, to prevent the formation of any union between the cities, made offers of peace to you and of assistance to them. Now, what was it that helped him and enabled him to find in you his almost willing dupes? It was the baseness, if that is the right name to use, or the ignorance, or both, of the rest of the Hellenes, who, though you were engaged in a long, continuous war, and that on behalf of the interests of all, as has been proved by the event, neither assisted you with the money or men, or in any other way whatsoever, and in your just and proper indignation with them, you listened readily to Philip. It was for these reasons, therefore, not through any action of mine, that the peace which we then conceded was negotiated, and any one who investigates the matter honestly will find that it is the crimes and the corrupt practices of these men in the course of negotiations that are responsible for our position today. It is in the interests of truth that I enter into all these events with this exactitude and thoroughness, for however strong the appearance of criminality in these proceedings may be, it has, I imagine, nothing to do with me. The first man to suggest or mention the piece was Aristodemus the actor, and the person who took the matter up and moved the motion and sold his services for the purpose, along with Aeschines, was Philocrates of Hanyas. Your partner, Aeschines, not mine, even if you split your sides with lying, while those who supported him from whatever motive, for of that I say nothing at present, were Eubulus and Cessisophon. I had no part in the matter anywhere. And yet, although the facts are such that as with absolute truth I am representing them to be, he carried his effrontery so far as to dare to assert that I was not only responsible for the peace, but had also prevented the city from acting in conjunction with the general assembly of the Hellenes in making it. What? And you? Ugh. How can one find a name that can be applied to you? When you saw me, for you were there, preventing the city from taking this great step and forming so grand an alliance as you just now described, did you once raise a protest or come forward to give information and to set forth the crimes with which you now charge me? If I had covenanted with Philip for money that I would prevent the coalition of the Hellenes, your only course was to refuse to keep silence, to cry aloud, to protest, to reveal the fact to your fellow countrymen. On no occasion did you do this. No such utterance of yours was ever heard by anyone. In fact, there was no embassy away at the time on a mission to any Hellenic state. The Hellenes had long ago been tried and found wanting, and in all that he has said upon this matter, there is not a single sound word. And, apart from all that, his falsehoods involved the greatest calumnies upon the city. For if you were at one and the same time convoking the Hellenes with a view to war, and sending ambassadors yourselves to Philip to discuss peace, it was a deed for Eurybatus, not a task for a state or for honest men that you were carrying out. But that is not the case. Indeed, it is not. For what could possibly have been your object in summoning them at that moment? Was it with a view to peace? But they all had peace already. Or with a view to war? But you were yourselves discussing peace. It is therefore evident that neither was it that I introduced or was responsible for the piece in its original shape, nor is one of all the other falsehoods which he had told of me shown to be true. Again, consider the course of action which, when the city had concluded the peace, each of us now chose to adopt. For from this you will know who it was that cooperated with Philip throughout, and who it was that acted in your interest and sought the good of the city. As for me, I proposed, as a member of the council, that the ambassadors should sail as quickly as possible to any district in which they should ascertain Philip to be, and receive his oath from him. But even when I had carried this resolution, they would not act upon it. What did this mean, men of Athens? I will inform you. Philip's interest required that the interval before he took the oath should be as long as possible. Yours, that it should be as short as possible. And why? Because you broke off all your preparations for the war, not merely from the day when he took the oath, but from the day when you first hoped that peace would be made, and for his part, this was what he was all along working for, for he thought, and with truth, that whatever places he could snatch from Athens before he took the oath would remain securely his, since no one would break the peace for their sake. 
For seeing and calculating upon this men of Athens, I proposed this decree, that we should sail to any district in which Philip might be, and receive his oath as soon as possible, in order that the oaths might be taken while the Thracians, your allies, were still in possession of those strongholds of which Aeschines just spoke now with contempt, Serium, Myrtinum, and Ergeski, and that Philip might not snatch from us the keys of the country, and make himself master of Thrace, nor obtain an abundant supply of money and of soldiers, and so proceed without difficulty to the prosecution of his further designs. And now, instead of citing or reading this decree, he slanders me on the ground that I have thought fit, as member of the council, to introduce the envoys. But what should I have done? Was I to propose not to introduce those who had come for the express purpose of speaking with you, or to order the lessee of the theatre not to assign them seats? But they would have watched the play from the three penny seats, if this decree had not been proposed. Should I have guarded the interests of the city in petty details, and sold them wholesale, as my opponents did? Surely not. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now take this decree, which the prosecutor passed over, though he knew it well, and read it. The decree of Demosthenes is read. Though I had carried this decree, and was seeking the good not of Philip, but of the city, those worthy ambassadors paid little heed to it, but sat idle in Macedonia for three whole months, until Philip had arrived from Thasse, after subduing the whole country when they might, within ten days, or equally well within three or four, have reached the hell-spot and saved the strongholds by receiving his oath before he could seize them, for he would not have touched them when we were present, or else, if he had done so, we should have refused to administer the oath to him, and in that case he would have failed to obtain the peace. He would not have had both the peace and the strongholds as well. Such was Philip's first act of fraud during the time of the embassy, and the first instance of venality on the part of these wicked men. And over this I confess that then and now and always I have been, and am at war, and at variance with them. Now observe, immediately after this, a second and even greater piece of villainy. As soon as Philip had sworn to the peace, after first gaining possession of Thrace, because these men did not obey my decree, he obtained from them, again by purchase, the postponement of our departure from Macedonia, until all should be in readiness for his campaign against the Phocians, in order that, instead of our bringing home a report of his intentions and his preparations for the march, which would make you set out and sail round to Thermopylae with your warships as you did before, you might only hear our report of the facts when he was already on this side of Thermopylae, and you could do nothing. And Philip was beset with such fear and such a weight of anxiety, lest in spite of his occupation of these places, his object should slip from his grasp, if, before the Phocians were destroyed, he resolved to assist them, that he hired this despicable creature, not now in company with his colleagues, but by himself alone, to make to you a statement and a report of such a character that, owing to them, all was lost. But I request and entreat you, men of Athens, to remember throughout this whole trial that, had Aeschines made no accusation that was not included in the indictment, I too would not have said a word that did not bear upon it. But since he has had recourse to all kinds of imputation and slander at once, I am compelled also to give a brief answer to each group of charges. What then were the statements uttered by him that day, in consequence of which all was lost? You must not be perturbed, he said, at Philip's having crossed to this side of Thermopylae, for you will get everything that you desire if you remain quiet, and within two or three days you will hear that he has become the friend of those whose enemy he was, and the enemy of those whose friend he was when he first came. For, said he, it is not the phrases that confirm friendships, a finely sententious expression, but identity of interest, and it is to the interest of Philip, and of the Phocians, and of yourselves alike, to be rid of the heartless and overbearing demeanor of the Thebans. To these statements some gave a ready ear, in consequence of the tacit ill-feeling towards the Thebans at the time. What then followed, and not after a long interval, but immediately, the Phocians were overthrown, their cities were razed to the ground, you, who had believed Aeschines and remained inactive, were soon afterwards bringing in your effects from the country, while Aeschines received his gold. And besides all this, the city reaped the ill will of the Thebans and the Thessalians, while their gratitude for what had been done went to Philip. To prove that this is so, Demosthenes says to the clerk, read me both the decree of Calisthenes and Philip's letter. Demosthenes to the jury, these two documents together will make all the facts plain. Demosthenes to the clerk, read. The decree of Calisthenes is read. Were these the hopes on the strength of which you made the peace? Was this what this hireling promised you? Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read the letter which Philip sent after this. Philip's letter is read. You hear how obviously in this letter sent to you, Philip is addressing definite information to his own allies. I have done these things, he tells them, against the will of the Athenians, and to their annoyance. And so, men of Thebes and Thessaly, 
If you are wise, you will regard them as enemies, and will trust me. He does not write in those actual terms, but that is what he intends to indicate. By these means he so carried them away, that he did not foresee or realize any of the consequences, but allowed him to get everything into his own power. And that is why, poor men, they have experienced their present calamities. But the man who helped him create this confidence, who cooperated with him, who brought home that false report and deluded you, he it is who now bewails the sufferings of the Thebans and enlarges upon their piteousness, he who is himself the cause both of these and of the misery of Phocis, and of all the other evils which the Hellenes have endured. Yes, it is evident that you are pained at what has come to pass, Eskenes, and that you are sorry for the Thebans when you have property in Boeotia and are farming the land that was theirs, and that I rejoice at, I, whose surrender was immediately demanded by the author of the disaster. But I have digressed into subjects of which it will perhaps be more convenient to speak presently. I will return to the proofs which show that it is the crimes of these men that are the cause of our condition today. For when you had been deceived by Philip through the agency of these men, who while serving as ambassadors had sold themselves and made a report in which there was not a word of truth, when the unhappy Phocians had been deceived and their cities annihilated, what followed? The despicable Thessalians and the slow-witted Thebans regarded Philip as their friend, their benefactor, their savior. Philip was their all in all. They would not even listen to the voice of anyone who wished to express a different opinion. You yourselves, though you viewed what had been done with suspicion and vexation, nevertheless kept the peace, for there was nothing else that you could have done. And the other Hellenes, who, like yourselves, have been deluded and disappointed of their hopes, also kept the peace. And gladly, since in a sense they were also remotely aimed at by the war. For when Philip was going about and subduing the Illyrians and Triboli, and some of the Hellenes as well, and bringing many of the large forces into his own power, and when some of the members of the several states were taking advantage of the peace to travel to Macedonia, and were being corrupted, Eskenes among them, at such a time all of those whom Philip had in view in thus making his preparations were really being attacked by him. Whether they failed to realize it is another question which does not concern me, for I was continually uttering warnings and protests, both in your midst and wherever I was sent, but the cities were stricken with disease. Those who were engaged in political and practical affairs were taking bribes and being corrupted by the hope of money, while the mass of private citizens either showed no foresight or else were caught by the bait of ease and leisure from day to day, and all alike had fallen victims to some such delusive fancy as that the danger would come upon everyone but themselves, and that through the perils of others they would be able to secure their own position as they pleased. And so, I suppose, it has come to pass that the masses have atoned for their great and ill-timed indifference by the loss of their freedom, while the leaders in affairs, who fancied that they were selling everything except themselves, have realized that they had sold themselves first of all. For instead of being called friends and guest friends, as they were called at the time when they were taking bribes, they now hear themselves called flatterers, and godforsaken, and all the other names that they deserve. For no one, men of Athens, spends his money out of a desire to benefit the traitor, nor, when once he has secured the object for which he bargains, does he employ the traitor to advise him with regard to other objects. If it were so, nothing could be happier than a traitor. But it is not so. Of course, far from it. When the aspirant after dominion has gained his object, he is also the master of those who have sold it to him. And because then he knows their villainy, he then hates and mistrusts them, and covers them with insults. For observe, for even if the time of the events is past, the time for realizing truths like these is ever present to wise men. Lastenes was called his friend, but only until he had betrayed Olynthus, and Timolaus, but only until he had destroyed Thebes, and Eudesus and Simus of Larissa, but only until they had put Thessaly in Philip's power. And now, persecuted as they are, and insulted and subjected to every kind of misery, the whole inhabited world has become filled with such men. And what of Aristratus of Sicyon? What of Perillus of Megara? Are they not outcasts? From these instances one can see very clearly that it is he who best protects his own country and speaks most constantly against such men that secures for traitors and hirelings like yourselves, Eskenes, the continuance of your opportunities for taking bribes. It is the majority of those who are here, those who resist your will, that you must thank for the fact that you live and draw your pay, for, left to yourselves, you would long ago have perished. There is still much that I might say about the transactions of that time, but I think that even what I have said is more than enough. The blame rests to the Iskines, who has drenched me with the stale dregs of his own villainy and crime, from which I was compelled to clear myself in the eyes of those who are too young to remember the events, though perhaps you who knew, even before I said a single word, of Iskines' service as a hireling may have felt some annoyance as you listened. He calls it, forsooth, friendship and guest friendship. 
Somewhere in his speech just now, he used the expression, The man who casts in my teeth, my guest friendship with Alexander. I cast in your teeth, your guest friendship with Alexander? How did you acquire it? How came you to be thought worthy of it? Never would I call you the guest friend of Philip or the friend of Alexander. I am not so insane. Unless you are to call harvesters and other hired servants the friends and guest friends of those who have hired them. But that is not the case, of course. Far from it. Nay, I call you the hireling, formerly of Philip, and now of Alexander, and so do all who are present. If you disbelieve me, ask them, or rather, I'll ask them for you. Men of Athens, do you think of Eschines as the hireling or as the guest friend of Alexander? You hear what they say. End of section 25. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 26 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Part 2. I now wish, without more delay, to make my defense upon the indictment itself, and to go through my past acts, in order that Eschines may hear, though he knows them well, the grounds on which I claim to have a right, both to the gifts which the council has proposed, and even far greater than these. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now take the indictment and read it. The indictment is read. These men of Athens are the points in the resolution which the prosecutor assails, and these very points will, I think, afford me my first means of proving to you that the defense which I am about to offer is an absolutely fair one, for I will take the points of the indictment in the very same order as the prosecutor. I will speak of each in succession, and will knowingly pass over nothing. Any decision upon the statement that I, quote, consistently do and say what is best for the people, and am eager to do whatever good I can, end quote, and upon the proposal to vote me thanks for this, depends, I consider, upon my past political career for it is by an investigation of my career that either the truth and the propriety, or else the falsehood, of these statements which Tessifant has made about me will be discovered. Again, the proposal to crown me without the addition of the clause, quote, when he has submitted to his examination, end quote, and the order to proclaim the award of the crown in the theater, must, I imagine, stand or fall with my political career, for the question is whether I deserve the crown and the proclamation before my fellow countrymen or not. At the same time, I consider myself further bound to point out to you the laws under which the defendant's proposal could be made. In this honest and straightforward manner, men of Athens, I have determined to make my defense, and now I will proceed to speak of my past actions themselves. And let no one imagine that I am detaching my argument from its connection with the indictment if I break into a discussion of international transactions, for it is the prosecutor who, by assailing the clause of the decree which states that I do and say what is best, and by indicting it as false, has rendered the discussion of my whole political career essentially germane to the indictment, and further, out of the many careers which public life offers, it was the Department of International Affairs that I chose, so that I have a right to derive my proofs also from that department. I will pass over all that Philip snatched from us and secured in the days before I took part in public life as an orator. None of these losses, I imagine, has anything to do with me. But I will recall to you, and will render you an account of all that, from the day I entered upon this career, he was prevented from taking, when I have made one remark. Philip, men of Athens, had a great advantage in his favor, for in the midst of the Hellenic peoples, and not of some only, but of all alike, there had sprung up a crop of traitors, corrupt, godforsaken men more numerous than they have ever been in the memory of man. These he took to help and cooperate with him, and great as the mutual ill will and dissensions of the Hellenes already were, he rendered them even worse, by deceiving some, making presents to others, and corrupting others in every way, and at a time when all had in reality but one interest, to prevent his becoming powerful, he divided them into a number of factions. All the Hellenes then being in this condition, still ignorant of the growing and accumulating evil, you have to ask yourselves, men of Athens, what policy and action it was fitting for the city to choose, and to hold me responsible for this, for the person who assumed that responsibility in the state was myself. Should she, Eschines, have sacrificed her pride and her own dignity? Should she have joined the ranks of the Thessalians and Dolopes, and helped Philip to acquire the empire of Hellas, cancelling thereby the noble and righteous deeds of our forefathers? Or, if she should not have done this, for it would have been in very truth an atrocious thing, 
Should she have looked on while all that she saw would happen if no one prevented it, all that she realized, it seems, at a distance, was actually taking place. Nay, I should be glad to ask today the severest critic of my actions which party he would have desired the city to join, the party which shares the responsibility for the misery and disgrace which has fallen upon the Hellenes, the party of the Thessalians and their supporters, one may call it, or the party which looked on while these calamities were taking place, in the hope of gaining some advantage for themselves, in which we should place the Arcadians and Mycenaeans and Argives. But even of these many, nay, all, have in the end fared worse than we. For if Philip had departed immediately after his victory and gone his way, if afterwards he had remained at peace and had given no trouble whatever to any of his own allies or of the other Hellenes, then there would have been some ground for blaming and accusing those who had opposed his plans. But if he has stripped them all alike of their dignity, their paramountcy, and their independence, nay, even of their free constitutions wherever he could do so, can it be denied that the policy which you adopted on my advice was the most glorious policy possible? But I return to my former point. What was it fitting for the city to do, Eskenes, when she saw Philip establishing for himself a despotic sway over the Hellenes? What language should have been used, what measures proposed, by the adviser of the people at Athens, for that it was at Athens, makes the utmost difference? When I knew that from the very first, up to the day when I myself ascended the platform, that my country had always contended for preeminence, honor, and glory, and in the cause of honor, and for the interests of all, had sacrificed more money and lives than any other Hellenic people had spent for their private ends. When I saw that Philip himself, with whom our conflict lay, for the sake of empire and absolute power, had had his eye knocked out, his collarbone broken, his hand and his leg maimed, and was ready to resign any part of his body that fortune chose to take from him, provided that with what remained he might live in honor and glory. And surely no one would dare to say that it was fitting that in one bread of Pella, a place then inglorious and insignificant, there should have grown up so lofty a spirit that he aspired after the empire of Hellas, and conceived such a project in his mind, but that in you, who are Athenians, and who day by day in all that you hear and see, behold the memorials of the gallantry of your forefathers, such baseness should be found, that you would yield up your liberty to Philip by your own deliberate offer and deed. No man would say this. One alternative remained, and that, one which you were bound to take, that of a righteous resistance to the whole course of action by which he was doing you injury. You acted thus from the first, quite rightly and properly, while I helped by my proposals and advice during the time of my political activity, and I do not deny it. But what ought I to have done? For the time has come to ask you this, Eskenes, and to dismiss everything else. Amphipolis, Pydna, Potidea, Hellenesis are all blotted from my memory. As for Serium, Oriscus, the sack of Peperithus, and all the other injuries inflicted upon the city, I renounce all knowledge of their ever having happened, though you actually said that I involved my countrymen in hostility by talking of these things, when the decrees which deal with them were the work of Eubulus, Aristophan, and Diopithes, and not mine at all. So glibly do you assert anything that suits your purpose. But of this too, I say nothing at present. I only ask you whether Philip, who was appropriating Euboa and establishing it as a stronghold to command Attica, who was making an attempt upon Megara, seizing Aureus, raising the walls of Porthmus, setting up Philistides at Aureus and Clitarchus at Eritrea, bringing up the Hellespont into his own power, besieging Byzantium, destroying some of the cities of Hellas, and restoring his exiled friends to others, whether he, I say, in acting thus, was guilty of wrong, violating the truce and breaking the peace, or not. Was it fit that one of the Hellenes should arise to prevent it, or not? If it was not fit, if it was fit that Hellas should become like the Mysian booty in the proverb before men's eyes, while the Athenians had life and being, then I have lost my labor in speaking upon this theme, and the city has lost its labor in obeying me. Then let everything that has been done be counted for a crime and a blunder, and those my own. But if it was right that one should arise to prevent it, for whom could the task be more fitting than for the people of Athens? That then was the aim of my policy, and when I saw Philip reducing all mankind to servitude, I opposed him, and without ceasing warned and exhorted you to make no surrender. But the peace, Eskenes, was in reality broken by Philip when he seized the corn ships, not by Athens, Demosthenes to the clerk. Bring the decrees themselves, and the letter of Philip, and read them in order. Demosthenes to the jury, for they will make it clear who is responsible, and for what. The decree is read. 
This decree then was proposed by Eubulus, not by me, and the next by Aristophan. He is followed first by Hegesippus, and he by Aristophan again, and then by Philocrates, then by Sisisophon, and then by all of them. But I propose no decree upon this subject. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read. Decrees are read. As then I point to these decrees, so, Eschines, do you point to a decree of any kind proposed by me which makes me responsible for the war. You cannot do so, for had you been able, there is nothing which you would sooner have produced. Indeed, even Philip himself makes no charge against me as regards the war, though he complains of others. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read Philip's letter itself. Philip's letter is read. In this letter he has nowhere mentioned the name Demosthenes, nor made any charge against me. Why is it then that, though he complains of others, he has not mentioned my own actions? Because, if he had written anything about me, he must have mentioned his own acts of wrong. For it was these acts upon which I kept my grip, and these which I opposed. First of all, when he was trying to steal into the Peloponnese, I proposed the embassy to the Peloponnese. Then, when he was grasping at Euboa, the embassy to Euboa. Then the expedition, not an embassy any more, to Aureus, and that to Eritrea, when he had established tyrants in those cities. After that I dispatched all the naval expeditions, in the course of which the Chersonese and Byzantium and all our allies were saved. In consequence of this, the noblest rewards at the hands of those who have benefited by your action became yours. Boats of thanks, glory, honors, crowns, gratitude while of the victims of his aggression those who followed your advice at the time secured their own deliverance and those who neglected it had the memory of your warnings constantly in their minds and regarded you not merely as their well-wishers but as men of wisdom and prophetic insight for all that you foretold has come to pass and further that philistes would have given a large sum to retain aureus and cleitarchus to retain eritrea and philip himself to be able to count upon the use of these places against you and to escape all exposure of his other proceedings and all investigation by any one in any place of his wrongful acts all this is not unknown to any one least of all to you Eschines. for the envoys sent to that time by clitarchus and philistides lodged at your house when they came here and you acted as their patron though the city rejected them as enemies whose proposals were neither just nor expedient to you they were friends none of their attempts succeeded slander me though you may when you assert that i say nothing when i receive money but cry out when i spend it that certainly is not your way for you cry out with money in your hands and will never cease unless those present cause you to do so by taking away your civil rights to-day now on that occasion gentlemen you crown me for my conduct aristonicus proposed a decree whose very syllables were identical with those of tesiphon's present proposal the crown was proclaimed in the theatre and this was already the second proclamation in my honour and yet Eschines, though he was there neither opposed the decree nor indicted the mover demosthenes to the clerk take this decree also and read it the decree of aristonicus is read now is any of you aware of any discredit that attached itself to the city owing to this decree did any mockery or ridicule ensue such as Eschines said must follow on the present occasion if i were crowned but surely when proceedings are recent and well known to all then it is that if they are satisfactory they meet with gratitude and if they are otherwise with punishment it appears then that on that occasion i met with gratitude not with blame or punishment thus the fact that up to the time when these events took place i acted throughout as was best for the city has been acknowledged by the victory of my advice and my proposals in your deliberations by the successful execution of the measures which i proposed and the award of crowns in consequence of them to the city and to myself and to all and by your celebration of sacrifices to the gods and processions in thankfulness for these blessings when philip had been expelled from euboa and while the arms which expelled him were yours the statesmanship and the decrees even though some of my opponents may split their sides were mine he proceeded to look for some other stronghold from which he could threaten the city and seeing that we were more dependent than any other people upon imported corn and wishing to get our corn trade into his power he advanced to thrace first he requested the byzantines his own allies to join him in the war against you and when they refused and said with truth they had not made their alliance with him for such a purpose he erected a stockade against the city brought up his engines and proceeded to besiege it i will not ask again what you ought to have done when this is happening it is manifest to all but who was it that went to the rescue of the byzantines and saved them who was it that prevented the hellespont from falling into other hands at that time 
It was you, men of Athens, and when I say you, I mean this city. And who was it that spoke and moved resolutions and acted for the city and gave himself up unsparingly to the business of the state? It was I. But of the immense benefit thus conferred upon all, you no longer need words of mine to tell you, since you have had actual experience of it. For the war which then ensued, apart from the glorious reputation that had brought you, kept you supplied with the necessaries of life in greater plenty and at lower prices than the present peace, which these worthy men are guarding to their country's detriment, in the hopes of something yet to be realized. May those hopes be disappointed. May they share the fortune which you, who wish for the best, ask of the gods, rather than cause you to share that upon which their own choice is fixed. Demosthenes to the Clerk Read out to the jury the crowns awarded to the city in consequence of our action by the Byzantines and by the Perinthians. The decree of the Byzantines is read. Read out also the crowns awarded by the peoples of the Chersonese. The decree of the peoples of the Chersonese is read. Thus the policy which I had adopted was not only successful in saving the Chersonese and Byzantium, and preventing the Hellespont from falling at that time into the power of Philip, and in bringing honors to the city in consequence, but it revealed to the whole world the noble gallantry of Athens and the baseness of Philip, for all saw that he, the ally of the Byzantines, was besieging them. What could be more shameful or revolting? And on the other hand, it was seen that you, who might fairly have urged many well-founded complaints against them for their inconsiderate conduct towards you at an earlier period, not only refused to remember your grudge and to abandon the victims of aggression, but actually delivered them, and in consequence of this, you won glory and goodwill on all hands. And further, though everyone knows that you have crowned many public men before now, no one can name any but myself, that is to say, any public counselor and orator, for whose merits the city has received a crown. In order to prove to you also that the slanders which he uttered against the Euboans and the Byzantines, as he recalled to you any ill-natured action that they had taken towards you in the past, are disingenuous calumnies, not only because they are false, for this, I think, you may all be assumed to know, but also because, however true they might be, it was still to your advantage to deal with the political situation as I have done. I desire to describe in that briefly one or two of the noble deeds which the city has done in your own time. For an individual and a state should strive always, in their respective spheres, to fashion their future conduct after the highest examples that their past affords. Thus, men of Athens, at a time when the Spartans were masters of land and sea, and were retaining their hold by means of governors and garrisons upon the country all round Attica, Euboa, Tanagra, Albiosha, Megara, Aegina, Chios, and the other islands, and when Athens possessed neither ships nor walls, you marched forth to Haliardus and again, not many days later, to Corinth, though the Athenians of that day might have borne a heavy grudge against both the Corinthians and the Thebans for the part that they had played in reference to the Decalean War. But they bore no such grudge, far from it, and neither of these actions, Eskines, was taken by them to help benefactors, nor was the prospect before them free from danger. Yet they did not on that account sacrifice those who fled to them for help. For the sake of glory and honor, they were willing to expose themselves to the danger, and it was a right and a noble spirit that inspired their counsels. For the life of all men must end in death, though a man shut himself in a chamber and keep watch. But brave men must ever set themselves to do that which is noble, with their joyful hope for their buckler, and whatsoever God gives must bear it gallantly. Thus did your forefathers, and thus did the elder among yourselves. For, although the Spartans were no friends or benefactors of yours, but had done much grievous wrong to the city, yet when the Thebans, after their victory at Leuctra, attempted to annihilate them, you prevented it, not terrified by the strength or the reputation which the Thebans then enjoyed, nor reckoning up what the men had done to you, for whom you were to face this peril. And thus, as you know, you revealed to all the Hellenes that whatever offenses may be committed against you, though under all other circumstances you show your resentment of them, yet if any danger to life or freedom overtakes the transgressors, you will bear no grudge and make no reckoning. Nor was it in these instances only that you were thus disposed. For once more, when the Thebans were appropriating Euboa, you did not look on while it was done. You did not call to mind the wrong which had been done to you in the matter of Oropus by Themison and Theodorus. You helped even these. And it was then that the city for the first time had voluntary triarchs, of whom I was one. But I will not speak of this yet. And although to save the island was itself a noble thing to do, it was yet a nobler thing by far that when their lives and their cities were absolutely in your power, you gave them back, as it was right to do, to the very men who had offended against you, and made no reckoning, when such trust had been placed in you, of the wrongs which you had suffered. 
I pass by the innumerable instances which I might give, battles at sea, expeditions by land or campaigns, both long ago and now in our day, in all of which the object of the city has been to defend the freedom and safety of the other Hellenic peoples. And so, when in all these striking examples I had beheld the city ever ready to strive in defense of the interests of others, what was I likely to bid her do? What action was I likely to recommend to her, when the debate to some extent concerned her own interests? Why, you would say, to remember her grudge against those who wanted deliverance, and to look for excuses for sacrificing everything? And who would not have been justified in putting me to death if I had attempted to bring shame upon the city's high traditions, though it were only by word? The deed itself you would never have done, I know full well, for had you desired to do it, what was there to hinder you? Were you not free so to act? Had you not these men here to propose it? I wish now to return to the next in succession of my political acts, and here again you must ask yourselves, what was the best thing for the city? For, men of Athens, when I saw that your navy was breaking up, and that, while the rich were obtaining exemption on the strength of small payments, citizens of moderate or small means were losing all that they had, and further, that in consequence of these things the city was always missing her opportunities, I enacted a law in accordance with which I compelled the former, the rich, to do their duty fairly. I put an end to the injustice done to the poor, and, what was the greatest service of all to the state, I caused our preparations to be made in time. When I was indicted for this, I appeared before you at the ensuing trial, and was acquitted. The prosecutor failed to obtain the necessary fraction of the votes. But what sums do you think the leaders of the taxation boards, or those who stood second or third, offered me to induce me, if possible, not to enact the law, or at least to let it drop and lie under sworn notice of prosecution. They offered me some so large men of Athens that I should hesitate to mention them to you. It was a natural course for them to take, for under the former laws it was possible for them to divide their obligation between sixteen persons, paying little or nothing themselves, and grinding down their poorer fellow citizens, while by my law each must pay down a sum calculated in proportion to his property, and a man came to be charged with two warships, who had previously been one of sixteen subscribers to a single one, for they used it now to call themselves no longer captains of their ships, but subscribers. Thus there was nothing that they were not willing to give, if only the new plan could be brought to nothing, and they could escape being compelled to do their duty fairly. Demosthenes to the Clerk now read me, first, the decree in accordance with which I had to meet the indictment, and then the lists of those liable under the former law and under my own, respectively. Read. The decree is read. Now produce that noble list. A list is read. Now produce, for a comparison with this, a list under my own law. A list is read. Was this, think you, but a trifling assistance which I rendered to the poor among you? Would the wealthy have spent but a trifling sum to avoid doing their duty fairly? I am proud not only of having refused all compromise upon the measure, not only of having been acquitted when I was indicted, but also of having enacted a law which was beneficial, and of having given proof of it in practice. For throughout the war the armaments were equipped under my law, and no trierarch ever laid the suppliant's branch before you in token of grievance, nor took sanctuary at Munichia. None was imprisoned by the Admiralty Board. No warship was abandoned at sea and lost to the state, or left behind here as unseaworthy. Under the former laws, all these things used to happen. And the reason was that the obligation rested upon the poor, and in consequence there were many cases of inability to discharge it. I transferred the duties of the triarchy from the poor to the rich, and therefore every duty was properly fulfilled. I, and for this very reason, I deserve to receive praise that I always adopted such political measures as brought with them accessions of glory and honor and power to the city. No measure of mine is malicious, harsh, or unprincipled. None is degrading or unworthy of the city. The same spirit will be seen both in my domestic and my international policy. Just as in home affairs I did not set the favor of the rich above the rights of the many, so in international affairs I did not embrace the gifts and the friendship of Philip in preference to the common interests of all the Hellenes. It still remains for me, I suppose, to speak about the proclamation and about my examination. The statement that I acted for the best and that I am loyal to you throughout and eager to do you good service, I have proved, I think, sufficiently by what I have said. At the same time, I am passing over the most important parts of my political life and actions, for I conceive that I ought first to render you in their proper order my arguments in regard to the alleged illegality itself which done, even if I say nothing about the rest of my political acts, I can still rely upon that personal knowledge of them which each of you possesses. 
of the arguments which the prosecutor jumbled together in utter confusion with reference to the laws accompanying his indictment, I am quite certain that you could not follow the greater part, nor could I understand them myself, but I will simply address you straightforwardly upon the question of right. So far am I from claiming, as he just now slanderously declared, to be free from the liability to render an account, that I admit a lifelong liability to account for every part of my administration and policy. But I do not admit that I am liable for one single day, you hear me, Eskenes, to account for what I have given to the people as a free will offering out of my private estate, nor is anyone else so liable, not even if he is one of the nine archons. What law is so replete with injustice and churlishness that when a man has made a present out of his private property and then an act of generosity and munificence, it deprives him of the gratitude due to him, hails him before a court of disingenuous critics, and sets them to audit accounts of sums which he himself has given? There is no such law. If the prosecutor asserts that there is, let him produce it, and I will resign myself and say no more. But the law does not exist, men of Athens, and this is nothing but an informer's trick on the part of Aeschines, who, because I was controller of the festival fund when I made this donation, says, quote, Tessaphon proposed a vote of thanks to him when he was still liable to account, end quote. The vote of thanks was not for any of the things for which I was liable to account. It was for my voluntary gift, and your charge is a misrepresentation. Yes, you say, but you were also a commissioner of fortifications. I was, and thanks were rightly accorded me on the very ground that, instead of charging the sums which I spent, I made a present of them. A statement of account, it is true, calls for an audit and scrutineers, but a free gift deserves gratitude and thanks, and that is why the defendant proposed this motion in my favor. That this principle is not merely laid down in the laws, or rooted in your national character, I should have no difficulty in proving by many instances. Nausicles, to begin with, has often been crowned by you, while general, for sacrifices he had made from his private funds, again when Diotimus gave the shields and Charidamus afterwards, they were crowned, and again Neoptolemus here, while still the rector of many public works, has received honors for his voluntary gifts. It would really be too bad if anyone who held any office must either be debarred thereby from making a present to the state, or else, instead of receiving due gratitude, must submit accounts of the sums given. To prove the truth of my statements, Demosthenes to the clerk, Take and read the actual decrees which were passed in honor of these persons. Read. Two decrees are read. Each of these persons, Eskines, was accountable as regards the office which he held, but not as regards the services for which he was crowned. Nor am I, therefore, for I presume that I have the same rights as others with reference to the same matters. I made a voluntary gift. For this I receive thanks, for I am not liable to account for what I gave. I was holding office, true, and I have rendered an account of my official expenditure, but not of what I gave voluntarily. Ah, but I exercised my office iniquitously. What? And you were there, when the auditors brought me before them, and did not accuse me. Now that the court may see that the prosecutor himself bears me witness that I was crowned for services of which I was not liable to render an account, Demosthenes to the clerk. Take and read the decree which was proposed, in my honor, in its entirety. Demosthenes to the jury. The points which he has omitted to indict in the council's resolution will show that the charges which he does make are deliberate misrepresentations. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read. The decree is read. My donations, then, were these, of which you have not made one the subject of indictment. It is the reward for these which the council states to be my due that you attack. You admit that it was legal to accept the gifts offered, and you indict as illegal the return of gratitude for them. In heaven's name, what must the perfect scoundrel, the really heaven-detested, malignant being be like? Must he not be a man like this? But as regards the proclamation in the theater, I pass by the fact that ten thousand persons have been thus proclaimed on ten thousand different occasions, and that my own name has often been so proclaimed before. But in heaven's name, Eskines, are you so perverse and stupid that you cannot grasp the fact that the recipient of the crown feels the same pride wherever the crown is proclaimed, and that it is for the benefit of those who confer it that the proclamation is made in the theater, for those who here are stimulated to do good service to the state, and commend those who return gratitude for such service even more than they commend the recipient of the crown. That is why the city has enacted this law. Demosthenes to the clerk. Take the law itself and read it. The law is read. Do you hear, Eskines, the plain words of the law? Quote, 
except such as the people or the council shall resolve so to proclaim, but let these be proclaimed. End quote. Why, wretched man, do you lay this dishonest charge? Why do you invent false arguments? Why do you not take Halbor to cure you? What? Are you not ashamed to bring a case founded upon envy, not upon any crime, to alter some of the laws and to leave out parts of others, when they ought surely in justice to be read entire to those who have sworn to give their votes in accordance with the laws? And then, while you act in this way, you enumerate the qualities which should be found in a friend of the people, as if you had contracted for a statue, and discovered on receiving it that it had not the features required by the contract or as if a friend of the people was known by a definition, and not by his works and his political measures. And you shout out expressions, proper and improper, like a reveler on a cart, expressions which apply to you in your house, not to me. I will add this also, men of Athens. The difference between abuse and accusation is, I imagine, that an accusation is founded upon crimes, for which the penalties are assigned by law. Abuse upon such slanders as their own character leads enemies to utter about one another, and I conceive that our forefathers built these courts of law, not that we might assemble you here and revile one another with improper expressions suggested by our adversary's private life, but that we might convict anyone who happens to have committed some crime against the state. Aeschines knew this as well as I, and yet he chose to make a ribald attack instead of an accusation. At the same time, it is not fair that he should go off without getting as much as he gives, even in this respect, and when I have asked him one question, I will at once proceed to the attack. Are we to call you Aeschines the enemy of the state, or of myself? Of myself, of course. What? And when you might have exacted the penalty from me on behalf of your fellow countrymen, According to the laws, at public examinations, by indictment, by all other forms of trial, did you always omit to do so? And yet today, when I am unassailable upon every ground, on the ground of law, of lapse of time, of the statutable limit, of the many previous trials which I have undergone upon every charge, without having once been convicted of any crime against you to this day, and when the city must necessarily share to a greater or a smaller degree in the glory of acts which were really the acts of the people, have you confronted me upon such an issue as this? Take care lest, while you profess to be my enemy, you prove to be the enemy of your fellow countrymen. End of section 26. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 27 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Part 3. Since then I have shown you all what is the vote which religion and justice demand of you, I am now obliged, it would seem, by the slanders which he has uttered, though I am no lover of abuse, to reply to his many falsehoods by saying just what is absolutely necessary about himself, and showing who he is, and whence he is sprung, that he so lightly begins to use bad language, pulling to pieces certain expressions of mine, when he has himself used expressions which any respectable man would have shrunk from uttering. For if the accuser was Eacus or Rhadamantus or Minos, instead of a scandal-monger, an old hand in the marketplace, a pestilent clerk, I do not believe that he would have spoken thus, or produced such a stock of ponderous phrases, crying aloud as if he were acting a tragedy, quote, O earth and sun and virtue, end quote, and the like, or again invoking, quote, wit and culture, by which things noble and base are discerned apart, end quote, for of course you heard him speaking in this way. Scum of the earth, what have you or yours to do with virtue? How should you discern what is noble and what is not? Where and how did you get your qualification to do so? What right have you to mention culture anywhere? A man of genuine culture would not only never have asserted such a thing of himself, but would have blushed to hear another do so, and those who, like you, fall far short of it, but are tactless enough to claim it, succeed only in causing distress to their hearers when they speak not in seeming to be what they profess. But though I am not at a loss to know what to say about you and yours, I am at a loss to know what to mention first. 
Shall I tell first how your father, Tromes, was a slave in the house of Elpius, who kept an elementary school near the temple of Theseus, and how he wore shackles at a wooden halter? Or how your mother, by celebrating her daylight nuptials in her hut near the shrine of the hero of the Lancet, was enabled to rear you, her beautiful statue, the prince of third-rate actors? But these things are known to all without my telling them. Shall I tell how Formio, the ship's piper, the slave of Dion of Feari, raised her up out of this noble profession but before god and every heavenly power i shudder lest in using expressions which are fitly applied to you i may be thought to have chosen a subject upon which it ill befits myself to speak so i'll pass this by and will begin with the acts of his own life for they were not like any chance actions but such as the people curses for only lately lately do i say only yesterday or the day before did he become at once an Athenian and an orator, and by the addition of two syllables converted his father from Tromes into a Tromedus, and gave his mother the imposing name of Glaucothea, when every one knows that she used to be called Empusa, a name which was obviously given her because there was nothing that she would not do or have done to her, for how else should she have acquired it? Yet, in spite of this, you are of so ungrateful and villainous a nature that though, thanks to your countrymen, you have risen from slavery to freedom, and from poverty to wealth, far from feeling gratitude to them, you devote your political activity to working against them as a hireling. I will pass over every other case in which there is any room for the contention that he has spoken in the interests of the city, and will remind you of the acts which he has manifestly proved to have done for the good of her enemies. Which of you has not heard of Antiphon, who was struck off the list of citizens, and came into the city in pursuance of a promise to Philip that he would burn the dockyards? I found him concealed in Piraeus, and brought him before the assembly. But the malignant Aeschines shouted at the top of his voice that it was atrocious of me, in a democratic country, to insult a citizen who had met with misfortune, and to go to men's houses without a decree, and he obtained his release. And unless the council of Areopagus had taken notice of the matter, and, seeing the inopportuneness of the ignorance which you had shown, had made a further search for the man, and arrested him, and brought him before you again, a man of that character would have been snatched out of your hands, and would have evaded punishment, and been sent out of the country by this pompous orator. As it was, you tortured and executed him, and so ought you also to have treated Aeschines. The council of Areopagus knew the part which he had played in this affair, and for this reason, when, owing to the same ignorance which so often leads you to sacrifice the public interests, you elected him to advocate your claims in regard to the temple of Delos, the council, since you had appointed it to assist you, and entrusted it with full authority to act in the matter, immediately rejected Aeschines as a traitor, and committed the case to Hyperides. When the council took this step, the members took their votes from the altar, and not one vote was given for this abominable man. To prove what I say is true, Demosthenes to the clerk. Call the witnesses who testified to it. The witnesses are called. Thus, when the council rejected him from the office of advocate and committed the case to another, it was declared at the same time that he was a traitor who wished you ill. Such was one of the public appearances of this fine fellow, and such its character. So like the acts with which he charges me, is it not? Now recall a second, for when Philip sent Pithon of Byzantium, and with him envoys from all his allies, in the hope of putting the city to shame and showing her to be in the wrong, I would not give way before the torrent of insolent rhetoric which Pithon poured out upon you, but rose and contradicted him, and would not betray the city's rights, but prove the iniquity of Philip's actions so manifestly that even his own allies rose up and admitted it. But Aeschines supported Pithon. He gave testimony in opposition to his country, and that testimony false. Nor was this sufficient for him, for again after this he was detected going to meet Anaxinus the spy in the house of Thrasin. But surely one who met the emissary of the enemy alone and conferred with him must himself have been already a born spy and enemy of his country. To prove the truth of what I say, Demosthenes to the clerk, call the witnesses to these facts. The witnesses are called. There are still an infinite number of things which I might relate of him, but I will pass them over, for the truth is something like this. I could still point to many instances in which he was found to be serving our enemies during that period, and showing a spite against me. But you do not store such things up in careful remembrance, to visit them with the indignation which they deserve. But, following a bad custom, you have given great freedom to anyone who wishes to trip up the proposer of any advantageous measure by dishonest charges bartering, as you do, the advantage of the state for the pleasure and gratification which you derive from invective. 
and so it is always easier and safer to be a hireling in the service of the enemy than a statesman who has chosen to defend your cause. To cooperate with Philip before we were openly at war with him was, I call earth and heaven to witness, atrocious enough. How could it be otherwise, against his own country? Nevertheless, concede him this, if you will, concede him this. But when the corn ships had been openly plundered, and the Chersonese was being ravaged, and the man was on the march against Attica, when the position of affairs was no longer in doubt, and war had begun, what action did this malignant mouther of verses ever do for your good? He can point to none. There is not a single decree, small or great, with reference to the interests of the city, standing in the name of Eschines. If he asserts that there is, let him produce it in the time allotted to me. But no such decree exists. In that case, however, only two alternatives are possible. Either he had no fault to find at the time with my policy, and therefore made no proposal contrary to it, or else he was seeking the advantage of the enemy, and therefore refrained from bringing forward any policy better than mine. Did he then abstain from speaking, as he abstained from proposing any motion, when any mischief was to be done? On the contrary, no one else had a chance of speaking. But though apparently the city could endure everything else, and he could do everything else unobserved, there was one final deed which was the culmination of all that he had done before. Upon this he expended all that multitude of words, as he went through the decrees relating to the Amphysians in the hope of distorting the truth. But the truth cannot be distorted. It is impossible. Never will you wash away the stain of your actions there. You will not say enough for that. I call upon the gods and goddesses who protect this land of Attica, in the presence of you all, men of Athens, and upon Apollo of Pitho, the paternal deity of this city, and I pray to them all, that if I should speak the truth to you, if I spoke it at that very time without delay, in the presence of the people, when first I saw this abominable man setting his hand to the business, for I knew it, I knew it at once, that then they may give me good fortune and life. But if, to gratify my hatred or any private quarrel, I am now bringing a false accusation against this man, then they may take from me the fruition of every blessing. Why have I uttered this imprecation with such vehemence and earnestness? Because, although I have documents lying in the public archives by which I will prove the facts clearly, although I know that you remember what was done, I have still the fear that he may be thought too insignificant a man to have done all the evil which he has wrought, as indeed happened before, when he caused the ruin of the unhappy Phocians by the false report which he brought home. For the war at Amphisa, which was the cause of Philip's coming to Elatea, and of one being chosen commander of the Amphictyons who overthrew the fortunes of the Hellenes, he it is who helped to get it up. He, in his sole person, is to blame for disasters to which no equal can be found. I protested at the time, and cried out before the assembly, quote, You are bringing war into Attica, Aeschines, an Amphictyonic war. End quote. But a packed group of his supporters refused to let me speak, while the rest were amazed, and imagined that I was bringing a baseless charge against him out of personal animosity. But what the true nature of these proceedings was, men of Athens, why this plan was contrived and how it was executed, you must hear from me today, since you were prevented from doing so at the time. You will behold a business cunningly organized, you will advance greatly in your knowledge of public affairs, and you will see what cleverness there was in Philip. Philip had no prospect of seeing the end of the war with you, or ridding himself of it, unless he could make the Thebans and Thessalians enemies of Athens, for although the war was being wretchedly and inefficiently conducted by your generals, he was nevertheless suffering infinite damage from the war itself and from the freebooters. The exportation of the produce of his country and the importation of what he needed were both impossible. Moreover, he was not at that time superior to you at sea, nor could he reach Attica if the Thessalians would not follow him, or the Thebans give him a passage through their country. And although he was overcoming in the field the generals whom you sent out, such as they were, for of this I say nothing, he found himself suffering from the geographical conditions themselves, and from the nature of the resources which either side possessed. Now if he tried to encourage either the Thessalians or the Thebans to march against you in order to further his own quarrel, no one, he thought, would pay any attention to him, but if he adopted their own common grounds of action and were chosen commander, he hoped to find it easier to deceive or to persuade them, as the case might be. What then does he do? He attempts, and observe with what skill, to stir up an Amphictyonic war, and a disturbance in connection with the meaning of the council, for he thought that they would at once find that they needed his help to deal with these. 
Now, if one of his own or his allies' representatives on the council brought the matter forward, he thought that both the Thebans and the Thessalians would regard the proceeding with suspicion, and that all would be on their guard. But if it was an Athenian sent by you, his adversaries that did so would easily escape detection, as, in fact, happened. How then did he manage this? He hired Aeschines. No one, I suppose, either realized beforehand what was going on or guarded against it. That is how such affairs are usually conducted here. Aeschines was nominated a delegate to the council. Three or four people held up their hands for him, and he was declared elected. But when, bearing with him the prestige of this city, he reached the Amphictyons, he dismissed and closed his eyes to all other considerations, and proceeded to perform the task for which he had been hired. He composed and recited a story, in attractive language, of the way in which the Syrian territory had come to be dedicated. And with this he persuaded the members of the council, who were unused to rhetoric and did not foresee what was about to happen, that they should resolve to make the circuit of the territory, which the Amphysians said they were cultivating because it was their own, while he alleged that it was part of the consecrated land. The Locrians were not bringing any suit against us, or taking any such action as, in order to justify himself, he now falsely alleges. You may know this from the following consideration. It was clearly impossible for the Locrians to bring a suit against Athens to an actual issue without summoning us. Who then served the summons upon us? Before what authority was it served? Tell us who knows. Point to him. You cannot do so. It was a hollow and a false pretext of which you thus made a wrongful use. While the Invictions were making the circuit of the territory in accordance with Aeschines' suggestion, the Locrians fell upon them and came near to shooting them all down with their spears. Some of the members of the council they even carried off with them, and now that complaints and hostilities have been stirred up against the Amphysians in consequence of these proceedings, the command was first held by Catiphus, and his force was drawn from the Amphictyonic powers alone. But since some did not come, and those who came did nothing, the men who had been suborned for the purpose, villagers of long standing, chosen from the Thessalians and from the traders in other states, took steps with a view to entrusting the affair to Philip, as commander, at the meeting of the next council. They had adopted arguments of a persuasive kind. Either, they said, the Amphictyons must themselves contribute funds, maintain mercenaries, and find those who refuse to do so, or they must elect Philip. To make a long story short, the result was that Philip was appointed, and immediately afterwards, having collected a force and crossed the pass, ostensibly on his way to the territory of Syria, he bids a long farewell to the Syrians and the Locrians, and seizes Elatea. Now, if the Thebans had not changed their policy at once upon seeing this, and joined us, the trouble would have descended upon the city in full force, like a torrent in winter. As it was, the Thebans checked him for the moment, chiefly, men of Athens, through the goodwill of some heavenly power towards us but secondarily, so far as it lay in one man's power, through me also. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now give me the decrees in question, and the dates of each proceeding. Demosthenes to the jury. That you may know what trouble this abominable creature stirred up, unpunished. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read me the decrees. The decrees of the Amphictyons are read. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read the dates of these proceedings. Demosthenes to the jury. They are the dates at which Aeschines was delegate to the council. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read. The dates are read. Now give me the letter which Philip sent to his allies in the Peloponnese when the Thebans failed to obey his summons. For from this, too, you may clearly see that he concealed the real reason for his action, the fact that he was taking measures against Hellas and the Thebans and yourselves, and pretended to represent the common cause and the will of the Amphictyons. And the man who provided him with all these occasions and pretexts was Aeschines. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read. Philip's letter is read. You see that he avoids the mention of his own reasons for action, and takes refuge in those provided by the Amphictyons. Who was it then that helped him to prepare such a case? Who put such pretexts at his disposal? Who is most to blame for the disasters that have taken place? Is it not Aeschines? And so, men of Athens, you must not go about saying that Hellas has suffered such things as these at the hands of one man. I call earth and heaven to witness that it was at the hands, not of one man, but of many villains in each state. And of these, Aeschines is one. And, had I to speak the truth without any reserve, I should not hesitate to describe him as the incarnate curse of all alike, men, regions, or cities, that have been ruined since then. For he who supplied the seed is responsible for the crop. I wonder that you did not turn away your eyes at the very sight of him, but a cloud of darkness seems to hang between you and the truth.
End of section 27. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 28 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Serling. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown. Part 4. I find that in dealing with the measures taken by Aeschines for the injury of his country, I have reached the time when I must speak of my own statesmanship in opposition to these measures, and it is fair that you should listen to this for many reasons, but above all because it will be a shameful thing if, when I have faced the actual realities of hard work for you, you will not even suffer the story of them to be told. For when I saw the Thebans, and, I may almost say, yourselves as well, being led by the corrupt partisans of Philip in either state to overlook, without taking a single precaution against it, the thing which was really dangerous to both peoples and needed their utmost watchfulness, the unhindered growth of Philip's power, while, on the contrary, you were quite ready to entertain ill-feeling and to quarrel with one another, I kept unceasing watch to prevent this nor did I rely only on my own judgment in thinking that this was what your interest required. I knew that Aristophan, and afterwards Eubulus, always wished to bring about this friendly union, and that, often as they opposed one another in other matters, they always agreed in this. Cunning fox! While they lived, you hung about them and flattered them, yet now that they are dead, you do not see that you are attacking them. For your censure of my policy in regard to Thebes is far more a denunciation of them than of me, since they are before me in approving of that alliance. But I return to my previous point, that it was when Aeschines had brought about the war at Amphisa, and the others, his accomplices, had effectually helped him to create the ill-feeling against the Thebans, that Philip marched against us. For it was to render this possible that their attempt to throw the two cities into collision was made, and had we not roused ourselves a little before it was too late, we should never have been able to regain the lost ground. To such a length had these men carried matters. What the relations between the two peoples already were, you will know when you have heard these decrees and replies. Demosthenes to the clerk. Take these and read them. The decrees are read. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read the replies. The replies are read. Having established such relations between the cities through the agency of these men, and being elated by these decrees and replies, Philip came with his army and seized Elatea, thinking that under no circumstances whatever should we and the Thebans join in unison after this. And though the commotion which followed in the city is known to you all, let me relate to you briefly just the bare facts. It was evening, and one had come to the Prytanes with the news that Elatea had been taken. Upon this they rose up from supper without delay. Some of them drove the occupants out of the booths in the marketplace and set fire to the wicker work. Others sent for the generals and summoned the trumpeter, and the city was full of commotion. On the morrow, at break of day, the Prytany summoned the council to the council chamber, while you made your way to the assembly. And before the council had transacted its business and passed its draft resolution, the whole people was seated on the hillside. And now, when the council had arrived, the Prytanes had reported the intelligence which they had received, and had brought forward the messenger, and he had made his statement. The herald proceeded to ask, Who wishes to speak? But no one came forward. And though the herald repeated the question many times, still no one rose. Though all the generals were present, and all the orators, and the voice of their country was calling for some one to speak for her deliverance. For the voice of the herald, uttered in accordance with the laws, is rightly to be regarded as the common voice of our country. And yet, if it was for those to come forward who wished for the deliverance of the city, all of you and all the other Athenians would have risen and proceeded to the platform, for I am certain that you all wished for her deliverance. If it was for the wealthiest, the three hundred would have risen. And if it was for those who had both these qualifications, loyalty to the city and wealth, then those would have risen, who subsequently made those large donations. For it was loyalty and wealth that led them to do so. But that crisis in that day called, it seems, not merely for a man of loyalty and wealth, but for one who had also followed the course of events closely from the first, and had come to a true conclusion as to the motive and the aim with which Philip was acting as he was. 
for no one who was unacquainted with these and had not scrutinized them from an early period was any the more likely for all his loyalty and wealth to know what should be done or to be able to advise you the man who was needed was found that day in me i came forward and addressed you in words which i ask you to listen to with attention for two reasons first because i would have you realize that i was the only orator or politician who did not desert his post as a loyal citizen in the hour of danger but was found there speaking and proposing what your need required in the midst of terror and secondly because by the expenditure of a small amount of time you will be far better qualified for the future in the whole art of political administration my words then were these quote, those who were unduly disturbed by the idea that philip can count upon the support of thebes do not i think understand the present situation for i am quite sure that if this were so we should have heard of his being not at Alatea, but on our own borders at the same time i understand quite well that he has come to prepare the way for himself at thebes listen i said while i tell you the true state of affairs philip already has at his disposal the thebans whom he could win over either by bribery or by deception and those who have resisted him from the front and are opposing him now he has no chance of winning what then is his design and object in seizing elatea he wishes by making a display of force in their neighborhood and bringing up his army to encourage and embolden his own friends and to strike terror into his enemies that so they may either concede out of terror what they now refuse or may be compelled now i said if we make up our minds at the present moment to remember any ill-natured action which the thebans may have done us and to distrust them on the assumption that they are on the side of our enemies we shall be doing in the first place just what philip would pray for and further i am afraid that his present opponents may then welcome him that all may philippize with one consent and that he and they may march to attica together if however you follow my advice and give your minds to the problem before us instead of to the contentious criticism of anything that i may say i believe that i shall be able to win your approval for my proposals and to dispel the danger which threatens the city what then must you do you must first moderate your present alarm and then change your attitude and be alarmed all of you for the thebans they are far more within the reach of disaster than we it is they whom the danger threatens first secondly those who are of a military age with the cavalry must march to eleusis and let every one see that you yourselves are in arms in order that those who sympathize with you in thebes may be enabled to speak in defense of the right with the same freedom that their opponents enjoy when they see that just as those who are trying to sell their country to philip have a force ready to help them at Latia, so those who would struggle for freedom have you ready at hand to help them and to go to their aid if any one attacks them next i bid you elect ten envoys and give them full authority with the generals to decide the time of their own journey to thebes and to order the march of the troops but when the envoys arrive in thebes how do i advise that they should handle the matter i ask your special attention to this they must require nothing of the thebans to do so at such a moment would be shameful but they must undertake that we will go to their aid if they bid us do so on the ground that they are in extreme peril and that we foresee the future better than they in order that if they accept our offer and take our advice we may have secured our object and our action may wear an aspect worthy of this city or if after all we are unsuccessful the thebans may have themselves to blame for any mistakes which they now make while we shall have done nothing disgraceful or ignoble End quote. when i had spoken these words and others in the same strain i left the platform all joined in commending these proposals no one said a word in opposition and i did not speak thus and then fail to move a motion nor move a motion and then fail to serve as envoy nor serve as envoy and then fail to persuade the thebans i carried the matter through in person from beginning to end and gave myself up unreservedly to meet the dangers which encompassed the city demosthenes to the clerk bring me the resolution which was then passed but now Eskenes, how would you have me describe your part and how mine that day shall i call myself as you would call me by way of abuse and disparagement battleus and you no ordinary hero even but a real stage hero Crisphontes or creon or the character which you cruelly murdered at Calidus, enemaus then i battleus of paeania prove myself of more value to my country in that crisis than onemaus of cothacide in fact you were of no service on any occasion while i played the part which became a good citizen throughout demosthenes to the clerk 
Read this decree. The decree of Demosthenes is read. This was the first step towards our new relations with Thebes and the beginning of a settlement. Up to this time, the cities had been inveigled into mutual hostility, hatred, and mistrust by these men. But this decree caused the peril that encompassed the city to pass away like a cloud. It was for an honest citizen, if he had any better plan than mine, to make it public at the time, instead of attacking me now. The true counselor and the dishonest accuser, unlike as they are in everything, differ most of all in this. The one who declares his opinion before the event and freely surrenders himself as responsible to those who follow his advice, to fortune, to circumstances, to anyone. The other is silent when he ought to speak, and then carps at anything untoward that may happen. That crisis, as I have said, was the opportunity for a man who cared for his country, the opportunity for honest speaking. But so much further than I need will I go, that if anyone who can now point to any better course, or any course at all except that which I chose, I admit my guilt. If anyone has discovered any course today which would have been our advantage had we followed it at the time, I admit that it ought not to have escaped me. But if there neither is nor was such a possibility, if even now, even today, no one can mention any such course, what was the counselor of the people to do? Had he not to choose the best of the plans which suggested themselves and were feasible? This I did. For the herald asked the question, Eskines, who wishes to speak? Not, who wishes to bring accusations about the past? Nor, who wishes to guarantee the future? And while you sat speechless in the assembly throughout that period, I came forward and spoke. Since, however, you did not do so then, at least inform us now and tell us what words, which should have been upon my lips, were left unspoken. What precious opportunity offered to the city was left unused by me? What alliance was there, what course of action to which I ought, by preference, to have guided my countrymen? But with all mankind, the past is always dismissed from consideration and no one under any circumstances proposes to deliberate about it. It is the future or the present that make their call upon a statesman's duty. Now at that time the danger was partly in the future and partly already present, and instead of cavilling disingenuously at the results, consider the principle of my policy under such circumstances, for in everything the final issue falls out as heaven wills, but the principle which he follows itself reveals the mind of the statesman. Do not, therefore, count it a crime on my part that Philip proved victorious in battle. The issue of that event lay with God, not with me. But show me that I did not adopt every expedient that was possible, so far as human reason could calculate, that I did not carry out my plan honestly and diligently, with exertions greater than my strength could bear, or that the policy which I initiated was not honorable and worthy of Athens, and indeed necessary, and then denounce me but not before. But if the thunderbolt or the storm which fell has proved too mighty not only for us but for all the other Hellenes, what are we to do? It is as though a ship owner who had done all that he could to ensure safety, and had equipped the ship with all that he thought would enable her to escape destruction, and had then met with a tempest in which the tackling had been strained or even broken to pieces, were to be held responsible for the wreck of the vessel. Why, he would say, I was not steering the ship, just as I was not the general. I had no power over fortune. She had power over everything. But consider and observe this point. If it was fated that we should fare as we did, even when we had the Thebans to help us in the struggle, what must we have expected if we had not had even them for our allies, but they had joined Philip? And this was the object for which Philip employed every tone that he could command. And if, when the battle took place, as it did, three days' march from Attica, the city was encompassed by such peril and terror, what should we have had to expect if this same disaster had occurred anywhere within the borders of our own country? Do you realize that, as it was, a single day and a second and a third gave us the power to rally, to collect our forces, to take a breath, to do much for the deliverance of the city, but that had it been otherwise? It is not well, however, to speak of things which we have not had to experience, thanks to the good will of one of the gods, and to the protection which the city obtained for herself in this alliance, which you denounce. The whole of this long argument, gentlemen of the jury, is addressed to yourselves and to the circle of listeners outside the bar, for to this despicable man it would have been enough to address a short, plain sentence. If to you alone, Eskines, the future was clear, before it came, 
You should have given warning when the city was deliberating upon the subject, but if you had no such foreknowledge, you have the same ignorance to answer for as others. Why then should you make these charges against me, any more than I against you? For I have been a better citizen than you with regard to this very matter of which I am speaking. I am not as yet talking of anything else. Just in so far as I gave myself up to the policy which all thought expedient, neither shrinking from nor regarding any personal risk, while you neither offered any better proposals than mine, for then they would not have followed mine, nor yet made yourself useful in advancing mine in any way, what the most worthless of men, the bitterest enemy of the city, would do, you are found to have done, when all was over, and at the same time as the irreconcilable enemies of the city, Aristratus and Naxus, Aristolios and Thasos, are bringing the friends of Athens to trial Aeschines, in Athens itself, is accusing Demosthenes, a surely one who treasured up the misfortunes of the Hellenes that he might win glory for them for himself, deserved to perish rather than to stand as the accuser of another, and one who has profited by the very same crisis as the enemies of the city cannot possibly be loyal to his country. You prove it, moreover, by the life you live, the actions you do, the measures you take, and the measures, too, that you do not take. Is anything being done which seems advantageous to the city? Aeschines is speechless. Has any obstruction, any untoward event occurred? There you find Aeschines, like a rupture or a sprain, which wakes into life so soon as any trouble overtakes the body. But since he bears so hardly upon the results, I desire to say what may even be a paradox, and let no one in the name of heaven be amazed at the length to which I go, but give a kindly consideration to what I say. Even if what was to come was plain to all beforehand, even if all foreknew it, even if you, Iskines, had been crying with a loud voice and warning and protestation, you who uttered not so much as a sound, even then, I say, it was not right for the city to abandon her course if she had any regard for her fame, or for our forefathers, or for the ages to come. As it is, she is thought, no doubt, to have failed to secure her object, as happens to all like, whenever God wills it. But then, by abandoning in favor of Philip her claim to take the lead of others, she must have incurred the blame of having betrayed them all. Had she surrendered without a struggle those claims in defense of which our forefathers faced every imaginable peril, who would not have cast scorn upon you, Aeschines? Upon you, I say, not, I trust, upon Athens, nor upon me. In God's name, with what faces should we have looked upon those who came to visit the city if events had come round to the conclusion as they now have? If Philip had been chosen as commander and lord of all, and we had stood apart, while the others carried on the struggle to prevent these things, and that, although the city had never yet in time past preferred an inglorious security to the hazardous vindication of a noble cause, what Hellene, what foreigner, does not know that the Thebans and the Spartans, who were powerful still earlier, and the Persian king would all gratefully and gladly have allowed Athens to take what she liked and keep all that was her own, if she would do the bidding of another, and let another take the first place in Hellas? This was not, it appears, the tradition of the Athenians. It was not tolerable. It was not in their nature. From the beginning of time, no one had ever yet succeeded in persuading the city to throw in her lot with those who were strong but unrighteous in their dealings, and to enjoy the security of servitude. Throughout all time, she has maintained her perilous struggle for preeminence, honor, and glory. And this policy you look upon as so lofty, so proper to your own national character, that of your forefathers also, it is those who have acted thus that you praise most highly. And naturally, for who would not admire the courage of those men who do not fear to leave their land and their city and to embark upon their ships, that they might not do the bidding of another? Who chose for their general Themistocles, who had counseled them thus, and stoned Circeus to death, when he gave his voice for submission to a master's orders? And not him alone, but for your wives stoned his wife also to death. For the Athenians of that day did not look for a narrator or a general who would enable them to live in happy servitude. They cared not to live at all, unless they might live in freedom. For every one of them felt that he had come into being, not for his father and his mother alone, but also for his country. And wherein lies the difference? He who thinks he was born for his parents alone waits the death which destiny assigns him in the course of nature. But he who thinks he was born for his country also will be willing to die, that he may not see her in bondage. 
and will look upon the outrages and the indignities that he must needs bear in a city that is in bondage as more to be dreaded than death. Now were I attempting to argue that I induced you to show a spirit worthy of your forefathers, there is not a man who might not rebuke me with good reason. But in fact, I am declaring that such principles as these are your own. I am showing that before my time in the city displayed this spirit, though I claim that I too have had some share as your servant in carrying out your policy in detail. But in denouncing the policy as a whole, in bidding you be harsh with me as one who has brought terrors and dangers upon the city, the prosecutor, in his eagerness to deprive me of my distinction at the present moment, is trying to rob you of praises that will last throughout all time. For if you condemn the defendant on the ground that my policy was not for the best, men will think that your own judgment has been wrong, and that it was not through the unkindness of fortune that you suffered what befell you. But it cannot, it cannot be that you were wrong, men of Athens, when you took upon you the struggle for freedom and deliverance. No, by those who at Marathon bore the brunt of the peril, our forefathers. No, by those who at Platea drew up their battle line, by those at Salamis, by those who off Artemisium fought the fight at sea, by the many who lie in the sepulchres where the people laid them, brave men, all alike deemed worthy by their country, Aeschines, of the same honor and the same obsequies, not the successful or the victorious alone, and she acted justly. For all these have done that which it was the duty of brave men to do, but their fortune has been that which heaven assigned to each. Accursed, pouring pedant, if you in your anxiety to deprive me of the honor and the kindness shown to be by my countrymen, recounted trophies and battles and deeds of long ago, and of which of them did this present trial demand the mention, what spirit was I to take upon me when I mounted the platform, I who came to advise the city how she would maintain her preeminence? Tell me, third-rate actor, the spirit of one who would propose things unworthy of this people. I should indeed have deserved to die, for you too, men of Athens, are not to judge the private suits and public in the same spirit. The business transactions of everyday life must be viewed in the light of the special law and practice associated with each but the public policy of statesmen must be judged by the principles that your forefathers set before them, and if you believe that you should act worthily of them, then, whenever you come into court to try a public suit, each of you must imagine that with his staff and his ticket there is entrusted to him also the spirit of his country. But I have entered upon the subject of your forefathers' achievements, and have passed over certain decrees and transactions. I desire, therefore, to return to the point from which I digressed. When we came to Thebes, we found envoys there from Philip, and from the Thessalians and his other allies, our friends in terror, his full of confidence. And to show you that I am not saying this now to suit my own purpose, read the letter which we, your envoys, dispatched without delay. The prosecutor, however, has exercised the art of misrepresentation to so extravagant a degree that he attributes to circumstances, not to me, any satisfactory result that was achieved. But for everything that fell out otherwise, he lays the blame upon me and the fortune that attends me. In his eyes, apparently, I, the counselor and orator, have no share in the credit for what was accomplished as the result of oratory and debate. While I must bear the blame alone for the misfortunes which we suffered in arms, and as a result of generalship. What more brutal, what more damnable misrepresentation can be conceived? Demosthenes to the clerk. Read the letter. The letter is read. When they had convened the assembly, they gave audience to the other side first, on the ground that they occupied the position of allies, and these came forward and delivered the harangues full of the praises of Philip and of accusations against yourselves, recalling everything that you had ever done in opposition to the Thebans. The sum of it all was that they required the Thebans to show their gratitude for the benefits which they had received from Philip, and to exact the penalty for the injuries they had received from you, in whichever way they preferred either by letting them march through their country against you, or by joining them in the invasion of Attica. And they showed, as they thought, that the result of the course which they advised would be that the herds and slaves and other valuables of Attica would find their way into Boeotia, while the result of what, as they alleged, you were about to propose, would be that those of Boeotia would be plundered in consequence of the war. They said much more, but all tending to the same effect. As for our reply, I would give my whole life to tell it to you in detail, but I fear lest, now that those times have gone by, you may feel as if a very deluge had overwhelmed all, 
and may regard anything that is said on the subject as vanity and vexation, but hear at least what we persuaded them to do, and their answer to us. Demosthenes to the clerk. Take this and read it. The answer of the Thebans is read. After this they invited and summoned you. You marched, you went to their aid, and, to pass over the events which intervened, they received you in so friendly a spirit that while their infantry and cavalry were encamped outside the walls, they welcomed your troops into the houses, within the city, among their children and wives, and all that was most precious to them. Three eulogies did the Thebans pronounce upon you before the world that day, and those of the most honorable kind, the first upon your courage, the second upon your righteousness, the third upon your self-control. For when they chose to side with you in the struggle, rather than against you, they judged that your courage was greater, and your requests more righteous than Philip's. And when they placed in your power what they and all men guard most jealously, their children and wives, they showed their confidence in your self-control. In all these points, men of Athens, your conduct proved that their judgment had been correct. For the force came into the city, but no one made a single complaint, not even an unfounded complaint, against you. So virtuously did you conduct yourselves, and twice you fought by their side, in the earliest battles, the battle by the river, and the winter battle, and showed yourselves not only irreproachable, but even admirable in your discipline, your equipment, and your enthusiasm. These things called forth expressions of thanks to you from other states, and sacrifices and processions to the gods from yourselves. And I should like to ask Aeschines whether, when all this was happening, and the city was full of pride and joy and thanksgiving, he joined in the sacrifices and the rejoicing of the multitude, or whether he sat at home, grieving and groaning and angry at the good fortune of his country. If he was present, and was seen in his place with the rest, surely his present action is atrocious, nay, even impious, when he asks you, who have taken an oath by the gods, to vote today that those very things were not excellent, of whose excellence he himself, on that day, made the gods his witnesses. If he was not present, then surely he deserves to die many times, for grieving at the sight of the things which he brought rejoicing to others. Demosthenes to the clerk. Now read these decrees also. The decrees ordering sacrifices are read. Thus we were occupied at the time with sacrifices, while the Thebans were reflecting how they had been saved by our help. And those who, in consequence of my opponents' proceedings, had expected that they would themselves stand in need of help, found themselves, after all, helping others, in consequence of the action that they took upon my advice. But what the tone of Philip's utterance was, and how greatly he was confounded by what had happened, you can learn from his letter, which he sent to the Peloponnese. Demosthenes to the clerk. Take these and read them. Demosthenes to the jury that you may know what was affected by my perseverance, by my travels, by the hardships I endured, by all those decrees of which Aeschines spoke so disparagingly just now. You have had, as you know, many great and famous orators, men of Athens, before my time, Callistratus himself, Aristophan, Cephalus, Thrasybulus, and a vast number of others. Yet not one of these ever gave himself up entirely to the state for any purpose. The mover of a decree would not serve as ambassador, the ambassador would not move the decree. Each left himself, at one and the same time, some respite from work, and some were to lay the blame in case of accidents. Well, someone may say, did you so excel them in force and boldness as to do everything yourself? I did not say that. But so strong was my conviction of the seriousness of the danger that had overtaken the city, that I felt I ought not to give my personal safety any place whatever in my thoughts. It was enough for a man to do his duty, and to leave nothing undone. And I was convinced with regard to myself, foolishly perhaps, but still convinced, that no mover would make a better proposal, no agent would execute it better, no ambassador would be more eager and more honest in his mission than I. For these reasons, I assigned every one of these offices to myself. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read Philip's letters. Philip's letters are read. To this condition, Aeschines, was Philip reduced by my statesmanship. This was the tone of his utterances, though before this he used to threaten the city with many a bold word. For this I was deservedly crowned by those he resembled, and though you were present, you offered no opposition. While Diondas, who indicted the proposer, did not obtain the necessary fraction of the votes. Demosthenes to the clerk. Read me these decrees. 
Demosthenes to the jury, which escaped condemnation, and which Aeschines did not even indict. The decrees are read. These decrees, men of Athens, contain the very same syllables, the very same words, as those which Aristonicus previously employed in his proposal, and which Tesiphon, the defendant, has employed now. And Aeschines neither prosecuted the proposer of them himself, nor supported the person who indicted him. Yet surely, if the charges which he is bringing against me today are true, he would have had a better reason then for prosecuting Demomeles, the proposer of the decree, and Hyperides, than he has for prosecuting Tesiphon. And why? Because Tesiphon can refer you to them, to the decision of the courts, to the fact that Aeschines himself did not accuse them, though they had moved exactly what he has moved now, to the prohibition by law of further prosecution in such cases, and to many other facts, whereas then the case would have been tried on its merits before the defendant had got the advantage of any such precedent. But of course it was impossible then for Aeschines to act as he has acted now, to select out of many periods of time long past, and many decrees, matters which no one either knew or thought would be mentioned today, to misrepresent them, to change the dates, to put false reasons for the actions taken in place of the true, and so appear to have a case. At the time, this was impossible. Every word spoken then must have been spoken with the truth in view, at no distance of time from the events, while you still remembered all the facts and had them practically at your finger's ends. For that reason, he evaded all investigation at the time, and he has come before you now, in the belief, I fancy, that you will make this a contest of oratory, instead of an inquiry into our political careers, that it is upon our eloquence, not upon the interests of the city, that you will decide. End of section 28. Recording by Roger Serling. Section 29 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D.J. Rose. The Public Orations of Demosthenes. Translated by Arthur Wallace Picard. On the Crown, Part 5. Yes, and he ingeniously suggests that you ought to disregard the opinion which you had of each of us when you left your homes and came into court, and that just as, when you draw up an account in the belief that someone has a balance, you nevertheless give way when you find that the counters all disappear and leave nothing over. So now you should give your adhesion to the conclusion which emerges from the argument. Now observe how inherently rotten everything that springs from dishonesty seems to be. By his very use of this ingenious illustration, he has confessed that today, at all events, our respective characters are well established, that I am known to speak for my country's good, and he to speak for Philip. For unless that were your present conception of each of us, he would not have sought to change your view. And further, I shall easily show you that it is not fair of him to ask you to alter this opinion, not by the use of counters, that is not how a political reckoning is made, but by briefly recalling each point to you, and treating you who hear me both as auditors of my account and witnesses to the facts. For that policy of mine, which he denounces, caused the Thebans, instead of joining Philip as all expected them to do in the invasion of our country, to range themselves by our side and stay his progress. It caused the war to take place not in Attica, but on the confines of Boeotia, eighty miles from the city. Instead of our being harried and plundered by freebooters from Euboea, it gave peace to Attica from the side of the sea throughout the war. Instead of Philip's taking Byzantium and becoming master of the Hellespont, it caused the Byzantines to join us in the war against him. Can such achievements, think you, be reckoned up like counters? Are we to cancel them out, rather than provide that they shall be remembered for all time? I need not now add that it fell to others to taste the barbarity which is to be seen in every case in which Philip got any one finally into his power, while you reaped, and quite rightly, the fruits of the generosity which he feigned, while he was bringing within his grasp all that remained. But I pass this over. Nay, I will not even hesitate to say 
that one who wished to review an orator's career straightforwardly and without misrepresentation would not have included in his charges such matters as you just now spoke of, making up illustrations and mimicking words and gestures. Of course, the fortune which befell the Hellenes, surely you see this, was entirely due to my using this word instead of that, or waving my hand in one direction rather than the other. He would have inquired, by reference to the actual facts, what resources and what forces the city had at her command when I entered political life, what I subsequently collected for her when I took control, and what was the condition of our adversaries. Then, if I had diminished our forces, he would have proved that the fault lay at my door. But if I had greatly increased them, he would have abstained from deliberate misrepresentation. But since you have avoided such an inquiry, I will undertake it. And do you gentlemen observe whether my argument is just? The military resources of the city included the islanders, and not all, but only the weakest. For neither Chios, nor Rhodes, nor Corsero was with us. Their contribution in money came to forty-five talents, and these had been collected in advance. Infantry and cavalry, besides our own, we had none. But the circumstance, which was most alarming to us and most favorable to our enemies, was that these men had contrived that all our neighbors should be more inclined to enmity than to friendship, the Megarians, the Thebans, and the Eubians. Such was the position of the city at the time, and what I say admits of no contradiction. Now consider the position of Philip with whom our conflict lay. In the first place, he held absolute sway over his followers, and this for the purposes of war is the greatest of all advantages. Next, his followers had their weapons in their hands always. Then he was well off for money, and did whatever he resolved to do without giving warning of it by decrees or debating about it in public or being put on trial by dishonest accusers or defending himself against indictments for illegality or being bound to render an account to anyone. He was himself absolute master, commander, and lord of all. But I, who was set to oppose him, for this inquiry too it is just to make, what had I under my control? Nothing. For to begin with, the very right to address you, the only right I had, you extended to Philip's hirelings in the same measure as to me. And as often as they defeated me, and this frequently happened, whatever the reason on each occasion, so often you went away leaving a resolution recorded in favor of the enemy. But in spite of all these disadvantages, I won for you the alliance of the Eubians, Achaeans, Corinthians, Thebans, Megarians, Lucadians, and Corsarians, for whom there were collected, apart from their citizen troops, 15,000 mercenaries and 2,000 cavalry. And I instituted a money contribution on as large a scale as I could. But if you refer, Eschines, to what was fair as between ourselves and the Thebans or the Byzantines or the Eubians, if at this time you talk to us of equal shares, you must be ignorant in the first place of the fact that in former days also, out of those ships of war, 300 in all, which fought for the Hellenes, Athens provided 200 and did not think herself unfairly used, or let herself be seen arraigning those who had counseled her action or taking offense at the arrangement. It would have been shameful. No, men saw her rendering thanks to heaven, because when a common peril beset the Hellenes, she had provided double as much as all the rest to secure the deliverance of all. Moreover, it is but a hollow benefit that you are conferring upon your countrymen by your dishonest charges against me. Why do you tell them now what course they ought to have taken? Why did you not propose such a course at the time, for you were in Athens and were present? If it was possible in the midst of those critical times, when we had to accept not what we chose but what circumstances allowed, since there was one at hand bidding against us and ready to welcome those whom we rejected and to pay them into the bargain. But if I am accused today for what I have actually done, what if at the time I had haggled over these details and the other states had gone off and joined Philip and he had become master at once of Euboea and Thebes and Byzantium, what do you think these impious men would then have done? What would they have said? Would they not have declared that the states had been surrendered, that they had been driven away when they wished to be on your side? 
See, they would have said, would they not? He has obtained through the Byzantines the command of the Hellespont and the control of the corn trade of Hellas. And through the Thebans, a trying border war has been brought into Attica. And owing to the pirates who sail from Euboea, the sea has become unnavigable. And much more in addition. A villainous thing, men of Athens, is the dishonest accuser always. Villainous and in every way malignant and fault-finding. I and this miserable creature is a fox by nature that has never done anything honest or gentlemanly. A very tragical ape, a clod-hopping animus, a counterfeit orator. Where is the profit to your country from your cleverness? Do you instruct us now about things that are past? It is as though a doctor, when he was paying his visits to the sick, were to give them no advice or instruction to enable them to become free from their illness. But when one of his patients died and the customary offerings were being paid him, were to explain, as he followed to the tomb, if this man had done such and such things, he would not have died. Crazy fool, do you tell us this now? Nor again will you find that the defeat, if you exult at it, when you ought to groan, accursed man, was determined by anything that was within my control. Consider the question thus. In no place to which I was sent by you as ambassador did I ever come away defeated by the ambassadors of Philip, not from Thessaly, nor from Ambracia, not from the Illyrians, nor from the Thracian princes, not from Byzantium, nor any other place, nor yet, on the last occasion, from Thebes. But every place in which his ambassadors were defeated in argument, he proceeded to attack and subdue by force of arms. Do you then require those places at my hands? Are you not ashamed to jeer at a man as a coward, and in the same breath to require him to prove superior by his own unaided efforts to the army of Philip, and that with no weapons to use but words? For what else was at my disposal? I could not control the spirit of each soldier, or the fortune of the combatants, or the generalship displayed, of which in your perversity you demand an account from me. No, but every investigation that can be made as regards those duties for which an orator should be held responsible, I bid you make. I crave no mercy. And what are those duties? To discern events in their beginnings, to foresee what is coming, and to forewarn others. These things I have done. Again, it is his duty to reduce to the smallest possible compass, wherever he finds them, the slowness, the hesitation, the ignorance, the contentiousness, which are the errors inseparably connected with the constitution of all city-states. While on the other hand, he must stimulate men to unity, friendship, and eagerness to perform their duty. All these things I have done, and no one can discover any dereliction of duty on my part at any time. If one were to ask any person whatever by what means Philip had accomplished the majority of his successes, every one would reply that it was by means of his army, and by giving presents and corrupting those in charge of affairs. Now I had no control or command of the forces. Neither then does the responsibility for anything that was done in that sphere concern me. And further, in the matter of being or not being corrupted by bribes, I have defeated Philip. For just as the bidder has conquered one who accepts his money, if he effects his purchase, so one who refuses to accept it and is not corrupted has conquered the bidder. In all, therefore, in which I am concerned, the city has suffered no defeat. The justification, then, with which I furnished the defendant for such a motion as he proposed with regard to me, consisted, along with many other points, of the facts which I have described and others like them. I will now proceed to that justification which all of you supplied. For immediately after the battle, the people, who knew and had seen all that I did, and now stood in the very midst of the peril and terror, at a moment when it would not have been surprising if the majority had shown some harshness toward me, the people, I say, in the first place carried my proposals for ensuring the safety of the city, and all the measures undertaken for its protection, the disposition of the garrisons, the entrenchments, the funds for the fortifications, were all provided for by decrees which I proposed. And in the second place, when the people chose a corn commissioner out of all Athens, they elected me. Subsequently, all those who were interested in injuring me combined and assailed me with indictments, prosecutions after audit, impeachments, and all such proceedings, 
not in their own names at first, but through the agency of men behind whom they thought they would best be screened against recognition. For you doubtless know and remember that during the early part of that period I was brought to trial every day, and neither the desperation of Sosicles, nor the dishonest misrepresentations of Philocrates, nor the frenzy of Diondus and Melantus, nor any other expedient, was left untried by them against me. And in all these trials, thanks to the gods above all, but secondarily to you and the rest of the Athenians, I was acquitted, and justly. For such a decision is in accordance both with truth and with the credit of jurors who have taken their oath and given a verdict in conformity with it. So whenever I was impeached, and you absolved me, and did not give the prosecutor the necessary fraction of the votes, you were voting that my policy was the best. Whenever I was acquitted upon an indictment, it was a proof that my motion and proposals were according to law. Whenever you set your seal to my accounts at an audit, you confessed in addition that I had acted throughout with uprightness and integrity. And this being so, what epithet was it fitting or just that Tessaphon should apply to my actions? Was it not that which he saw applied by the people and by juries on their oath and ratified by truth in the judgment of all men? Yes, he replies, but Cephalus' boast was a noble one, that he had never been indicted at all. True, and a happy thing also it was for him. But why should one who has often been tried but has never been convicted of crime deserve to incur criticism any the more on that account? Yet in truth, men of Athens, so far as Escanes is concerned, I too can make this noble boast that Cephalus made. For he has never yet preferred or prosecuted any indictment against me. So that by you, at least, Escanes, I am admitted to be no worse a citizen than Cephalus. His want of feeling and his malignity may be seen in many ways, and not least in the remarks which he made about fortune. For my part, I think that as a rule, when one human being reproaches another with his fortune, he is a fool. For when he who thinks himself most prosperous and fancies his fortune most excellent does not know whether it will remain so until the evening, how can it be right to speak of one's fortune or to taunt another with his? But since Aeschines adopts a tone of lofty superiority upon this as upon many other subjects, observe, men of Athens, how much more truthful and more becoming in a human being my own remarks upon Aeschines' fortune will be. I believe that the fortune of this city is good, and I see that the god of Dodona also declares this to you through his oracle. But I think that the prevailing fortune of mankind as a whole today is grievous and terrible. For what man, Hellene or foreigner, has not tasted abundance of evil at this present time? Now the fact that we chose the noblest course, and that we are actually better off than those Hellenes who expected to live in prosperity if they sacrificed us, I ascribe to the good fortune of the city. But in so far as we failed, in so far as everything did not fall out in accordance with our wishes, I consider that the city has received the share which was due to us of the fortune of mankind in general. But my personal fortune, and that of every individual among us, ought, I think, in fairness, to be examined with reference to our personal circumstances. That is my judgment with regard to fortune. And I believe, as I think you also do, that my judgment is correct and just. But Eschines asserts that my personal fortune has more influence than the fortune of the city as a community, the insignificant and evil more than the good and important. How can this be? If, however, you determine at all costs to scrutinize my fortune, Eschines, then compare it with your own. And if you find that mine is better than yours, then cease to revile it. Examine it then from the very beginning. And in heaven's name, let no one condemn me for any want of good taste. For I neither regard one who speaks insultingly of poverty, nor one who prides himself on having been brought up in affluence as a man of sense. But the slanders and misrepresentations of this unfeeling man oblige me to enter upon a discussion of this sort, and I will conduct it with as much moderation as the facts allow. I then, Ascanese, had the advantage as a boy of attending the schools which became my position and of possessing as much as one who is to do nothing ignoble owing to poverty must possess. When I passed out of my boyhood, my life corresponded with my upbringing. I provided choruses and equipped warships. 
I paid the war tax. I neglected none of the paths to distinction in private or public life, but gave my services both to my country and my friends. And when I thought fit to enter public life, the measures which I decided to adopt were of such a character that I have been crowned many times, both by my country and by many other Hellenic peoples, while not even you, my enemies, attempt to say that my choice was not at least an honorable one. Such is the fortune which has accompanied my life. And though I might say much more about it, I refrain from doing so, in my anxiety not to annoy anyone by the expression of my pride. And you, the lofty personage, the despiser of others. What has been your fortune when compared with this? The fortune, thanks to which you were brought up as a boy in the depths of indigence, in close attendance upon the school along with your father, pounding up the ink, sponging down the forms, sweeping the attendance rooms, occupying the position of a menial, not of a free-born boy. Then, when you became a man, you used to read out the books to your mother at her initiations, and help her in the rest of the hocus-pocus by night dressing the initiated in fawn skins, drenching them from the bowl, purifying them and wiping them down with the clay and the bran, and, when they were purified, bidding them stand up and say, The ill is done, the good begun. Priding yourself upon raising the shout of joy more loudly than anyone had ever done before, and I can believe it, for when his voice is so loud you dare not imagine that his shout is anything but superlatively fine. But by day you used to lead those noble companies through the streets, men crowned with fennel and white poplar, throttling the puff adders and waving them over your head, crying out, Evo, Sabo, and dancing to the tune of Hyas Attis, Attis Hyas, addressed by the old hags as leader, captain, ivy-bearer, fan-bearer, and so on, and as the reward of your services getting sops and twists and barley bannocks. Who would not congratulate himself with good reason on such things, and bless his own fortune? But when you were enrolled among your fellow parishioners, by whatever means, for of that I say nothing, when I say you were enrolled, you at once selected the noblest of occupations, that of a clerk and servant to petty magistrates. And when at length you escaped from this condition also, after yourself doing all that you impute to others, you in no way, heaven knows, disgraced your previous record by the life which you subsequently lived, for you hired yourself out to the actors Similis and Socrates, the Roarers they were nicknamed, and played as a third-rate actor, collecting figs and bunches of grapes and olives, like a fruiterer gathering from other people's farms, and getting more out of this than out of the dramatic competitions in which you were competing for your lives. For there was war without truce or herald between yourselves and the spectators and the many wounds you received from them make it natural for you to jeer at the cowardice of those who have had no such experiences. But I will pass over all that might be accounted for by your poverty, and proceed to my charges against your character itself. For you chose a line of political action, when at length it occurred to you to take up politics too, in pursuance of which, when your country's fortune was good, you lived the life of a hare, in fear and trembling, always expecting a thrashing for the crimes which lay on your conscience. Whereas all have seen your boldness amid the misfortunes of others. But when a man plucks up courage at the death of a thousand of his fellow citizens, what does he deserve to suffer at the hands of the living? I have much more to say about him, but I will leave it unsaid. It is not for me, I think, to mention lightly all the infamy and disgrace which I could prove to be connected with him, but only so much as it is not discreditable to myself to speak of. And now review the history of your life and of mine, side by side, good-temperedly, Eskenes, not unkindly. And then ask these gentlemen which fortune of the two each of them would choose. You taught letters. I attended school. You conducted initiations. I was initiated. You were a clerk. I a member of the assembly. You a third-rate actor. I a spectator of the play. You used to be driven from the stage while I hissed. Your political life has all been lived for the good of our enemies, mine for the good of my country. To pass over all besides, even on this very day, I am being examined with regard to my qualification for a crown. It is already admitted that I am clear of all crimes, while you have already the reputation of a dishonest informer. And for you the issue at stake is whether you are to continue such practices 
or to be stopped once and for all through failing to obtain a fifth part of the votes. A good fortune indeed, can you not see, is that which has accompanied your life, that you should denounce mine. And now let me read to you the evidence of the public burdens which I have undertaken, and side by side with them do you, Eskenes, read the speeches which you use to murder. I leave the abysm of death and gates of gloom, and know that I am not fain ill news to bring, and evil in evil wise. May you be brought to perdition by the gods above all, and then by all those here present, villainous citizen, villainous third-rate actor that you are. To the clerk, read the evidence. The evidence is read. Such was I in my relation to the state. And as to my private life, unless you all know that I was open-hearted and generous and at the disposal of all who had need of me, I am silent. I prefer to tell you nothing, and to produce no evidence whatever, to show whether I ransomed some from the enemy, or helped others to give their daughters in marriage, or rendered any such services. For my principle may perhaps be expressed thus, I think that one who has received a kindness ought to remember it all his life but that the doer of the kindness should forget it once for all. If the former is to behave like a good man, the latter like a free one from all meanness. To be always recalling and speaking of one's own benefactions is almost like upbraiding the recipients of them. I will do nothing of the kind, and will not be led into doing so. Whatever be the opinion that has been formed of me in these respects, with that I am content. But I desire to be rid of personal topics and to say a little more to you about public affairs. For if, Eskenes, you can mention all of those who dwell beneath the sun above us, Helene or foreigner, who has not suffered under the absolute sway, first of Philip and now of Alexander, so be it. I concede that it is my fortune or misfortune, whichever you are pleased to call it, that has been to blame for everything. But if many of those who have never once even seen me or heard my voice have suffered much and terribly, and not individuals alone, but whole cities and nations, how much more just and truthful is it to regard the common fortune as it seems to be of all mankind, and a certain stubborn drift of events in the wrong direction as the cause of these sufferings? Such considerations, however, you discard. You impute the blame to me whose political life has been lived among my own fellow countrymen, and that, though you know that your slander falls in part, if not entirely, upon all of them, and above all upon yourself. For if, when I took part in the discussion of public affairs, I had absolute power, it would have been possible for all of you, the other orators, to lay the blame on me. But if you were present at every meeting of the assembly, if the city always brought forward questions of policy for public consideration, if at the time my policy appeared the best to everyone, and above all to you, for it was certainly from no good will that you relinquished to me the hopes, the admiration, the honors, which all attracted themselves to my policy at the time, but obviously because the truth was too strong for you and you had nothing better to propose, then surely you are guilty of monstrous iniquity in finding fault today with a policy than which, at the time, you could propose nothing better. Among all the rest of mankind, I observe that some such principles as the following have been, as it were, determined and ordained. If a man commits a deliberate crime, indignation and punishment are ordained against him. If he commits an involuntary mistake instead of punishment, he is to receive pardon. If, without crime or mistake, one who has given himself up wholly to that which seems to be for the advantage of all has, in company with all, failed to achieve success, then it is just not to reproach or revile such a man, but to sympathize with him. Moreover, it will be seen that all these principles are not so ordained in the laws alone. Nature herself has laid them down in her unwritten law and in the moral consciousness of mankind. Eskenes, then, has so far surpassed all mankind in brutality and in the art of misrepresentation, 
that he actually denounces me for things which he himself mentioned under the name of misfortunes. End of section 29. Section 30 of the Public Orations of Demosthenes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryce, Youngstown. The Public Orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard. On the Crown, Part 6. In addition to everything else, as though he had himself always spoken straightforwardly and in loyalty, he bade you keep your eyes on me carefully and make sure that I did not mislead or deceive you. He called me a clever speaker, a wizard, a sophist, and so on, just as if it followed that when a man had the first word and attributed his own qualities to another, the truth was really as he stated, and his hearers would not inquire further who he himself was, that said such things. But I am sure that you all know this man and are aware that these qualities belong to him far more than to me. And again, I am quite sure that my cleverness, yes, let the word pass, though I observe that the influence of a speaker depends for the most part on his audience, for in proportion to the welcome and goodwill which you accord to each speaker is the credit which he obtains for wisdom. I am sure, I say, that if I too possess any such skill, you will find it constantly fighting on your behalf in affairs of state, never in opposition to you, never for private ends, while the skill of Ascanese, on the contrary, is employed not only in upholding the cause of the enemy, but in attacking any one who has annoyed him or come into collision with him anywhere. He neither employs it uprightly nor to promote the interests of the city. For a good and honorable citizen ought not to require from a jury who have come into court to represent the interests of the community that they shall give their sanction to his anger or his enmity or any other such passion, nor ought he to come before you to gratify such feelings. It were best that he had no such passions in his nature at all, but if they are really inevitable, then he should keep them tame and subdued. Under what circumstances, then, should a politician and an orator show passion? When any of the vital interests of his country are at stake, when it is with the enemies that the people has to deal, those are the circumstances. For then is the opportunity of a loyal and gallant citizen. But that when he has never to this day demanded my punishment, either in the name of the city or in his own, for any public, nor, I will add, for any private, crime, he should have come here with a trumped-up charge against the grant of a crown and a vote of thanks, and should have spent so many words upon it. That is a sign of personal enmity and jealousy and meanness, not of any good quality, and that he should further have discarded every form of lawsuit against myself and should have come here today to attack the defendant is the very extremity of baseness. It shows, I think, Ascanes, that your motive in undertaking this suit was your desire not to extract vengeance for any crime, but to give a display of rhetoric and elocution. Yet it is not his language, Ascanes, that deserves our esteem in an orator, nor the pitch of his voice, but his choice of the aims which the people chooses, his hatred or love of those whom his country loves or hates. He whose heart is so disposed will always speak with loyal intent, but he who serves those from whom the city foresees danger to herself does not ride at the same anchor as the people and therefore does not look for safety to the same quarter. But I do, mark you, for I have made the interests of my countrymen my own and have counted nothing as reserved for my own private advantage. What? You have not done so either? How can that be when immediately after the battle you went your way as an ambassador to Philip, the author of the calamities which befell your country at that time, and that, despite the fact that until then you always denied this intimacy with him, as everyone knows? But well, what is meant by a deceiver of the city? Is it not one who does not say what he thinks? 
Upon whom does the herald justly pronounce the curse? Is it not upon such a man as this? With what greater crime can one charge a man who is an orator than that of saying one thing and thinking another? Such a man you have been found to be. And after this, do you open your mouth or dare to look this audience in the face? Do you imagine that they do not know who you are? Or that the slumber of forgetfulness has taken such a hold upon them all that they do not remember the speeches which you used to deliver during the war when you declared with imprecations and oaths that you had nothing to do with Philip, and that I was bringing this accusation against you when it was not true to satisfy my personal enmity? But so soon as the news of the battle had come, you thought no more of all this, but at once avowed and professed that you stood on a footing of friendship and guest friendship with him, though these were nothing but your hireling service under other names. For upon what honest or equal basis could Escanes, the son of Glaucothea, the tambourine player, enjoy the guest friendship or the friendship or the acquaintance of Philip? I cannot see. In fact, you had been hired by him to ruin the interests of these your countrymen. And yet, though your own treason has been so plainly detected, though you have been an informer against yourself after the event, you still revile me and reproach me with crimes of which, you will find, any one is more guilty than I. Many a great and noble enterprise, Ascanes, did this city undertake and succeed in, inspired by me, and she did not forget them. It is a proof of this that when, immediately after the event, the people had to elect one who should pronounce the oration over the dead, and you were nominated, they did not elect you for all your fine voice, nor Demades, who had just negotiated the peace, nor Hegemon, nor any other member of your party, they elected me. And when you and Pythocles came forward in a brutal and shameless fashion, God knows, and made the same charges against me as you are making again today, and abused me, the people elected me even more decidedly. And the reason you know well, but I will tell you nevertheless, they knew for themselves both the loyalty and zeal which inspired my conduct of affairs and the inequity of yourself and your friends. For what you denied with oaths when our cause was prosperous, you admitted in the hour of the city's failure, and those accordingly you were only enabled by the misfortunes of their country to express their views without fear. They decided to have been enemies of their own for a long while, though only then did they stand revealed. And further, they thought that one who was to pronounce an oration over the dead and to adorn their valor should not have come beneath the same roof, nor shared the same libation as those who were arrayed against them, that he should not there join with those who with their own hands had slain them, in the revel and the triumph song over the calamities of the Hellenes, and then come home and receive honor, that he should not play the mourner over their fate with his voice, but should grieve for them in his heart. What they required they saw in themselves and in me, but not in you, and this was why they appointed me and not any of you. Nor when the people acted thus did the fathers and brothers of the slain, who were then publicly appointed to conduct the funeral, act otherwise. For since, in accordance with the ordinary custom, they had to hold the funeral feast in the house of the nearest of kin, as it were, to the slain, they held it at my house, and with reason. For though by birth each was more nearly akin to his dead than I, yet none stood nearer to them all in common. For he who has had their life and their success most at heart had also, when they had suffered what I would they had not, the greatest share of sorrow for them all. To the clerk, read him the epitaph which the city resolved to inscribe above them at the public cost to Ascanes, that even by these very lines, Ascanes, you may know that you are a man destitute of feeling, a dishonest accuser, an abominable wretch. The inscription, These for their country, fighting side by side, by deeds of arms, dispelled the foeman's pride. Ere lives they saved not, bidding death made clear, impartial judge, their courage or their fear. For Greece they fought, 
lest neath the yoke brought low, in Thaldrin she the suppressor's scorn should know. Now in the bosom of their fatherland, after they toil they rest, tis God's command. Tis God's alone, from failure free to live, escape from fate to no man doth he give. Do you hear, Ascanes, in these very lines? Tis God's alone, from failure free to live. Not to the statesman has he ascribed the power to secure success for those who strive, but to the gods. Why then, accursed man, do you revile me for our failure in words, which I pray the gods to turn upon the heads of you and yours? But even after all the other lying accusations which he has brought against me, the thing which amazed me most of all, men of Athens, was that when he mentioned what had befallen the city, he did not think of it as a loyal and upright citizen would have thought. He shed no tears, he felt no emotion of sorrow in his heart. He lifted up his voice, he exalted, he strained his throat, evidently in the belief that he was accusing me, though in truth he was giving us an illustration, to his own discredit, of the other difference between his feelings and those of others, at the painful events which had taken place. But surely one who professes, as Ascanes professes now, to care for the laws and the Constitution, ought to show, if nothing else, at least that he feels the same griefs and the same joys as the people, and has not, by his political profession, ranged himself on the side of their opponents. That you have done the latter is manifest today, when you pretend that the blame for everything is mine, and that it is through me that the city was plunged in trouble. Though it was not through my statesmanship or my policy, gentlemen, that you began to help the Hellenes, for were you to grant me this, that it was through me that you had resisted the dominion which was being established over the Hellenes. You would have granted me a testimonial which all those that you have given to others together could not equal. But neither would I make such an assertion, for it would be unjust to you, nor, I am sure, would you concede its truth. And if Ascanes were acting honestly, he would not have been trying to deface and misrepresent the greatest of your glories in order to satisfy his hatred towards me. But why do I rebuke him for this when he has made other lying charges against me, which are more outrageous by far? For when a man charges me, I call heaven and earth to witness, with philippizing, what will he not say? By Heracles and all the gods, if one had to inquire truthfully, setting aside all calumny and all expression of animosity, who are in reality the men upon whose heads all would naturally and justly lay the blame for what has taken place, you would find that it was those in each city who resemble Ascanes, not those who resemble me. For they, when Philip's power was weak and quite insignificant, when we repeatedly warned and exhorted you and showed you what was best, they, to satisfy their own avarice, sacrificed the interests of the community, each group deceiving and corrupting their own fellow citizens, until they brought them into bondage. Thus the Thessalians were treated by Deocus, Cineus, and Thrasydeus, the Arcadians by Circidus, Hieronymus, and Eucampidus, the Argives by Myrtus, Teledamus, and Manassius, the Eleans by Euxithius, Cleotimus, and Aristachmus, the Mycenaeans by the sons of the godforsaken Philiatus, Neon and Thrasilochus, the Sycamians by the Aristratus and the Epicaries, the Corinthians by Dionarchus and Demaritus, the Megarians by Petoidorus, Helixus and Perillus, the Thebans by Timolus, Theogeton, and Anemotus, the Euboeans by Hipparchus and Sosotratus. Daylight will fail me before the list of the traitors is complete. All these men of Athens are men who pursue the same designs in their own cities, as my opponents pursue among you, abominable men, flatterers, evil spirits, who have hacked the limbs each of his own fatherland, and like boon companions have pledged away their freedom, first to Philip and now to Alexander, men whose measure of happiness is their belly and their lowest instincts, 
while as for freedom and the refusal to acknowledge any man as lord, the standard and rule of good to the Hellenes of old, they have flung it to the ground. Of this shameful and notorious conspiracy and wickedness, or rather, to speak with all earnestness, men of Athens, of this treason against the freedom of the Hellenes, Athens has been guiltless in the eyes of all men, in consequence of my statementship, as I have been guiltless in your eyes. And do you then ask me for what merits I count myself worthy to receive honor? I tell you that at a time when every politician in Hellas has been corrupted, beginning with yourself, firstly by Philip and now by Alexander, no opportunity that offered, no generous language, no grand promises, no hopes, no fears, nor any other motive, tempted or induced me to betray one jot of what I believe to be the rights and interests of the city, nor of all the counsel that I have given to my fellow countrymen up to this day, has any ever been given, as it has by you, with the scales of the mind inclining to the side of gain, but all out of an upright, honest, uncorrupted soul. I have taken the lead in greater affairs than any man of my own time, and my administration has been sound and honest throughout all. That is why I count myself worthy of honor. But as for the fortifications and entrenchments for which you ridiculed me, I judge them to be deserving, indeed, of gratitude and commendation. Assuredly, they are so, but I set them far below my own political services. Not with stones nor with bricks did I fortify this city. Not such are the works upon which I pride myself most. But would you inquire honestly wherein my fortifications consist? You will find them in munitions of war, in cities, in countries, in harbors, in ships, in horses, and in men ready to defend my fellow countrymen. These are the defenses I have set to protect Attica, so far as by human calculation it could be done, and with these I have fortified our whole territory, not the circuit of the Piraeus or of the city alone. Nor, in fact, did I prove inferior to Philip in calculations, far from it, or in preparations for war, but the generals of the Confederacy and their forces proved inferior to him in fortune. Where are the proofs of these things? They are clear and manifest. I bid you consider them. What was the duty of a loyal citizen, one who was acting with all forethought and zeal and uprightness for his country's good? Was it not to make Euboea the bulwark of Attica on the side of the sea, and Boatea on that of the mainland, and on that of the regions towards the Peloponnese, our neighbors in that direction? Was it not to provide for the corn trade and to ensure that it should pass along a continuously friendly coast all the way to the Piraeus? Was it not to preserve the places which were ours? For Conoceus, the Chersonese, to Nados, by dispatching expeditions to aid them and proposing and moving resolutions accordingly, and to secure the friendship and alliance of the rest, Byzantium, Tenedos, Euboea. Was it not to take away the greatest of the resources which the enemy possessed, and to add what was lacking to those of the city? All this has been accomplished by my decrees and by the measures which I have taken, and all these measures, men of Athens, will be found by any one who will examine them without jealousy, to have been correctly planned and executed with entire honesty. The opportunity for each step was not, you will find, neglected or left unrecognized or thrown away by me, and nothing was left undone, which it was within the power and the reasoning capacity of a single man to effect. But if the might of some divine power or the inferiority of our generals or the wickedness of those who were betraying your cities or all those things together continuously injured our whole cause until they effected its overthrow, how is Demosthenes at fault? Had there been in each of the cities of Hellas one man, such as I was, as I stood at my own post in your midst, nay, if all Thessaly and all Arcadia, had each but one man animated by the same spirit as myself, not one Hellenic people, either beyond or on this side of Thermophile would have experienced the evils which they now suffer. All would have been dwelling in liberty and independence, free from all fears, secure and prosperous, 
each in their own land, rendering thanks for all those great blessings to you and the rest of the Athenian people through me, but that you may know that in my anxiety to avoid jealousy, I am using language which is far from adequate to the actual facts, to the clerk, read me this, and take and recite the list of the expeditions sent out in accordance with my decrees. The list of expeditions is read. These measures, and others like them, Ascanese, were the measures with which it was the duty of a loyal and gallant citizen to take. If they were successful, it was certain that we should be indisputably the strongest power, and that with justice as well as in fact, and now that they have resulted otherwise, we are left with at least an honorable name. No man casts reproach either upon the city or upon the choice which she made, they do but upbraid fortune, who deciding the issue thus. It was not, God knows, a citizen's duty to abandon his country's interests, to sell his services to her opponents, and cherish the opportunities of the enemy instead of those of his country. Nor was it, on the other hand, to show his malice against the man who had faced the task of proposing and moving measures worthy of the city, and persisting in that intention, while, on the other hand, he remembered and kept his eyes fixed upon any private annoyance which another had caused him, nor was it to maintain a wicked and festering inactivity, as you so often do. Assuredly, there is an inactivity that is honest and brings good to the state. The inactivity which you, the majority of the citizens, observe in all sincerity. But that is not the inactivity of Ascanese. Far from it. He, on the contrary, retires just when he chooses from public life, and he often chooses to do so, that he may watch for the moment when you will be sated with the continual speeches of the same adviser, or when fortune has thrown some obstacle in your path, or some other disagreeable event has happened, for in the life of man many things are possible, and then when such an opportunity comes, suddenly, like a gale of wind, out of his retirement he comes forth an orator, with his voice and training, and his phrases and his sentences collected, and these he strings together lucidly, without pausing for breath, though they bring with them no profit, no accession of anything good, but only calamity to one or another of his fellow citizens, and shame to all alike. Surely, Ascanis, if all this practice and study sprang from an honest heart, resolved to pursue the interests of your country, the fruits of it should have been noble and honorable and profitable to all. Alliances of cities, supplies of funds, opening of ports, enactment of beneficial laws, acts of opposition to our proved enemies. It was for all such services that men looked in bygone days, and the past has offered to any loyal and gallant citizen abundant opportunities of displaying them. But nowhere in the ranks of such men will you ever be found to have stood, not first, nor second, nor third, nor fourth, nor fifth, nor sixth, nor in any position whatsoever, at least not in any matters whereby your country stood to gain. For what alliance has the city gained by negotiations of yours? What assistance, what fresh access of goodwill or fame? What diplomatic or administrative action of yours has brought new dignity to the city? What department of our home affairs or our relations with Hellenic and foreign states over which you have presided has shown any improvement? Where are your ships? Where are your munitions of war? Where are your dockyards? Where are the walls that you have repaired? Where are your cavalry? Where in the world is your sphere of usefulness? What pecuniary assistance have you ever given as a good and generous fellow citizen, either to rich or poor? But, my good sir, you say, if I had done none of these things, I have at least given my loyalty and goodwill. Where? When? Why, even at a time when all who ever opened their lips upon the platform contributed voluntarily to save the city, till, last of all, Aristonicus gave what he had collected to enable him to regain his civil rights. Even then, most inquitous of men, you never came forward or made any contribution whatever, and assuredly it was not from poverty, when you had inherited more than five talents out of the estate of your father-in-law, Philo, 
and had received two talents subscribed by the leaders of the naval boards for your damaging attack upon my naval law. But I will say no more about this, lest by passing from subject to subject I should break away from the matter at hand. It is at least plain that your failure to contribute is not due to your poverty, but to your anxiety to do nothing in opposition to those whose interest is a guide of your whole public life. On what occasions, then, do your spirit and your brilliancy show themselves? When something must be done to injure your fellow countrymen, then your voice is most glorious, your memory most perfect, then you are a prince of actors, a theocrines on the tragic stage. Again, you have recalled the gallant men of old, and you do well to do so. Yet it is not just, men of Athens, to take advantage of the good feeling which you may be relied upon to entertain towards the dead, in order to examine me before you by their standard, and compare me, who am still living amongst you, with them. Who in all the world does not know that against the living there is always more or less of secret jealousy, while none, not even their enemies, hate the dead any more. And am I, in spite of this law of nature, to be judged and examined today by the standard of those who were before me? By no means. It would be neither just nor fair, Askenes. But let me be compared with yourself, or with any of those who have adopted the same policy as yourself and are still alive. And consider this also, which of these alternatives is the more honorable? which is better for the city, that the good service is done by men of former times, tremendous, nay, even beyond all description, though they may be, should be made an excuse for exposing to ingratitude and contumely those that are rendered to the present generation, or that all who act in loyalty should have a share in the honors and the kindness which our fellow citizens dispense. A, and, if I must say this after all, the policy and the principles which I have adopted will be found, if rightly viewed, to resemble and to have the same aims as those of the men who in that age received praise, while yours resemble those of the dishonest assailants of such persons in those days. For in their time also there were obviously persons who disparaged the living and praised the men of old, acting in the same malicious way as yourself. Do you say then that I am no way like them? But are you like them, Askenes, or your brother, or any other orator of the present day? For my part, I should say none, nay, my good sir, to use no other epithet, compare the living with the living, their contemporaries, as men do in every other matter, whether they are comparing poets or choruses or competitors in the games. Because Philemon was not so powerful as Glaucus of Charistus and some other athletes of former times, he did not leave Olympia uncrowned. But because he fought better than all who entered against him, he was crowned and proclaimed victor. Do you likewise examine me beside the orators of the day? Beside yourself, beside anyone in the world that you choose. I fear no man's rivalry. For while this city is still free to choose the best course, and all alike could compete with one another in loyalty to their country, I was found the best adviser of them all. It was by my laws, by my decrees, by my diplomacy that all was effected. Not one of your party appeared anywhere unless some insult was to be offered to your fellow countrymen. But when there happened what I would had never happened, when it was not statesmen that were called to the front, but those who would do the bidding of a master, those who were anxious to earn wages by injuring their country and to flatter a stranger, that along with every member of your party you were found at your post, the grand and resplendent owner of a stud, while I was weak, I confess, yet more loyal to my fellow countrymen than you. Two characteristics, men of Athens, a citizen of a respectable character, for this is perhaps the least invidious phrase that I can apply to myself, must be able to show when he enjoys authority, he must maintain to the end the policy whose aims are noble action and the preeminence of his country, and at all times and in every phase of fortune he must remain loyal. For this depends upon his own nature, while his power and his influence are determined by external causes." And in me, you will find, this loyalty has persisted unalloyed. For mark this, not when my surrender was demanded, 
Now, when I was called to account before the Amphictyons, not in face either of threats or of promises, not when these accursed men were hounded on against me like wild beasts, have I ever been false to my loyalty towards you. For the very first, I chose a straight and honest path in public life. I chose to foster the honor, the supremacy, the good name of my country, to seek to enhance them or to stand and fall with them. I do not walk through the market, cheerful and exultant, over the success of strangers, holding out my hand and giving the good tidings to any whom I expect to report my conduct yonder, but shuddering, groaning, bowing myself to the earth, when I hear of the city's good fortune, as do these impious men, who make a mock of the city, not remembering that in doing so they are mocking themselves, while they direct their gaze abroad, and, whenever another has gained success through the failure of the Hellenes, belaud the state of things, and declare that we must see that it endures for all time. Never, O all ye gods, may any of you consent to their desire. If it can be, may you implant even in these men a better mind and heart. But if they are verily beyond all cure, then bring them and them alone to utter an early destruction by land and sea. And to us who remain, grant the speediest release from the fears that hang over us, and safety that naught can shake. End of section 30 and of On the Crown, and of the public orations of Demosthenes, translated by Arthur Wallace Pickard Cambridge. Recording by Brides, Youngstown, 2012-2013.